I own a musket for home defense, since that's what the Founding Fathers intended. The ruffians break into I my don't house. Is that legal? What the devil? As I grab my powdered wig and Kentucky rifle. Lower golf ball sized hole throw the first man. He's dead on the spot. Draw my pistol on the second man. Miss him entirely because it's smoother bore and nails the neighbor's dough. I have to resort to the cannon mounted at the top of the stairs loaded with grape shot. Tally her lads. The grape shot shoots two men in the blast. The sound and extra shrapnel set off car alarms. It's bayonet and charge the last terrified rep scullion. He bleeds out waiting on the police to arrive since triangular bayonet wounds are impossible to stitch up, just as the Founding Fathers intended. Promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. To talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. To make all your friends feel that there is something worthwhile in them. To look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true. To think only of the best, to work only for the best, and to expect only the best. To be just as enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. To forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the greater achievements of the future. To wear a cheerful expression at all time and give a smile to every living creature you meet. To give so much time to improving yourself that you have no time to criticize others. To be too large for worry too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. To think well of yourself and to proclaim this fact to the world, not in loud word, but in great deeds. To live in the faith that the whole world is on your side, so long as you are true to the best that is in you. Remember that you lose what you condemn. You are here to use your power or authority wisely. Nature insists on a balance. If all your time is devoted to external things and possessions, you will find yourself hungry for peace of mind, harmony, love, joy, or perfect health. You will find you cannot buy anything that is real. The mind is not the instrument of a metaphysical superhuman soul. Mind is soul, mind is being, mind is men. Man can find himself, he can see himself as he is. When he is prepared to turn from the illusory and self-created world of hypothesis in which he wanders and to stand face to face with actuality, then will be known himself as he is. Moreover, he can picture himself as he would wish to be and can create within him the new thinker, the new man, for every moment is the time of choice and every hour is destiny. Knowledge of the spiritual power is the means to the royal road to riches of all kinds, whether your desire is spiritual, mental, or material. The student of the laws of mind or the student of the spiritual principle believes and knows absolutely that regardless of the economic situation, 
stock market fluctuation, depression, strikes, war, other conditions or circumstances, he will always be amply supplied regardless of what form money may take. The reason for this is he abides in the consciousness of wealth. The student has convinced himself in his mind that wealth is forever flowing freely in his life and that there is always a divine surplus. Wealth is a state of consciousness. It is a mind conditioned to divine supply forever flowing. The scientific thinker looks at money or wealth like the tide. It goes out, but it always comes back. The tides never fail. Neither will man supply when he trusts the tireless, changeless, immortal presence, which is omnipresent and flows ceaselessly. Here is a simple way for you to impress your subconscious mind with the idea of constant supply or wealth. Quiet the wheels of your mind. Relax. Let go. Immobilize the attention. Get into a sleepy, drowsy, meditative state of mind. This reduces effort to the minimum. Then in a quiet, relaxed, passive way, reflect on the following simple truths. Ask yourself, where do ideas come from? Where does wealth come from? Where did you come from? Where did your brain and your mind come from? You will be led back to the one source. You find yourself on a spiritual working basis now. It will no longer insult your intelligence to realize that wealth is a state of mind. In the beginning, people who are in financial difficulties do not get results with such affirmations as I am wealthy, I am prosperous, I am successful. Such statements may cause their conditions to get worse. The reason is the subconscious mind will only accept the dominant of two ideas or the dominant mood of feeling. When they say, I am prosperous, their feeling of lack is greater and something within them says, no, you are not prosperous, you are broke. The feeling of lack is dominant so that each affirmation calls forth the mood of lack and more lack becomes theirs. The way to overcome this for beginners is to affirm what the conscious and subconscious mind will agree on. Then there will be no contradiction. Our subconscious mind accepts our beliefs, feelings, convictions, and what we consciously accept as true. A man could engage the cooperation of his subconscious mind by saying, I am prospering every day. I am growing in wealth and in wisdom every day. Every day my wealth is multiplying. These and similar statements would not create any conflict in the mind. You will be compelled to do whatever is necessary for the unfoldment of your ideal. The law of the subconscious is compulsion. The law of life is action and reaction. What we do is the automatic response to our inner movements of the mind, inner feeling, and conviction. All of our external movements, motions, and actions follow the inner movements of the mind. Inner action precedes all outer action. Whatever steps you take physically or what you seem to do objectively will all be part of a pattern which you were compelled to fulfill. Believe that you have it now and you shall receive it. We must cease denying our good. Realize that the only thing that keeps us from the riches that lie all around us is our mental attitude. Your knowledge of how your mind works is your savior and redeemer. Thought and feeling are your destiny. You possess everything by right of consciousness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, show, show. Hello, hello, hello. 
So yeah, today we're going to be talking about society, uh, Kanye, and uh, good storytelling. Uh, but first, hello, Sir Ace. Hello there. Hello, Sir Hunter. Hello there. Hello, hello. And uh, probably going to be playing uh, Star Citizen in the second half. At least that's the plan. <laughs> so first we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to, well, let me think here. I've got a few bullet points and then some things that are actually more written out. But I guess we'll kind of start with Kanye. We'll start with Kanye. That will help me to to launch off. <laughs> this will help me to push the boat off of the, uh, the dock. No worries, so Hunter. All right, so... We're going to start here with this video from uh, the Officer Tatum about uh, some shenanigans that Kanye recently pulled on the Al Alex Jones show. And this really goes to show, uh, this really goes to show, you know what, I, I, I'll do this first. Because I'm looking at my picture here. I, I don't think I've ever explained what uh, the picture means to me. And maybe by framing what the picture means to me, you know... Let me say, let it mean to you what it means to you, but I'll, I'll share with you what my, you know, the picture in front of you right now means to me when I found it, because I didn't make it. And when I found it, I don't think it was even credited who made it. So if anyone knows who made this picture, please let me know, because I would like to own it. <laughs> I would like to own it for, uh, for true. Anyway, um, so what's this picture mean to me? The, uh, the moon canine. Um, let's see. So first of all, I guess so what, uh, people know that there's this movie in the theaters, Bones and All. And, you know, it came out around Thanksgiving. But, you know, it, it, it the movies like that and the archetype of you have a monster, it's seductive, it's insatiable, you, like you're the vampire or Hannibal Lecter or, you know, so on and so forth. And we're going to be talking about psychopathy and sociopathy and stuff today and dark triads and crimson triads. So, uh, so they tie in as well. But uh, the moon, well, I guess we'll start with the moon. So th what the moon represents to me, uh, it's like, okay, so the moon has different phases, right? <laughs> Uh, and whether or not, what, whatever phase it's in, whether there's clouds veiling it, it's still there doing its job no matter what phase it's in uh, and whether or not people can see it. I'd rather follow the example of the moon who's always there doing its job no matter if you can see it or not or appreciate it or even understand all the work it's doing. I'd rather be like the moon than the distant stars. In that way, uh, especially when they're, they're fucking lost as hell like Kanye, uh, in that way, uh, the moon represents what being a Christ-like person means, sort of, you know, because that's what Christ does, you know, even when you don't see him or the Holy Spirit, even when you don't see that they're there, they're veiled from your sight by the clouds, they're still there doing their job, helping you, <laughs> they're still making everything else possible. And this picture is either an unusual, you know, like the, the canine, it's either an unusual German shepherd or it's a wolf, depending on uh, what it chooses to be, representing people's potential to either be good or evil, depending on what they choose, you know, because, you know, every German shepherd came from wolves to begin with. That's where they, be that's their, their root. That's the root of their tree. So if they had not been, uh, if they had not grown to be man's best friend, been trained to be man's best friend uh, in hurting the sheep. <laughs> they would have devoured the sheep and they would have been uh, the terror of men. That's what this picture represents to me. And, you know, also Demosthenes uh, uh, is one of my sort of heroes uh, in, in the sense that he overcame his speech impediment and then came one of the greatest orators of his people and affected political change. And my family history has always just always been politically active on both sides of the aisle uh, and just very active in general when it comes to like fighting for their ideals of freedom and liberty and justice and all that stuff. So... It, it literally does run in my veins. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, anyway, the, uh, so not only Demosthenes, you know, he used to put stones in his mouth because he, he had a bad speech impediment. So he would put stones in his mouth, uh, and speak around them and, and deliver speeches with stones in his mouth, uh, until he could do it perfectly. 
And then he took the stones out and he went to the Senate and he delivered his, uh, his orations and he changed his nation for, for the better in a lot of ways. Um, and he was trying to, uh, do good. And so, yeah, the, that's part of the, the whole <laughs> moon in the mouth thing, but it's also that the wolf representing the natural man rather than the godly or righteous man who rises above being like the natural man, uh, if they just jump high enough to reach the moon, <laughs> which is low enough to be freely offered, then, uh, then they can partake of it, you know, the moon freely offered what it would, you know, the protection and the, the serenity and the stirring of the waters that it provides, which is very necessary. <laughs> Sometimes you got to stir the water. Mm. But it's also a great, you know, it's one of the biggest shields we have for this planet. Um, so I'm trying to think of what else I was going to say about it. Cause that definitely wasn't it. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. Hmm. Demosthenes. Uh, oh yeah. It's like, you know, it's like a wafer. It's like it's eating a sacramental wafer. You know, he jumps high. The, the wolf jumps high, eats the wafer and becomes, you know, you, you become what you consume. So. Yeah. The animal is like, it's partaking of the freely offered sacrament of the moon. If the wolf will just jump high enough <laughs> to get it. Uh, and you become what you consume. So that being will also become a protector and a servant of mankind, even if it's not appreciated for it, or people even know everything that it does. And that sacrament is offered every single night, every single night, whether people know it's there, whether they think it's only like a, a crescent, it's really a full, it's still the full moon. You just can only see part of its light, <laughs> you know? Uh, just like I appreciate every good thing my dad did to serve his nation, our nation, even though I only know a portion of it, and even if he wasn't the best dad, he really wasn't. Uh, he was far better than many had, uh, and than he himself could have been if he hadn't at least tried to make an attempt to leash the natural man within him and try to be righteous in spite of his serious, very serious anger issues. Uh, which I, I also have to struggle with because I, you know, children epigenetically and genetically inherit and are also, you know, they just, uh, that's why it's best to leash your uh, natural man and become a more righteous, more holy, more Christ-like man for the sake of your children, if not for yourself. But my father in heaven, at least, <laughs> I know, and all of our father, you know, he's, he's all of our father in heaven. Our father in heaven is perfect and always has been, been there, at least for me, and has been there for all of us if we just recognize it. Uh, and he's never abused me and he hasn't given me more than I can handle, even if I'm too foolish or fooled in, into thinking that I'm capable of less than I am. When the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me I'm not because he's not and I'm connected to him and the rest of the Godhood, which is capable of everything. So if you just live according to them so that they can give you, if they can inspire you with the mission that they have for you. And everyone has a mission. Everyone has something that they should be doing. You know, there are many missions along the way. And then there's a big grand mission of your life. Maybe it's telling the best story, writing the best music, you know, so on and so forth. Hold on, let me, let me, let me wet my throat. And those things are very, very important because culture needs that. Culture needs the great music. Culture needs the greatest stories to fight against all the trash that's going to be trying to uh, lead people into destroying themselves. Uh, so that, you know, why waste the resources trying to destroy people when you can just Aikido them, mentally Aikido them into destroying themselves? You know, it's like one of the only ways that Aikido is even fucking useful. Sorry, Aikido lovers. My dad was really, you know, all these like Aikido books and stuff like that. And I, I thought I figured out pretty quick after like studying the techniques that, yeah, this isn't, this isn't super practical. <laughs> maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just not the, I wasn't reading the right books, but that's also something we'll be talking about today. Um, so yeah, uh, leash the natural man, become better than that. Not monkey, be manay, mayonnaise, mayonnaise. So uh, let's see here. 
Um, what else it represents is, or to me at least, like I said, let it represent anything to you that you want it to represent to you. Uh, <laughs> I'm just telling you what, what it re represents to me. Um, I would not trade my mind or imagination for anyone else's that has ever existed. Not because I don't think that they're greater than me. Uh, I absolutely don't. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's just that I understand. I, I have gladly... Uh, I gladly pay and have paid and will continue to pay the prices for the Lord forging my mind into how he intends it to become, which is a magnet to draw every good thing to itself and magnetize it to good while repelling evil from itself and, you know, helping the things that it magnetizes to do the same. To be Christ-like, you know, which means being a hero by serving others no matter what it costs you if the mission is good, you know? and not bowing to evil no matter what. I will make J.R.R. Martin's work look like the glory of a distant, dim star, rather than the moon of my works, which are, you know, they're sometimes fully shining, sometimes veiled behind clouds, because that's the pattern of the master that I follow, the example that I follow. Uh, I am the samurai. Uh, I am a samurai for the, uh, you know, I'm a warrior of Christ. And I guide <laughs> the flocks that I, whatever comes my way, that's what everyone's audience is. That's just the truth. They try to veil it. I'm not trying, Ayn I'm not trying to teach you anything. Okay, you're lying. Yes, you are. <laughs> you are trying to propagate your values and culture to preserve and benefit and make culture better. That's what you're doing when you're and trying to entertain people, if you're a good entertainer. But you're doing it in an artful way. <laughs> That's it. You're doing it in a way that's not hurting them in any way. That's just entertaining and edifying them. That's it. That's it. Sometimes it can be hard to go through. So, like, again, Berserk. Very, very dark. But it's got great lessons through that, that dark. And, it's, and again, the lessons are brighter for the amount of darkness in the story. And just because there's really dark things in the story or because Isaiah cussed, you know, or had a filthy mouth like I do, doesn't mean that Isaiah didn't have very valuable things to say or that Berserk doesn't have very valuable things or Game of Thrones doesn't have very valuable lessons in it. You have to understand that life exists and as, is as dark as it is for a reason so that you can learn from it. It's not there for no reason. Otherwise, it would be pointless. Otherwise, it would be uh, nihilistic, uh, the nihilistic philosophies and the nepotistic, or excuse me, and the, uh, <laughs> the, ni the nihilistic and the narcissistic philosophies would actually make sense then. But that's not really what life is about. Life is, because that's why they feel so bad all the time on the inside. And they're constantly trying to do things to make themselves feel better, to artificially pick themselves up. I need an upper. Oh, now I'm too up. Now I need a downer. You know, that sort of thing. And they don't have internal peace. And I'm not talking about the people who are just, who just work so hard, you know, and they're really, and, and then they, you know, use caffeine and stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who are like, you know, they're ridden by such guilt and anxiety because the, the Holy Spirit is telling them, that's not what you should be doing. That's not what, son, I love you. <laughs> Brother, I love you. <laughs> that's not what you should be doing. Uh, and this is what you should be doing instead. And they do things to try to dull that, uh, the Holy Spirit trying to talk to them, their subconscious telling them, uh, don't do that. There's still a small voice saying, maybe this would be better instead. And they buck against that and they rebel against that <laughs> and they turn away from that. And we used to be a better nation when we didn't as much. You know, Kanye would be better if he actually studied the gospel of Christ, the philosophy of Christ, <laughs> and actually chose to be Christ-like instead of clothing himself like a wolf in sheep's clothing and saying, uh... I am a Christ, uh, I'm a follower, I'm a disciple of Christ, now come to my mega church and follow me. Oh, and it's just to cover myself. And I'm going to keep doing the fake, you know, veiling myself in the black thing, you know, and, you know, acting like I'm the devil's advocate in front of the world because oh, it's going to give me some spiritual power, blah, 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 and that I can play both sides. Blah, 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 blah. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Do what's right. Not, not, don't be a dark triad manipulator. Don't be like, oh, this is the, this is intelligent. This is such a good plot. I'm, oh, I'm so smart. I'm so, no, you're being fooled. You're being played like a meat puppet. Stop it. Stop it. Don't be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Be a German shepherd dog. 
faithfully herding the sheep as man's best friend. That's what you should be doing. Stop playing their game. Stop surrounding yourself with the wrong people who are giving you the wrong counsel, who are telling you like, oh, this would be really smart if we, oh, look, we have this big gambit planned against Trump and against, uh, against Alex Jones and against all this. We're going to make them all look bad and we're going to make you look good. And then you're going to run and then you're going to steal all these votes away from a candidate that you don't want to win. You, we all know you're not going to win, but this is going to be really effective for all the masses who are easily mind fucked and hypnotized like you were. Wake up, please. Stop trying to be woke. Stop trying to clothe yourself in the fake armor of God just to protect, just to manipulate people and protect yourself. Like, ah, oh, I'm so righteous. Ah, oh, oh, don't look at a naked body or a woman's hair. Ah, oh, I'm so righteous. Stop trying to clothe yourself in false righteousness. Clothe, your, clothe yourself in the full, true armor of God. The true armor of God. Then you'll be peaceful no matter what, <laughs> no matter what. Sometimes you, you'll, just like God is, God weeps sometimes because of what we do. I weep sometimes because of life. But most of the time, 90% of the time, I'm joyful. <laughs> I'm absolutely peaceful and joyful and happy no matter what, no matter what privations, no matter what has happened to me, because, and only because I was raised, no matter what has happened to me through my life, I was raised in the church from birth. I was raised to follow Christ from birth. And that is the only thing that has saved me from being like these other, these fucking dark triad manipulators and, and evil people. <laughs> That's just the truth. That's the, the duality of human nature. You can either, you can either let yourself be swept down the river uh, towards the, the waterfall or you can actually swim the way that the Lord says when the, when the, the split comes and be safe. You have to actually, you know, actually work for it, though. <laughs> you can't just let yourself be swept along in the river, river of life until you're dashed on the rocks or, you know, or drowned. He taught you how to swim. He said, this is the breaststroke. This is the backstroke. This is the, this is the, the butterfly. Do all this is, and this is what situations to use every single one of those things in. This is how to tread water. This is how to, this is how you survive in the river of life. You just got to do it. You just got to do what he said. Let me take a quick drink here. For pretty much every single situation, you know, you lost a loved one. Oh, I have a manual. This is how you deal with your grief. <laughs> oh, you've got this problem. I've got a manual. This is how you deal with your grief, you know, or your anger or your, uh, uh, your criminals or your this or your that. Literally, this is the guidebook. If you would just listen and understand and not spurn it by willfully misinterpreting it or just not studying it well enough or long enough so that you do misinterpret it. And then you'd listen to these false, le you know, you listen to these actual wolves in sheep clothing who, who didn't decide to become German shepherd dogs and leap and actually take the sacrament of the actual protector of the moon. Uh, instead, they just decided to say, I'm a sheep, I'm a ram, I'll lead you. Or, you know, I'm a faithful shepherd. It's not true. Your works don't bear that out. Your music is great, though. <laughs> you said you sold your soul to Satan. Maybe you, maybe you actually need to be truly saved by someone who can help you. Instead of the false shepherds that you surround yourself with, and then you yourself claim to be, I'm a god, I'm a false shepherd, I'm a god. You're not. You're a fool. You've been fooled. And yeah, it is true that calling someone a fool is tempting the flames of hell. It is true. But I'm condemning the action. That's what I'm condemning. It's, that's why I say God damn so much. I really want God to damn whatever it is that happened. I want him to stop that from happening anymore. And when I say the words that I say, yeah, sometimes I, I use very forceful language. Sometimes I project my voice and, and yell. But it's not the majority of the time. You know, you got you to gotta be able to ride the Bronco to, uh, to get to your destination and benefit fit from the journey <laughs> the, and how fun it can be. And, you know, once you get there, you, you, you can, uh, 
You can do a lot of stuff. You can do a lot of stuff. But yeah, have a big dream. You know, I'll, I'll make, you know, J.R., you know, you think Elden Ring is good? <laughs> that J.R. Martin inspired? Just wait. Just wait until my series is done. Just wait until the books and the animes and the board games and the, the everything that it will inspire, the TV shows, the movies, the everything that it will inspire. And then I will be able to use the money that I make from that to actually make something that will compete with Disney, that will compete with Star Wars. <laughs> and it will be better than all of it. It will be better than all of it. And it's not just going to be within that universe. I will, in, I will fund, I will find the best creators and I will patronize them. <laughs> I will set them up. I will, you know, it will be like it's supposed to be a free market of ideas. Not a, you know, not a censored fucking bullshit, false righteousness so I can manipulate you uh, system. It's, I will strip myself naked, if, you know, uh, metaphysically speaking, psychologically speaking, to benefit you. <laughs> I will create the best entertainment. You know, that's what musicians do. That's what, what you know, uh, writers do. They take their life experiences, they learn lessons from them, and, they, and then they tell them in, in, through either music, story, art, uh, paintings, whatever it is in a way that they think will edify the generation after them, or their own generation, or their parents' generation, just everyone. That's what good art is. But a lot of people, oh, you want to you're trying to teach me something? Who do you think you are? Oh, someone who loves you, I guess. <laughs> Turn away if you want. If you want to be played like a meat puppet from the, the worst parts of your natural man subconscious, or Satan, or whatever you want to call it, it's self-destructive. Learn what you can learn, you know, from the best things. Be, attra be attracted to the best things. As I replace my headphone battery here. <laughs> Should have checked that before I began. Learning lessons as we go. Sometimes you forget stuff. Just like, uh, what was I going to say next? Let's see. Um... <laughs> So yeah, the moon. <laughs> the moon is Christ-like. Uh, it's a hero to me. I appreciate it very much. Uh, let's see. So yeah, don't be a dim, distant star. <laughs> very fucking dim. Pulsating and dim like uh, Kanye. Be like the moon. I know I was going to say something else about the moon. But, uh, you know what? I'm going to talk to the Mormons for a second. <laughs> because, again, that's, that's what I know. I was, what I was raised in. So, yeah, the Lord says to partake of the sacrament with wine. And you Mormons, you Mormons changed that because you thought you knew better. You thought you, oh, oh, oh maybe, the, maybe the wine, you know, the, the sweet and the sourness and the alcohol, just all the things that it represents. Maybe it was supposed to teach people stuff and maybe it was supposed to mean stuff. You know, maybe we weren't supposed to be serving it in like plastic. You know, he said, serve it in your best. <laughs> serve, and you fucking serve the sacrament in plastic. What with with tap water, with fluoridated tap water, poisoned water you're feeding to your, your congregations during sacrament. Good job, Mormons. Good fucking job. Oh, he's going to be so happy with you when he comes. Oh, I told you to give my flock the best you could and to feed the... Oh, and you built these beautiful temples, but I said that you're supposed to feed the hungry. You're supposed to clothe the naked. You're supposed to do all these things first before you build the temples. <laughs> but you just... Ah, oh, I'm going to build my beautiful temples. I'm going to build my beautiful temples. I'm going to make my movies. I'm going to make my movies that are about, uh, you know, miracles happening that cause a guy to stop drinking coffee. You know, that's his like... You don't fucking understand anything. You, you false righteousness cloakers... <laughs> Oh, I'm just going to cloak myself in false righteousness. You lost the plot. You lost it. You thought you knew better. Just like the world. I'm going to be like the world. Look how powerful they are. I want to be like the world. Because, <laughs> because of Joseph Smith for forbidding hard alcohol and drunkenness and not partaking in that over the course of his life 
which is just a reinforcement of the bib biblical laws. Where you don't, you don't be drunk. You don't partake of hard alcohol. But even the armies of Israel had beer rations. <laughs> even Noah got blackout drunk. You know, are you better than Noah? No, you don't, you're not even a fucking tenth of what Noah was. They knew how to purify water. They weren't doing it because they were too fucking dumb to purify water, you stupid shits. You belittling fucks. You uneducated, self-flattering, false righteousness cloakers. You belittling lost sheep. Just like you virtue signal about coffee and things like cannabis. When doing things like brewing coffee and smoking was, for, was forbidden during church. During church. Because people were complaining about it. It was distracting from the gospel. A lot of people were coming just for like the, 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 the coffee and stuff like that. And, you know, drink their coffee and gossip and, and distract others or make fun or belittle of what they shouldn't. So, just like in the Bible, Joseph said, when you're worshiping, be holy. None of that stuff while you're worshiping or while you're doing stuff like prayer or while you're, you're not chewing tobacco while you're playing to God or praying to God. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're being holy. You're, you're treating your body like a temple. None of that stuff during church or your other gatherings. That should be about worshiping God and developing living faith as the fuel for the miracles, which the Holy Spirit will inspire you with. You know, there are miraculous stories, miraculous uh, pieces of music. You think Beethoven, you know, that was, there were miraculous things inspired and made possible through the power of the Holy Spirit, the talents and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it'll inspire you if you do the correct things by serving others. You'll get spiritual rewards in the place of worldly rewards. That's the upside down. That's the, that's the upside down that re in reality. <laughs> the stranger things, ups, you know, there are no stranger things than the reality of the way God works. And you think you know better than God, but you don't, and you never will. You never will. And you'll never fully understand. Even the Lord doesn't even understand when he'll come back. The hour that he comes back, only God the Father, Heavenly Father, knows. You don't know shit compared to him. But people are like, oh, I'll preserve this, but I'll get rid of that because it has no value to me. I, you have no idea what value it has to society. You have no idea how much good it could do in society. Oh, it could, it could do so much bad. Um, you have to cut open a patient to get at some of the disease sometimes. But the goal is not to kill the patient like today. <laughs> the goal is not to just reduce the population. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of the disease by just killing the patient. Easy. <laughs> no. Nope, we, we need to, that, that's why the Lord was like, hey, even your enemy, you have to think about it from this perspective. We are all brothers and sisters. Even your worst enemy might have been your best friend before mortality. Might have been like your soul brother, your soul sister, your actual, or if it's a, a it might have been your actual, who was who supposed to be your soulmate. You don't know. You don't know. So do good to your enemy. And only when you cannot, only when literally you have to, for, to save innocence, to save what, you know, to, for righteousness, for holiness, that's the only way, the time. In other words, if you're in a position of power and someone's like, you know, taking spitballs at you or whatever, okay, the Lord endured a whole lot worse than that. You can be a big boy and, and saunter on. <laughs> saunter on like, like a big man off into the sunset. You'll be happier for it. And maybe they'll learn something, you know, something about grace, something about dignity, something about honor, being honorable. Instead of turning around and being, you know, slicing their neck open with a fucking switchblade. I've seen it. <laughs> you, that's not the type of thing that you want to be. That's, that's the natural man. That's the animal. 
That's the wolf and the wolf in sheep's clothing. There are good wolves, like I said. There are, you know, <laughs> the, the domesticated canines came from wolves. Man did train wolves. But what would you rather have guarding the sheep? A wolf <laughs> or a, a German shepherd? So yeah, very, be very careful of false righteousness and people will cloak themselves in false righteousness. That's, again, judge by what's good, not by what's popular, not by what's profitable, not by what uh, looks good or is politically uh, expedient. It's always by what is actually good, what is actually true. And this is why they try to muddy the waters of uh, you know, people's discernment over what is true, what is good. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what's true. I'll give you the fact check. I'll tell you what's good. I'll frame everything. I'll frame everything I don't like to seem evil and frame everything I don't like to seem good so that you won't even want to associate with anything that's not, you know, towing, that's not the, the popular opinion because you don't want to pay the price. You don't want to pay the social price. You don't want to pay the perhaps losing your job. Perhaps if you're in the wrong country, being thrown in prison by letting them control your speech. Okay. Well, thankfully, I live in a place where they can't control my speech. <laughs> they can't. They cannot compel my speech in any way. And the more they try to, the more I open up. And the more I'm cracked open like a shell. So blame them for this. Blame them that I, I start doing these monologues uh, at the beginning. And then start playing in the second half in case anyone wants to, like, you know, actually discuss what I talked about. And I'm always open to it. If you Confront me. If you don't like what I say, confront me about it. Don't be, a co don't be like the world wants you to be, which is, oh, I don't want to associate with it or be, be seen to associate with that. No, confront it if you don't agree with it. And then maybe learn something or teach someone else by being brave, by opening your mouth. Or just learn something. <laughs> or just enjoy the, 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 the sound. Whatever you want. My point is, don't be led by evil and <laughs> don't be don't be fooled don't be used like a meat puppet mm, what else? was i gonna say anything about else about the uh the picture mm, let me let me take a, a swig of water So yeah, that's exactly how, that's how it was done. <laughs> uh, that's how it used to be done. <laughs> Do you think that Jesus couldn't have made pure water at, during, at the wedding? <laughs> Do, you, Do you think that there was a reason that uh, they, they drank until they were merry during the wedding? I, I, I fucking wonder. Maybe it was so that you wouldn't value your meat above your spirit. It would teach you that, yes, it is important to preserve your, your meat and your temple as much as possible, but it's not everything. Your spirit is greater than your meat, and it always will be. The point is not to destroy your, your body, your temple, your vessel, or your spirit. And what is your, what is your soul? What is your soul? It's different than your spirit. Some people are confused about this. Even the Mormons are confused about this. What is your soul? If you asked a Mormon missionary, if they just came up to you, what is your soul? What is the soul? <laughs> if they can't answer you, then uh, have them watch this stream. <laughs> because I'm trying to help the Mormons, but every time I do, they just ostracize me. Oh, that's too hard to hear. Oh, shit, we're doing the wrong things. No, the prophet's infallible. The prophet's infallible. Okay. You're not listening to Isaiah. You're not listening to God himself. You're not listening to the Lord. You're listening to flatterers. You're listening to... Wolves in sheep clothing. <laughs> People not who aren't necessarily, don't necessarily mean you harm. It's just that they're flattering themselves. They're cloaking themselves in false righteousness because they've lost the plot. They don't understand anymore. The Holy Spirit is screaming at them. This is, dude, dude, it, look at the, read the scriptures. Stop trying to depart from the scriptures. What are you doing? What are you doing? You have no excuse. <laughs> You have no excuse. Ezra Taft Benson is, is right there in your ear, 
whoever the current prophet is, saying, you need to fix these things. What are you doing? You need to fix these things. What are you doing? And you're just ignoring it and saying, oh, no, we'll just call ourselves Mormons now. <laughs> Let's call ourselves Mormons now? Really? Really? You know, by actually following and being faithful, having living faith, that's how Christ's, like Jesus and Elijah and, and Enoch, that's what they exemplified. Actually fulfilling the law. Following the law as greatly and as much as they could, not trying to change it because it was because the, to conform to the world, to bow the knee to the world. They were the perfect fruit. <laughs> Yeah, you can't be as perfect as Jesus, but the Lord says once he forgives you, once you repent, he won't He won't remember your sins anymore. He, you will be perfect to him. He will choose to not remember your sins. You know, you will be so washed clean in the blood of Jesus that in the spirit realm, you won't even, your sins won't even be remembered by God. He'll veil you completely. He'll clothe your sins. He'll clothe you. So that's the perfect fruit and sacrament of the philosophy of Christ and of true Christians that the moon sort of rep represents to me. You know, not chinos, Christians in name only, or the, the modern Mormon, Mormons. Oh, it makes me so mad every time I have to say that. Mormons, that's what the world called us, you know, that's what the world called us. And we were like, no, we're, we're LDS. No, we're LDS. We're LDS Christians. If you wanted to be specific, it was LDS Christians. And then someone came along and said, oh, well, the world calls us Mormons, so let's have a campaign. Let's have a PR campaign that's just popular. Let's normalize uh, uh, the word Mormons. Let's make it, you know, let's make it friendly. When the Lord specifically said, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, this isn't the Church of Moses, so don't call it that. It's not the Church of Mormon, so don't call it that. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Christians, for short. And if you want to be specific, Christian Latter-day Saints, Christian LDS, LDS Christians. But no, you thought you knew better. You thought you, th you, thought you knew better than God. Okay, we'll see how he feels when he comes back. And you can ostracize me all you want for pointing it out. Because it makes you feel bad. But I'm trying to help you. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure you're not one of the ones who are left behind and burning. If you wanted to distinguish from other Christian denominations, we already had LDS Christian to go by. You wanted to be worldly and adopt the world's name for you even when the, world, the Lord explicitly commanded you not to do that. The prophet cannot go against an explicit order from God like that and still be ordained by him as the leader of the church. But you ostracize the ones who try to help you course correct even though it's the ironic priesthood's responsibility. So as soon as you're ordained into the priesthood, it's your responsibility to point these things out. And that carries all the way up, all the way up to the high priesthood. And you still, you still pass over everyone who, oh, uh, no, just make the bishop's son uh, over this and over that, you know, constantly, every single fucking time. Not let's develop people's leadership and give them an opportunity to, to maybe help point things out and give them the opportunity, you know, to, to help. Mm -mm. No, just uh, nepotism because of a society of narcissism instead of merit. Instead of seeing potential in others and trying to develop it in all, not, not just in some, but seeing it in everyone, what is that person's potential? They're every single every single ingot can be made into something. But your imaginations are so stunted, and your faith is so stunted, and you're so confused, and you're so you want to be like the world, and you want to be like all the other worldly you wanted. Now you are one of the other worldly religions. You wanted to be like all the other worldly religions, and now you are. Congratulations. You actually made Isaiah's prophecy come true again. Every single church fell away. And then Joseph Smith restored it like, like a modern-day Moses, like a little mini-Moses. 
and then Ifu fell right away again after he was martyred. This and martyrdom actually proves the point that spiritual battles are much more important than physical battles. Because what what inspires people to carry on? What inspires people to to take up the mantle and you know be faithful to, to the ideals that someone died for? It was is it a physical? <laughs> it's a spiritual thing. It's that they won the spiritual battle. Gandhi won the spiritual battle. That's what was important. Martin Luther King won the spiritual battle. So yeah, you ostracize the ones who try to help you course correct because you are led like meat puppets to do it. You're led by the conditioning of the world. You're led by Satan himself. You're led by many, 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 many people and many things. And you make them live out in the wilderness like Elijah with nothing but the bare minimum that God himself provides so that they can survive. He said to feed the poor, clothe the naked, heal the sick, visit the lonely. What do you do? <laughs> it's a mockery of the things you actually should be doing. It's the most lukewarm version of what you should be doing. So your rewards will be the most lukewarm of what you could have gotten. And things will just slide down, not as quickly as they would have, but they'll slide down. You're not telling the stories that you should be. You know, you've got Brandon Sanderson's doing a great job, you know, actually inspiring with good stories. Horsel Scott Card used to do a decent job. A really good fucking job, I should say. He's the one who inspired me to, to try. Now look at him. <laughs> now look at what he's turned into, because I think he I think he buys everything hook, line, and sinker from you guys. Oh, the prophet's infallible. Follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. He knows the way. No, he fucking doesn't. Not anymore. Isaiah's right. You all fell away. You have to lay down pavement before you can establish trade with trucks laden with valuable goods most of the time. Unless you're flying with living faith rather than more harmful fuels. So yeah, a note about good storytelling. Spiritual fights are always more interesting than purely physical ones. And physical battles where the very souls of the opponents themselves are at stake are the greatest, most glorious, and most honorable battles of them all. Even Jesus will have his physical battle that will be the most glorious of all time. I'm talking about when he comes back. Uh, I will show it at the end of the prequel book to my series that's about Armageddon preceding his 1,000-year reign. You know, before, the, uh, before Satan's released from hell again to, be, you know, to test us for the last time. And my main series is called The Long Night. It's seven books long, and the prequel is, uh, is about Armageddon. So yeah, Samson, David, and Jesus, they're like the trinity of tank, DPS, and healer that WoW would fall apart without <laughs> and would never get as popular no matter how good everything else was because it doesn't have the trinity. And good storytelling is kind of like that in general. You know, games are like that. I don't, you know, if they're like MMOs like WoW. Like Guild Wars 2 has many great features, but it doesn't have the trinity, so it's never going to be as popular. It's never going to be as successful and, and as the combat just is never going to feel as good to a lot of people. The group content and all that stuff. Also, that company was foolish enough to openly support abortion. <laughs> they decided to signal boost for baby murder uh, that mostly stems from selfishness and irresponsibility rather than medical needs, which is the vast majority of the grim reality uh, and <laughs> that they call abortion. And one of the most evil sins imaginable that they call abortion, which is murder. Uh, if it's not done for righteous reasons like medical need, then it's murder. And if, especially if it's ju just done out of selfishness, it's just done, like you back in the day, they actually thought that if they sacrificed their babies to like Moloch and Lagaz, that they would get benefits from it. That they would like the, the next harvest would be better and they wouldn't have that mouth to feed and stuff like that. 
And now it's just, oh, uh, I wanted to have promiscuous, unprotected sex, you know, even though you have like five different ways to avoid, you know, getting pregnant. Or, you know, it's like, what the fuck? Instead, society teaches people since the 60s, largely, or, you know, it's really ramped up since then and exponentially every decade. Instead, society teaches people to be irresponsible and have sex like you're handing out tissues. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not cool or a real man or woman if you aren't reducing the ideal of marriage uh, to abusing the holy power of procreation outside of marriage and then murdering the results. Violating the sanctity of the highest union that we've got. The most holy union that we've got. And then just murdering it. Uh, murdering the results because you broke the law. <laughs> you broke the rules. You're not supposed to have procreative sex outside of marriage. Keep your PP out of the VJJ until you're married. It's not that fucking difficult. It's not that difficult. Get a blowjob. Get a hand job. Whatever. Whatever. Dude, it's so simple. Compounding your sin and karmic punishment uh, by doing that is not going to. It's not going to help you. You know, you can repent, but repenting means not doing it anymore and not supporting it anymore. And making amends to those you wronged. Hopefully by, you know, convincing other people not to do what you just did. If it's your own child that you murdered, then you will perhaps have to shoulder some of the health problems that they would have easily conquered, that they may have easily conquered. You know, if you hadn't murdered them out of selfishness because you were manipulated like a meat puppet by Satan and his servants into doing so. I'm just saying that's a possibility. <laughs> Pardon. So, good stories also need the trinity of spirit, meat, and bones. You know, meaning a good moral to the story, making it entertaining, like your tongue is pleased by foods that your body needs. And good technical execution. You know, it's like the skeleton or scaffolding of the story. You know, in, in sort, it's kind of like in in a way like the moral and the theme and the setting are. Kind of like the bones and the scaffolding as well. And the blood, <laughs> you know, you, you got to get the heart. You got the characters were, were like the brain and the heart and the kidneys and the shit. <laughs> uh, I'd rather write a more correct story like the Chronicles of Narnia than a more popular story that relies on manipulating the most primitive aspects of your mind. Uh, and spirit, rather than appealing to and inspiring the greatest in them. That's, that's what makes society better. That's what makes everything better. Inspiring more Luke Skywalkers in art rather than more Cer Cersei Lannisters, you know? And, and therefore, more people in the real world who are inspired by them as a result. That's just cause and effect. That's how the, the, the stream of culture goes. Once you're strong enough in one area, God will move on to strengthening another. So you don't have to be like, oh, no, if he's going to keep on uh, adding on weight, then eventually your subconscious knows that I'm just going to get crushed like a pancake. <laughs> That's not how it works. Uh, so it needs to be clarified. God will strengthen you in one area until he decides that, okay, you're strong enough in that area. And then once you have learned everything that you need to learn, you will not feel burdened by that area anymore, and then he'll move on to another area. And you will be perfected slowly, progressively in that way, you know, into what he wants you to become. He's shaping your mind, your mind and your, uh, I don't know if I completed this, but yeah, your mind and your spirit together equals your soul. <laughs> your mind and your spirit equals your soul. You let someone control your, your mind or your spirit, they will rule your soul. You, they will destroy your creative soul as well. Don't let them do it. You know, even Hitchcock could sneak some stuff in there that he wasn't uh, technically. Well, you know, he did the best he could with the, uh, the limits the Hayes Code placed on him. But yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about Kanye. So this is from the Officer Tatum. Very popular. 2.7, 2.17 million subscribers. Let's see what he has to say about Kanye. 
It seems like a lot of people did forget about the leftist violence that just ran wild in a lot of these cities in 2020. And, you know, part of the problem is that Democrats have realized that Trump is actually an asset of theirs and that if they can rally American voters against Donald Trump, they have a better chance of sort of wiping the slate clean on the mistakes that they've made. So they use Trump to their advantage. That's exactly what they did this past midterm cycle. And I'm sure that that's exactly what they're going to do again, moving into 2024. This video is brought to you by Prison Fellowship Angel Tree, brought to you by P Prison Fellowship Angel Tree. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I, I am so impressed at what we've been able to do to help 1,100 kids. Our goal is 1,300. We're almost there. And I want you to understand what Prison Fellowship Angel Tree is all about. There's young people whose parents are in prison for no fault of their own, and we are going to help them get a personalized message. I actually donated to this, by the way. I, I really recommend if you don't have anything for, if you don't want to donate to Veterans Home Front, which I'm trying to raise at least something for before Christmas. <clears throat> I donated to, to this one, though, as well, both of them. But uh, this one's a good one, too, if you don't want to support veterans for some reason. It's a Bible and also a gift from their parent who's incarcerated, a gift to give to them for Christmas so that these young people, these children, these kids don't have to feel alone, don't have to feel abandoned or forgotten about during Christmas. We are going to do it big, baby. We already at 1100 goal is 1300 but i think we need to go way beyond that goal because we have until christmas to try to get as many kids help as possible but i just want to give a quick shout out to the people who have who have gone out there and put your name on the board this is the last few donations 120 20. yeah seriously if you have like even a dollar don't don't think it's nothing it really does mean something 25 125 25 and 125 and just know that these are the numbers. If you want to help five kids, that's 125. My family donated 1,000, that's 40 kids. You do what God has purposed in your heart. Like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you get notifications anytime I go live and make a video. Make sure you still subscribe to this channel. Like this video, comment on this video, share this video. And also, if you want to get merch, it's on the carousel below. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? I never go live on here, but I want to start going live a little more. Even though I look crazy, it doesn't matter. I didn't brush my hair this morning. So what? But I wanted to go live on here real quick because, you know, it's it's way more fun to go live on here than Insta than YouTube. I'm just saying. But I want to talk about a few issues. I'm going to talk about yay. I'm going to talk about Trump. And I'm going to talk about America. The first thing is, it he has, there's a lot of truth in his take here. So <laughs> I got to say though that that shirt cracks me up. <laughs> that sweater cracks me up. Is that I think your boy yay is crazy. Well, that's been known, you know, that Kanye has mental health issues. A lot of people do, but Kanye's specific bipolarism and narcissism is very, like, op very in the uh, public eye, you know, ever since his debacle with uh, Taylor Swift on stage. I just think he's crazy. That's, that's, that's and then the whole, I'm a God face. <laughs> that's, that's it. You know, I, I respect his his he is a manic depressive bipolar narcissist and now he's trying he's like he's being manipulated by dark triads and crimson triads into being uh into trying to be a dark triad <laughs> it's uh uh he really needs to get the fuck away from all these bad influences and learn the truth genius in certain areas i know other people who are just like him who are ultra creative but yeah but again when you sell your soul to satan as many of these artists openly pro proclaim that they have they've sold their soul to the devil their creative soul the devil inspires them spiritually and and not just satan because he's not unlimited uh his servants as well you know all the other spirits that fell with him that serve him uh they also are assigned to inspire uh mortals with abilities that they would not otherwise have. But the Holy Spirit is greater than all of that when he inspires a holy or righteous man. And there's that, that's two different degrees. Holy is different than just righteous. 
Righteous is when you, you, you can't quite get to holy. You know, you're just, you're doing the best you can. You're as righteous as you possibly can be. You're righteous. You know, there's a lot more honor and glory in being, in being righteous than in being Machiavellian. You know, they're not all there here. And it's unfortunate because I think that your boy, yay, what's up, right wing angel? I think your boy, yay, is being influenced, which is which is which is very bizarre, because as an adult, yes. as a grown man, you would not think that uh, other people could influence you. You know, you have yes. you, you used to be worth a billion dollars. All this notoriety. No, see, that's the myth. That's the the flattering lie that the world tries to teach you. Oh, once you grow up, then you're not as easily influenced. No, you're influenced by everything. <laughs> you are influenced and conditioned by everything, by media, by uh, the situations, the hard things that you go through in life. You can either be conditioned in good ways or you can be conditioned in bad ways. And a lot of that is determined by what you surround yourself with, what, what you internalize, what you believe is true what you put faith into as being true and then act on it, that sort of thing. That determines what your, how, how your life turns out, not only how your life turns out, how your entire eternity turns out. Body and fame and you being used, he's being used. Um, the same talking points that Nick- Yep, he's being used like a bishop chess piece, only he's a false bishop. <laughs> he's a false, false bishop and he's being used exactly like a chess piece. Fuentes would say is the same talking points I heard Ye say on Alex Jones show. Now I have a lot of respect for Alex Jones. I think people try to put Ye and Alex Jones in the same category, but Alex Jones is, is a, is the OG at this stuff, right? Yep. I feel like outside of Sandy Hook, Alex Jones used to be, have been, had been on point about a lot of stuff. Yeah. And the reason they hated him so much was him talking about the satanic cabals at the top who control everything. <laughs> and that that's really why they want to destroy him and destroy it and try to make it like they uh, explicitly said to make it chilled enough, the environment chilled enough that nobody wants to follow after him, that nobody is bold enough to speak anything like he spoke. That he'd been talking about for years, the deep state stuff, all this stuff that we talking about now, Alex Jones been talking about it. But for you to shock Alex Jones and for Alex Jones to feel like you crazy on his show, you must be out of your mind. I mean, you, you must be losing Especially when you're dressed like a black condom. Losing it. And let me just say this for the record. You dick. I've seen stuff that Nick Fuentes said. And after the things that I've heard him say, he's a racist. Now, do I think you should be canceled? Do I think that people should, you know? It's so easy to detect a plant. It really is. Controlled opposition is fairly easy to detect. Boycott Nick Fuentes. No, I don't care, man. You, you're entitled to your own opinion. But Nick Fuentes is racist. <laughs> you got someone out there who's like, oh, maybe Hitler wasn't so bad. <laughs> Probably controlled opposition or, or trying to justify evil in any way. Basically, <laughs> that's a probably controlled opposition. Uh, Nick Fuentes is, is what they call a Holocaust denier. Now, I just don't think the Holocaust is a battle that, that, that people need to try to fight. The Hitler kill was responsible for six million, two million, one million, five thousand. It doesn't matter when you have the ide ideology to exterminate a group of people. You are a bad person. You, I don't care what you did in history. You, your legacy is tarnished forever. True. That's like saying. Because you can't cut, you can't cut some rot out, you know, around the, some fruit. You know, it'll still poison the whole thing and kill the, whoever tries to eat it. That's uh, like Hitler. And that Satan you know, when I heard like his entire philosophy, like his Mein Kampf philosophy, if you try to live by that philosophy and try to cut out, oh, he wasn't so bad because of this and blah, 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 and then I can live by it, <laughs> you're going to be destroyed just like him and you'll destroy others and you'll be doomed eternally. Don't do it. Don't fall for their trap. Well, you can be powerful. Don't do it. When I heard Kanye say, you'll be doomed I love and powerless Hitler. completely. A lot of things that he did that I love. And it's like, it's like, it's like a Christian saying, I love Satan. 
There's a lot of things that Satan has done that I love. You cannot love evil and love God at the same time. You can't love good and evil at the same time. You have to hate evil, not the evil doer necessarily. You can love your brother and sister, but you cannot love evil in any degree. Any degree at all. Or you're being uh, manipulated. Love. We need to stop acting like Satan is really bad. It's like... If your mission is to steal, kill, and destroy, it's irrelevant the things that you have done that have made an impact. You know, um, it, it's crazy to me that he would say something like that, but that's something that Nick Fuentes would have said. You know, it's like saying, I love Jeffrey Dahmer. It's just everybody got good that they've done in the world. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're like, wait a minute. I don't think that's a good analogy. <laughs> Maybe Jeffrey Dahmer did something right, but all that he did was bad. Yeah. Especially if one of your family members was a victim of this guy. You know, uh, we can go down a list, man. We can go down a list. We we can even we can even bring up what what his name? Uh, uh one Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein. He did a lot. I like a lot of stuff that Jerry Epstein. I mean, no. I said Jerry Epstein. Je um, I, I'm forgetting his name now. Uh, God dang. I said Jerry is Jeffrey Epstein. Did I say Jerry or Jeffrey? One Y'all know what I'm talking about. As I said, I like a lot of stuff Epstein did. And, and, and no, man, he, he, he was abusing children. They had flying people to pedophile island. You like, come on, bruh. Like, I just don't, I just don't understand that sentiment. You know, if you talk about slavery in America, I, I love slavery. A lot of good things came from slavery. You know, it's, it's like, yeah, there were some things that benefited America from slavery, but people getting beat and raped and all of the negative things that came with slavery. I don't think it's somewhere where you could tout and say slavery was a great thing. So anything, regardless of that, I'm just, I'm just putting Slavery it wasn't good in any regard. <laughs> Technically, you could enslave, and slavery, again, still exists today more than ever. We have more slaves in the world today than ever. So technically you can get a bunch of slaves to build a stadium for you and it will go up quicker. So you can be, oh, well, yeah, there's benefit to it. Even if a bunch of them die, it's evil. You don't do it. And the, the soccer people should have been monitoring the entire thing. To, and as soon as they saw one person died or, or that they were being, they should have gone before that. As soon as they saw that someone was being mistreated to, to play their fucking kick the ball game, then uh, they should have stopped the whole thing and said, no, we're not hosting in your nation. But where are the values? Where are the, they have the virtue signaling to clothe themselves like Kanye is doing. Oh, I'll just clothe myself in it. I'll try to gain power through it like that. Instead of actually being righteous. <laughs> Instead of actually being worth watching or participating in. Perspective of how crazy what Kanye West said. Even if he meant it or not, it was crazy. You, 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 can't, you can't have one without the other. You can't, you can't in one breath say you like a, like a person and still think that you sound sane when that person was responsible for ordering the death and murder, slaughter, abuse, uh, mutilation of women, children, and, 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 and men. Men do count too, but women and children, you know. Um, so I, you know, I think that these things you have to be able to compartmentalize. So let me just move on from yay. I think that. I think he he's like people I know, bipolar individuals who one minute they up, one minute they down. They up in a in an accelerated, they're creative, they're doing this, and they in a downer, they everybody hate them, they hate everybody, the world is ending, they start to love dictators and murderers and my friend Peter was exactly like that. He was my after I got out of actually met him while I was in the army. Uh and then I moved from the barracks and we, we became roommates uh in his his house and we became like the best, you know, probably one of the best friends Bes besides Peter, I'd say he, he's probably the best friend I ever had. 
Uh, but he was also, he was exactly like that. I once had to chase him around the kitchen. Uh, he was like blackout drunk and he thought he was, he literally thought he was time traveling. <laughs> I had to chase him around the kitchen table. He had a knife and he was going to stab himself to prove that he could time travel. Uh, so yeah, I had to risk my life to wrestle the knife away from him to save him. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was drunk too, but uh, not that drunk. Other stuff like that. And if you say, yay, a genius. See, this, this is the thing. This, this hey, Afro trick. Thank you for the follow. Conversation is very similar. When people say, yay, is a genius. That's like saying a, a man who cheated on his wife is an alpha male or a man who cheated on his wife is a high value man. Those things don't go together. Amen. If you are a genius, I would argue that maybe Albert Einstein was a genius. I, I would argue that yeah, he um, was a genius. maybe even more modern. I think Elon Musk was, it could, could be per, perceived He's as a, a genius. genius too. You know, you know, cause, cause when you're a genius, but, this is a thing. Intelligence without wisdom doesn't mean much. So you could be as intelligent. I've made this point <laughs> over the past several days. And then this happens to fully illustrate it. Data was the most intelligent member of the Starship Enterprise, <laughs> probably ever of any, of any enterprise, even better than Spock. But if he couldn't, if he couldn't control his emotions, all of it was worth nothing. He couldn't function at all. He couldn't function at all unless he controlled his emotions. And that's what stoicism is about. Like the stoicism that is, that is taught to commanders, to officers, to military members. It's not about not feeling, it's not about being a robot. It's about embracing the good feelings. But when you have something to do, when you have to take the shot, you have to be completely calm. You have to put everything else out of your mind. You have to breathe a certain way. You have to have trigger discipline, squeeze a certain way. You have to train to do this properly so that when adrenaline is pumping, you can still take the shot. You can still do the, the, the thing that you need to do. You can still climb the wall without your, your fingers failing you from the adrenaline and the, the uh, just everything. You have to train even when it's hard. And yeah, and sometimes that means, you know, sitting through boring material, or sometimes that means doing a rigorous weight training that makes you, <laughs> that, that really hurts for a few days afterwards. That means that you not only are creative, innovative, but you are, you can sustain your innovation. You can sustain your innovation. Like yes. people may not like Elon Musk, but he's been able to build something that Ah, oh, thanks, Afrochick. Many people would never be able to build and never replicate. If you told me that uh, uh, Ben Carson was a genius, I would believe you. It, you're not a genius if you are up here one minute and destroy everything you created in the next minute. I don't think that's genius. You are an unstable individual. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't like when people say that, even musically. You say, oh, he's a and yeah, wisdom is more than just controlling your emotions. It's about having the right storehouse of, of information to draw from and being able to discern what's good and what's evil, what's true and what's false. That's basically what wisdom is. You don't have to know that much to be able to discern good from evil and true from lie, truth from lies. It's, uh, you know, through the Holy Spirit, you can know all those things. It's that's the greatest source of wisdom and knowledge. The musical genius. Mm, lyrically, I mean, producing music. You know, because to be honest, when you talk about music production, even though his name is tarnished and probably deservingly so, I think somebody that I'll be considered a genius in music is like R. Kelly, even though he's bad. But when you talk about you want to isolate genius. I don't agree. I don't agree. I'm sorry. I would say maybe Michael Jackson, even though he's a very strange individual. He was, he was a very strange individual. But I can still recognize that his music was great. You know, Queen. Uh, fucking not the best life choices as far as like, you know, uh, <laughs> promiscuous uh, sex. Would have been better if he had just had, you know, gotten married to uh, or, or whatever to another guy and just stayed with him. And I'd had a bunch of promiscuous sex on tour and then died, you know, early. And we would have gotten so much better music over time. Maybe he would have learned a lot more over time. 
you got to have the wisdom, not just the intelligence, not just the talent. You got to have the wisdom and you have to judge by the square and compass. That's why Officer Tatum and all of these other guys and I and, and gals and I agree so much. It's because we all judge by a very similar square and compass. But the, the square and compass that Kanye is judging by is, is bad. Just like Trump, the guy on, on his shirt, is, is uh, he judged, he surrounded himself with bad counselors. That's just how it is. He surrounded himself with bad, uh, a bad, not the best cabinet, but other than his cabinet, a lot of the counselors in his life were not the, just not good. So... They need, Kanye needs to work on that. <laughs> so does Trump. Genius. He was a genius in music. All the, story, all the songs he wrote, he produced. I mean, some of these people write their own stuff and they produce their own stuff. And I'm not saying Ye didn't, but when I think about music that's lyrically genius, I would argue that Tupac was a lyrical genius. I would argue yeah. that, you know, maybe Eminem is a lyrical genius. Lil Wayne is a lyrical genius. Yeah, and a lot of these just happen to die around age twenty-seven. I don't, in no way, form, or fashion, is Kanye West a lyrical genius. Uh, so let me move on from that. I just wanted to get my two cents on that. It's been I've been thinking about it all day, and I've been just like perplexed at the fact that Ye came out and said what he said, and it just it's it, it's 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 weird to me because maybe he could have made a better point if he would have been in the right state of mind to articulate what he's saying instead of going off of talking points from a kid that I would argue is, I think he's evil, man. I, I really do think yes. that kid, Nick Flint says, you judge people by their works, you know, that's how it always has been. <laughs> it's what you're supposed to do. That's why it's so easy uh, to discern a lot of things is you judge them by their works Are the works evil or are they good? Nick Fuentes, I would say, uh, from what I know, the limited amount that I know about his work, uh, has not seemed, he has always seemed like controlled opposition. Like he's just there to, to make others who associate with him look bad. This is evil. I really do think he is. You know, he always bashing gay people. And now they're doing the same thing with Kanye. You know, they're trying to make it, all the people that, that Kanye is surrounding himself with, their specific goal is to make it so that, you know, anyone who associates not only with Kanye, but with, you know, <laughs> right now they're making Kanye absolutely radioactive toxic so that he cannot, no one should associate with him after the Alex Jones show if they want to, uh, you know, unless they're just doing it to hurt him so he can dig himself in deeper and again, segue off a cliff. So they're, they would only be doing it for malicious reasons, unless it's an intervention, but I doubt it. I mean, I mean, I, he has criticism of gay people. Let me just say that, which I do to, to a certain degree. But Nick Fuentes goes on and on and on and on. About like, I'm sure Pierce Morgan would invite him on like Tate, like he invited Tate, uh, Andrew Tate on <laughs> just to ambush him. And, you know, just like he invited Alex Jones himself on just to try to ambush him and try to make him look foolish and stuff like that. About homosexuality. And then he in the video. Not to try to help them or have a good faith meeting of the minds, you know, a good faith debate to edify each other. It was just like, no, I'm going to try to destroy you. You know, that sort of thing. I'm going to tear you down. I'm going to make you look, I'm going to put a stink on you in the public eye. Yo, stink riding eye. Riding around with a clearly gay dude with, with bunny ears on his head. I mean, but some people don't want to see that. Yeah, he's also a, a huge hypocrite. He's so against gay people. You know, he pr shouts it from the rooftops and then he surrounds himself with gay people. <laughs> he probably has sex with gays, you know. You know, anyway, let me move on. I, I think Nick Fuentes is not a good dude. And, and it's sad because let me tell you who called this a long time ago. Pastor... Uh, um, Marcus Rogers. And that's sort of how you can tell that he's kind of like a dark triad personality like my friend Peter used to be, who's thinking he's probably actually a very uh, stolid <laughs> foundational leftist. And then he's thinking, oh, I can just I can just infiltrate them and make them look however I want. I'll have I just have to grift them. I'll I'll stay I'll take all their money from the stupidest uh, members of their uh, community and I'll twist their minds and I'll do this and that and I'll make them look bad. <laughs> That's what people like Nick Fuentes do. 
call. That's what people like my friend Peter used to do. This a long time ago. He called a long time ago. When Ye was doing the Sunday's best stuff or whatever, Sunday service. Pastor Marcus Rogers said. He really need to get around real, truly godly men. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. He and stay away from Hollywood. Need to get around godly men because being around fair weather Christians are going to, I'm paraphrasing, they're going to lead them down a negative path. He really need to get around godly men. You should have listened to that, man. And that's what happened, I, I believe. I think if Ye was around men who really were like, like Marcus Rogers and other people. Like Officer Tatum. <laughs> like if he made friends with Officer Tatum, his life would, you know, and hung out with him <laughs> instead of Nick Fuentes, his life would be better. Who are, who I think really are spirit led, you know, I think he would fare better. Because somebody like him, I think, even though he claimed to be a leader, I think he's much of a follower. And to even be going around with a Nick Fuentes or some of these other guys is just contra it's just completely counterproductive to anything Kanye West has ever done in his life and what he will do in the future. It's just the way it is. Mm, that's a big thick one you've got in your mouth there. <laughs> So long, so girthy. Trying to do that with one hand is weird. Anyway, let me get to that's what she said. Trump real quick or he whatever floats you about. Uh, I'll talk about Trump. We've been talking about this all the time. Some girl and I forget her name. I think she's with the Daily Mail or something like that. She made a pretty interesting point that I think is room for discussion. You know. She said that Donald Trump is the biggest asset. Oh, somebody else said this. That Kanye West is defending Balenciaga. I mean, if, if the Hitler thing wasn't enough, his, his defense of Balenciaga should be enough for people to question his mental state. Yes. Or not his mental state, his, mo his motives. Yes. All right, let me go to Trump. The lady said Trump is the biggest asset of the Democrat Party. And this is true, too. I think that was such a profound statement. And it's not because I think Trump is working for the Democrats. The Democrats are using the the uh, the, the figment of imagination of who Trump is presented to the world to run that campaign. Yes. Yep, that's exactly because their expertise is psychological warfare <laughs> to leading you into believing to framing things into you believing that they are what they want you to believe that they are. Oh, we'll make this look evil. We'll make all the good things look bad. We'll make all the bad things look good until you're so confused that we can just spin you around in our, uh, spin you around, 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 and then lead you off in any direction we want you to be. That's how they operate. That's how they have always operated. When it's not bribery and lies, it's deceit. Nobody would vote for Joe Biden. Not one person that voted for Joe Biden. I haven't seen a single person that voted for Joe Biden that was in, that was uh, drawn to the polls to vote for Joe Biden. Every single person that I've heard was voting against Trump. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, this is all I'm saying. When I go and talk to people that don't like Trump, their motives to show up and vote is against Trump, not for the, the Democrats. Now try to tell me where hate really has its home. <laughs> the hate has its true home on the left. These candidates, these Republican candidates that didn't fare well, I think that the crowds drew out to vote against Trump, to vote against Trump candidates. And and, and that girl says something. I, I need to find her because I want to interview her on my radio show. Is that we got to start really thinking. Are, are they effectively using Trump against us? Because, I, you know, let me just say this straight out. I think Donald Trump did an amazing job as the president. I mean, I mean, of course, it could have been better, right? But for what it's worth, I mean, the policies, the direction of the country, America first, pushing back against the, the, the leftists and, and, and establishment, Republicans, Democrats, Donald Trump killed it.
True. He killed it. I, I, I don't think there's anybody in the- And this is the thing. I've said it over and over. He, he wasn't a good politician. <laughs> He's not the best businessman, but he was far better than the alternatives. Ron Paul would have been better. Uh, like he's the one who actually woke me up in uh, 2008, I think it was. Yeah, 2008. So I was I was as asleep as everyone else, and pretty much until uh, 2008. And then he really, you know, as far as like not being politically active at all, I didn't like. It's like whatever. <laughs> But whether or not you care about politics, bad politicians, corrupt politicians can care about controlling you in every single aspect of your life. So it'd be smart not to just let them do whatever they want. America that would have done it better than Donald Trump from 2016 to 2020. You know, Clinton would not have been a better alternative than Trump. DeSantis, I think, would be a far better alternative. I think Kerry Lake would be a better president than uh, Trump. But look at the alternatives. <laughs> That's the thing. They're, they're like making the playing field in such a way that uh, that's, uh, that's that was the best option we had. So, and as far as it goes, he, he still did a, a pretty good job and he would have done much better if he just surrounded himself with better people. Nobody in America. But for some reason, they've been able to vilify the image and likeness of Donald Trump to the minds of most Americans. Yes. That the protest and the vote was against Trump and not for Biden. In the midterms, they were voting against Trump Republicans, not for these old trash can candidates. They weren't voting against, they weren't voting for, for a uh, Fetterman. They were voting against Dr. Oz. Yes. I'm telling you, all you gotta do is look at the crowds. You say, when Biden show up, there's nobody, there's, there's nobody showing up. Fetterman ain't drawing crowds. Uh, Warnock ain't drawing crowds. Uh, who, who else you want to go to? Uh, out here in Cary Lake and, uh, Karen, what's her name? Katie Hobbs. Katie Hobbs ain't drawing crowds. So where are these people coming from? They're coming out to vote in protest. We better, we better be paying attention. I'm, I'm saying something profound, I think. You are brother. We better come out and pay attention because I think what, what I realized in the midterms is that I thought about this way wrong and I admit I was wrong. I thought we were going to sweep them in the midterms and I was wrong, but the baby up. That's what most people thought. But, um, you know, I, I, I came to the realization that even the Democrats thought that even the we leftists, may be looking at this wrong. They thought that we were going to sweep the leg, but no, it was, uh, you know, all the stuff that happened, you know, all the, oh, oh, perfect. It was perfectly, there was nothing hinky that happened. Okay. 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 You and I may be Carrie Lake all the way, uh, uh, Herschel Walker all the way, Donald Trump, 2024, but how many more people in America that's not in our circle that that is not feeling it? I, I'm just wondering. I'm just telling you guys. Like What he's saying in a nicer way is how many are completely mind-fucked? How many are so completely mind-fucked against, you know, this is what you should direct your two minutes of hate towards. It's Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. How many are so easily brainwashed and mass hypnotized and driven with mass hysteria and lies and manipulation that, uh, that they could affect the vote? You know, how much information could they control, you know, suppressing the Hunter Biden laptop story, suppressing this, suppressing that, can't talk about this, can't talk about that, all to shape elections. Oh, nothing hinky happened. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. We're losing Twitter. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens when the ship is righted. Like, social media following. Carrie Lake, I, and she had like 100,000 more people following her on social media than Katie Hobbs. Katie Hobbs didn't even debate. So then what, 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 what were their, what, what was their strategy other than a little bit of, a little bit of manipulation? I think that the election here in Arizona was a mess. Other than some, some same day voting suppression, what was their strategy? Their strategy was, strategy was to say Trump bad, Trump bad, Trump bad, January yes. 6th, election yes. denier, 
Trump, yes. election denier. Trump, 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 Trump. Russia, 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 Trump. Yeah, it's just this, this is their whole strategy. Don't look at us. Don't look. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. Don't look at us. Look at the. Look at that. Look at that. Look at the red cape. Look at the red cape. Look at the red cape. It's so fucking. Oh my god. It's obvious if they if, but a lot of people just are easily manipulated. Useful idiots. Voting for Kerry Lake. To, this is what they will say. Voting for Kerry Lake is more Trump, more drama, investigations, uh, uh, January 6th, insurrections. I mean, they call what happened at January. The, uh, they call what happened there an insurrection. And then what? Portland being taken over by Antifa. What do they call that? What do they call, what do they call Chaz in Seattle? What do they call that? And then keep, keep, let me make sure you make sure that they're uncomfortable. You keep on going and keep on riding, says Kamala, who Biden calls president, President Harris. Keep on riding. They should keep going and then I'll legally protect them. If you use violence against the ones I want you to, if you direct your two minutes of hate towards the ones I want you to. You have reaped, you have sown the, war, the, the wind, and you shall reap the whirlwind. Supreme Court justices, says the corrupt governor, uh, government <laughs> leech, the looters and the moochers. Go fucking read Atlas Shrugged. She was trying, Ayn Rand was trying to warn us all about this. And we were like, no, 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 we can't hear you. Okay, then pay the price. I think that's what they played on. And of course, the abortion thing was a part of it. But a lot of people that I've spoken to, they just sick of the drama. And so they're going to play on the drama. Whether, whether the FBI is weaponized or not, we know it is. They most think about most of America. Do you think they think that the FBI is weaponized? Or are they watching CNN or they're not even into politics? They just hear a headline that Donald Trump got raided in Mar-a-Lago. Most people in this country are not going to look into no headlines, not going to read nothing, not going to put two or two together. Most people are going to say Donald Trump was raided by FBI. He must be a crook. That's their goal. I'm, say I'm just saying. Donald Trump met with a... And if you look at the midterm results, it actually worked. It worked. White supremacists. Nobody want to hear... How, why, when, the circumstances, they don't care. He met with a person that's a white supremacist. That's all that they're going to care about. Nobody's going to look in, like when you talk about JNA 6, nobody's going to look at the fact that police let people in. Um, technically, it really wasn't an in insurrection, in my opinion. I think, they, I think it was dumb. I think they didn't accomplish anything. Ended up getting the girl killed. But however, to me, it wasn't an insurrection, but the average American is not going to even care. We care. We'll look into it. We'll we'll watch the videos and do all this other stuff. Most people in America don't care. We we can even go with the uh, in 2020. Y'all know what I mean, man. Yeah. <laughs> but do most of America think like that? Do most of America think like that? I mean, I mean. I, I, We've been listening to Fox. We've been on my channel. You've been on everybody's channel. But like, is the middle, is, is the independent believing this stuff? Are they believing the lie? These are the things that we got to consider, man. And I feel like, just like yes. the girl said, that they have effectively conditioned and put Donald Trump in a box and formulated a caricature around who they perceive him to be and they use that to gain votes because they they still talking about trump today you you have to you have to say why are they still talking about trump he's not the president i used to think of that like why are they still talking about trump he's not even the president donald trump ain't even running for office why are they still talking about trump because of trump's candidates why did they raid mar-a-lago because before the midterm they can shame trump and pass it on to Trump candidates. That's why they did it. Yep. I'm just saying. And I and I agree, you know, whether whether Trump is right or not, 
you know, we have to really consider is there how are we going to win this election? I don't care about who you like, who you don't. Honorably, without breaking the rules. I don't like, you know, right now Donald Trump is our is our guy. He's running for, yay, yay not even a, in, a, in a running. So Donald Trump is running. He's our guy. I'm voting for Trump all the way. But do I do I honestly think right now with the momentum and what's going on, is he going to win? I think it's going to be very difficult because him, yay, taking that white supremacist to his to Mar-a-Lago is going to be a talking point when it when it matters again. Right. It's going to be a talking point in 2024. They're yeah. going to bring it up. Trump should really be better at optics by now. I mean, just as a business owner and as a former president, he should really understand optics. You know, if you've got if you're inviting Kanye to have dinner with you, you need to make sure that whoever's with him is not, you know, tagging along to, you know, basically try to tank your political aspirations. It's going to be the biggest like like think about what Ye is doing. That it, I think what Ye is doing is hurting the Republican Party. Let me tell you why. Yeah, it's the same type of revenge plot as the, uh, uh, I forgot his name. You know, as, as basically the people he's surrounding himself with, Nick Fuentes and uh, the other gay dude. And people want to talk about control opposition. I, I wonder is Ye... And no, I have nothing against gay people. I have plenty of gay friends. The point is, I can't remember his name. I remember he's flamboyantly gay. And very vengeful. Troll opposition. Ye went out and took a deranged kid and, and other people to go see Trump. And now they've lumped. Think about this. They've lumped Ye, Fuentes, and Trump together. And I was just looking at these articles today. And the articles say Kanye West is now a part of fueling an increase in anti-Semitic violence. Do you, do you, do you, I want y'all to understand the narrative being pushed. Ye said the craziest I ever heard, that anybody's ever heard. But Ye went and met with Trump. Ye and Trump are both Republicans. They are painting Ye and Trump in the same boat. I'm telling you, I'm, 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 you know, don't listen to me. I'm just, I'm just, brain, I'm just braining. It's making me You're really correct. concerned that we're not looking at the fight. We're looking at emotion. We're looking at people we like. Now you got to think. I want y'all to. And that's flattery. Listen to this. The FBI raided Mar-a-Lago. We haven't heard anything about what what has what is to come from that situation. Good night, Afro chick. When are they going to promote or finalize their investigation? When? They could have they could have raided Mar-a-Lago two years ago. They did it during the midterms. So if you think that they have strategy and doing this stuff during the midterms, what do you think their strategy for indictment or subpoena is going to be? You think they're going to do it this year? Think they're going to do it in January? They're going to wait. They're going to, I'm, I'm telling y'all, they're going to wait to keep the drama going. Because believe it or not, the drama with Donald Trump is turning so many people off. Yes. And it's not necessarily Donald Trump's fault, 100%. It's that, that they have. He certainly does not help it, though. A, a strategy to defame, defame, demoralize, defame, criticize. See, being a good politician is almost like being really good at Brazilian jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you, you need to be planning about, okay, how are they going to come at me? And then how am I going to disarm them? Or how am I going to get them in a hold rather, and break out of their, tr their hold attempts and bring this to a ground game and get them to submit rather than getting me to submit? But you have to do it in, you know, the proper way. You have to do it in a proper way. You have to do it honorably. Size to the point where the masses. Trump's whole, he's, he tackles it like a business, like, you know, like a, 
certain kind of businessman. <laughs> I wouldn't say the very most successful kind, which is proven out by his record. But, you know, he's bullheaded. He's bullheaded about it. He, he takes the full, oh, I'm just going to bull right through my problems approach. Uh, and th that's how it, just how he does it. And that's kind of what the nation needed at the time to remind people that, hey, you know, sack up, <laughs> you know, just we're getting bent over the barrel in trade. We need to fix our trade. We need to help everyone, no matter what their skin color is, uh, uh, or religion or whatever, economically. We need to make sure everyone has jobs. Everyone is getting be uh, paid uh, more and that we're not uh, having crazy inflation and getting into foreign wars and sending our sons and daughters in money and blood to, uh, to fight someone else's battles. Is you keep putting it out there, the masses will get burnt out. So yeah, you didn't have a very good, uh, <laughs> it wasn't very good with uh, talking. But for leading, as far as he wasn't surrounded by bad people giving him bad advice, he was pretty, he was like 90%, he was pretty good. <laughs> he was like 90% there. Prison reform, yeah, good job. You know, you could have done more, but uh, better than almost any of the fucking Democrats did. Like, look at what Trump did, and then look at what the Democrats have done. Please judge the fruits by their, you know, what are they a good or evil? Not by what people say about them or by what's popular. And a part of me is burnt out, but I know I got a mission, so I got to keep keep my head up and keep pushing the truth. But, you know, that takes research and the TikTok generation just has like a one minute attention span, which lowers their IQ tremendously. But, you know, sometimes I get tired of the drama. I get tired of defending stuff like ain't no way in the world I could defend. I, I, I know there's an explanation of Trump meeting with Ye and this and, and ended up with Fuentes, but there's no there's no reason that Trump should have met with Kanye West in the first place. Kanye West is literally on the blacklist of being anti-Semitic. Now, I don't think what he said was now. Now I think he is, but I don't think what he said then was. But the dude is being flagged that way. No, he's clearly as anti-Semitic as my uh, as my old friend Peter was. You know, let me let me just give you a scenario. Just say that I was trying to. I don't know what I'll be trying to do. I'm an entrepreneur, and that's ironic considering the fact that you 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 technically shouldn't be able. It's like a self-hating Jew. If you're anti-Semitic, you are a Semite as a Christian. <laughs> That is the root of your own tree. You are a Semite. If you're anti-Semite, you're hating yourself. You're just hating the completely, the completed fruit of that tree. Entrepreneur, I run my own stuff. Just say I was trying to get a business acquisition, right? I just say, okay, because I have an energy drink company. Some of you guys may not know because I haven't launched an energy drink yet, but I own an energy. Or you know, in Kanye's case, a fucking a rotting fruit that might still be saved if someone will fucking help him. Energy drink company called Tatum Beverages. Instead of leaving now, off I ain't gonna the tell you the name of the energy drink because I'm nobody stealing my stuff. It's already, it's already uh, secured, but I, I kind of want to release it and make it surprising. But I have an energy drink company. Now let's just say that I want to go and have my energy drink in Whole Foods. And and somebody that I know, who sometimes they say crazy stuff, they are they they are they are shot in the dark. You know, you never know what they're gonna do. And just say they ended up saying something in a disparaging way against Whole Foods. Now, does it make sense for me to meet and hang out with that person while I'm trying to make this business acquisition or business relationship, make a make make a business move have them purchase my energy drink does that make sense for me to meet with this person it really doesn't it doesn't matter if that i like that person or not it, i'm i'm trying to make a business decision i'm trying to make a business decision so i'm i'm going to bypass talking to this person until i get what i need to get and maybe i'll meet with this person right and that is what most people that's that's like <laughs> the the prudent thing to do but uh, some business owners would say, okay, fine, then I just won't deal with Whole Foods. <laughs> you know, maybe the, the criticism of Whole Foods was valid. Therefore, you know, like maybe I shouldn't deal with Balenciaga 
you know, maybe the criticism is valid. Therefore, maybe I shouldn't deal with Valenciaga. Let them put their clothes in my store. That sort of thing. Maybe it's not as profitable for you, but is it the right thing? Is it good? Is it godly? Is it righteous? That's the square and compass that good men judge by. Right now, you're bad for business, bro. And women. If you're running for the presidency, you're running for the, the president to be the president of the United States of America. You're you're trying to secure a business deal with the with the United States of America, with the people of America. You don't have time to be meeting and mingling with people who are loose cannons. He's right there. <laughs> he should have fully vetted who was with Kanye. He wanted to talk to Kanye, uh, maybe strategize a little, maybe make sure that, you know, everything was okay between them. And then uh, he got completely blindsided because he didn't vet. It was fucking basic. How do you not vet who's coming to see you? <laughs> Who do you not vet who's going to be seen meeting with you as a former president and as such a, you know, supposedly successful businessman? People who are loose cannons. People, people who are unpredictable, people who can mess around and set you up with a meeting a white supremacist. I, I don't, I don't understand, man. And like, it's, it's, it's easy because I like Trump to try to give him a pass and say, "Oh man, he just a man, man. He just, you know, he, he, he." It's like, no, nah, bro. Like, you kind of put us in a bad position too. You kind of put us in a bad position. You, 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 you in your seventies at this point. You in your seventies, man. You you've done business deals all across the world. How how you still making mistakes like this is is, is weird to me. Let me give you a football analogy, and then we got to get yeah, unless he is slipping a little, you know. Maybe DeSantis really would be the better option. Ready to go. Maybe it's time for him to step back a little, or just you know retire. He did a good, you know, he did as well as he could. He, I believe, he did as well as he possibly could. During his four years, uh, he didn't do as well as he should have, in my opinion. But almost everyone feels that way. Almost everyone feels that way about the president. Let me give you a football analogy. If I put you in the game, you had a great season. You had a great season last year. You were, you were, you were a Heisman Trophy finalist. You've been, now let's say you've been playing for four years, three years now, your junior year, you were a Heisman Trophy finalist. You threw a record number of interceptions, but you did a lot of great. This year, we put you on a football field. The first game of the season, you didn't study for the game. You, you didn't show up to practice. You throw an interception for a touchdown. The very first play of the game. This is a really good uh, spiritual analogy as well. Analogy. <laughs> when in practice, we already know that they have the number one corner in the nation that had 10 interceptions last year. And he's going into his last year. He won a Thorpe Award. And, you're gonna th and you didn't watch film and you throw the ball right to their best player. And he got the interception and went for a touchdown. It, what I would think as a coach is, bruh, you got enough experience. Why would you throw an interception for a touchdown? Why would you throw to that guy? We called the play to go that way. You threw it this way, got an interception for a touchdown. Now we down seven to nothing in the, and we playing at their house. It's what, it's Honestly, he should have thrown the ball to Tatum. <laughs> Two, he's got, look at this. He's got 2.17 million subscribers. Honestly, I think that he would have been better meeting with Tatum than, uh, and the Hodge twins. And like, if, if you want to be like, Hey, how do I make it so that I don't look as, you know, I don't, so that the Democrats can't make me look as evil with their mockingbird media. Like, how do you, how do I strategize with your culture, which you know best? Like, what do I do? And they're like, okay, well, uh, don't step on this landmine. Don't do that. Uh, this would help with prison reform. This would help with this. This would help with that. Uh, these are the things that mean the most to us. 
If you can really help us with that, you'll win our hearts because you're doing righteous things to help us. That's how you should do it. Not like, oh, look, this is the most popular, you know, whatever, rapper, artist, musician. Who's got the best ideas, though? Who knows the community the best that you're trying to help? You go meet with those people and say, not the ones who make sure they're not evil. You know, make sure that they're not going to try to mislead you or or, or lead you into a trap. Your goal is to help people, not f not be one of the manipulators like they are. And you would gain success by just doing it the right way. It's this thing about Trump. It's like Trump. They already hate you. You know for a fact the media hates you because they'll never write a good story about you. I don't care if you save Jesus Christ. You and Jesus Christ came back and anointed Trump in front of the world. The, the, the media will never say anything positive. And you just, I just don't understand. It's funny because they would probably start attacking him even more after that. Trump hires fake Jesus actor to to anoint him. I guarantee they would they would like they would start trying to assassinate him all the time after that. Not just character assassination. I don't understand. You're making it hard as a coach. You're gonna get me fired, bro. Making stupid decisions, and I know people. Some people don't like for me to say that. Yeah, I know. If you and, and I say this in love because I love Donald Trump, man. I I think he did such a great job. But man, you gotta in order for us to win, bro. We can't win throwing picks. We can't. We we just giving the ball away. Yep. We can, we got to win the turnover battle. We can't win throwing interceptions. Got to win the spiritual battle. <laughs> we really do. If Trump had made a better spiritual choice when when he was discerning whether or not he should even meet with Kanye, like that's down to wisdom right there. <laughs> It's like, it might be an intelligent choice, but is it the wisest choice? You need to link wisdom and, and intelligence together, you know, to form glory, <laughs> to make a glory, uh, a glorious decision, an honorably glorious decision. So yeah, that was a very good video. And again, I, I uh, highly commend this charity, uh, angeltree.org uh, and forward slash Tatum, if you want to, uh, if you want your donation to help his counter count up because he's got a goal so i used his his uh link so uh yeah this is something i probably can't oh yeah uh hunter asked for the the playlist in i forgot to, to prepare it again let me make sure it's available so yeah this is the intro and we'll, we'll be going through the uh, intermission hopefully within a reasonable amount of time for me to wet my throat. But yeah, I can't play this probably. But this is something to illustrate something I was trying to get across yesterday about art. Uh, and we'll just say that, you know, I would rather be... Okay, so Moondog. <laughs> Moondog was a homeless uh, saxophone player. I think it was New York that he was homeless in. And he he had so much emotion, like he wasn't the te like he wasn't the most technically gifted uh, musician, but he could put so much soul into his music, and it was great. You know, he he could get people to who were just busy, were super busy with their day. You know, get them to stop almost, even if it was just for a moment, you could get them to stop and listen, and convey so much emotion uh with the music that he made so i'll probably play this one i, I might get muted but uh i'm gonna play this one I, I might even be able to play this one to demonstrate my my point but my my point is is that he he didn't have anything in life uh really <laughs> he didn't have the, the things that other musicians sell their souls for like kanye uh and they get the money, they get the power, they get the the false righteousness called virtue signaling. Uh, these days, called virtue signaling. But they get all of that, and they get all the benefits from it. But they lose their souls. What they create isn't as good as what they could. Like, as good as the stuff that Kanye can still do, it's not as good as the Holy Spirit would, would, would allow him to be. It's not. It will never be as good. And some of his stuff is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that's his best works. That's his very best works. And it didn't come from Satan. It came from God. <laughs> and, and only God can, Satan only can even operate because God allows him to. 
So if Satan accomplishes anything good for you, it's only because God allowed him to. You have to understand that. Even then, it's only God who allowed that to happen. You still owe him for that. You still owe him the glory for that. Not saying, oh, Lucifer, he's the light giver, and if I just make a deal with him, he'll make me glorious, and then I won't feel so bad, and blah, 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 blah. I'll have all the things that I want, the sex, the money, the power, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> but you're not going to be, you're going to be empty inside. You fill yourself up in the world, you'll still be empty inside. So yeah, this is the, the thing I'm trying to demonstrate with this, and I, I think... Cyberpunk uh, has a good little scene that kind of tries to describe that as well, that principle, where Silverhand is like, listen to this, this one. John 2. So it was a good arrangement, and this is what I consider, this is what I mean by building on foundation. Think of art like a tower, you know, a grand tower that, that actually can reach up to heaven, and uh, unlike the Tower of Babel. So this great, majestic work, you can't destroy the layer that came before you. You have to build on it. You have to learn the lessons that came before and then build on it in an artful way that doesn't detract from what came before, but which, you know, honor that, uh, <laughs> trying to come up with a better descriptor, which, which, you know, it just builds on it well, <laughs> and it doesn't tear it down. So this is a, this is someone, Mr. Scruff, who did a, a riff on Moondog's Bird's Lament. And <clears throat> this is what I'm trying to exemplify where, the world tries to get you to believe that, oh, you have to be new and you have to be unique and you have to be, you know, or else you have no value and no one's going to want to see it or no one's going to want whatever. 
But it's not true, because again, there's nothing new under the sun, and everything proceeds forth from the mind of God and is allowed by God, uh, and everything that happens. So it is ultimately from him, <laughs> everything. So, uh, yeah, that's just flattering. It's a flattering lie. That's a lie. You know, that's a lie. <laughs> it really is. But what you can do is... L you know, absorb the best art, absorb the best knowledge, the best wisdom, the best intellect, and take in some bad stuff like a vaccine, like an inoculation, and to learn from that too, to strengthen your immune system, your spiritual immune system, your physical immune system, all of it, your mental immune system, and then your creative soul will become unleashed, and you can you can riff on things just almost at will, and just enter flow state, riff on something you love, and make something great. Like this. Like this art isn't particularly fantastic, but I still love it because he made something with <laughs> what he liked. We basically gave you the pogo treatment. So yeah, even though the, even though it wasn't original, and even though it wasn't uh, the art, no, was it wasn't necessarily masterful or the beat or anything or the you know the remix, it was still art. It was still good art to me. So yeah, this is for accreditation purposes. There's Moon Dog's original, and then some good art that someone made from it. So now we're going to talk about. I guess, relating to a lot of stuff. But in my book series, 
I, I have characters who are narcissists, psychopaths, sociopaths, dark triads, dark crimsons, or excuse me, uh, crimson triads, you know, so it's good to actually do research on stuff that you're going to be writing about. Uh, and also, the, I guess this kind of relates to Kanye as well. So he just kind of, he just kind of fit perfectly in with all of this. Uh, so now we're going to be talking about uh, narcissism, psychopathy, sociopathy, and how to spot the differences. Uh, this is from Med Circle, 1.35 million subscribers. I'll get them going while I go take a leak. So I'll be RB. Actually, let me link this while I go. So yeah, Med Circle, 14 million views four years ago. Now, one of the things I want you to pay attention to is that when you're listening to this, the person who's telling you about these things is technically correct, but she's not telling you a bunch of important stuff that, that, that puts it into context uh, in an important way. Basically, she's telling you it in a way that will try to drive more business to her. <laughs> You know, uh, like many police, you know, many law enforcement and military, they have to go through uh, therapy. They have to go through psychological examinations, you know, to make sure that they aren't psychopaths and sociopaths and like all that stuff. They have to pass the Myers-Briggs. They have to pass all those tests. So, you know, it's not like, oh, they have to only do it when they're forced, you know, well... <laughs> That's just, that's just how, just pay attention to how people frame things. Are they doing it to profit themselves or is it like, well, we'll, we'll look at a few more videos and see which one is actually giving the most objective context specifically just to help the listener, not themselves. What is the difference between a sociopath, a psychopath and a narcissist? Here to answer this intense question is Dr. Romani. Help us out here. Well, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of overlap, but the fact is a lot of people are using these terms interchangeably. Mm. They, and they should they be? Pad, they psych, no, they no. shouldn't. They're okay. different things, okay? One rule of thumb to remember right off the bat, every psychopath is narcissistic, but not every narcissist is psychopathic. Make sense? There, there's, there's your key difference. A narcissist is somebody who lacks empathy, is grandiose, is entitled, is constantly seeking validation, is arrogant. Um, it's a disorder of self-esteem and they have trouble regulating their self-esteem. But when a narcissist does a bad thing, they feel a fair amount of guilt and shame. More shame than guilt, frankly, because they're concerned about how other people view them. Shame is a public emotion. So they don't like being viewed negatively in the public eye. Which makes them very easy to control. <clears throat> like my mother had a very, uh, my mother, I, she was a hyper empath. <laughs> she was hyper empathetic uh, and had v uh, little control over her emotions because of the amount of abuse that she suffered over the course of her life. So she was very, very, very emotional and very empathetic. Uh, Almost like that 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 girl from the game we were playing, uh, Yakuza Zero, the other night at the end, kind of like that, but not that bad, <laughs> you know, not that far. Uh, she she had more control than that. But uh, my dad, on the other hand, like I said yesterday, he was a dark triad personality. Uh, I'm not sure if he was a crimson triad or a crimson triad, dark triad. The only difference is you replace the the psychopath with a sociopath. Uh, if the sociopath is a crimson triad, the psychopath is a dark triad. So I'm not quite sure if he was born that way or if he was made that way by his dad and the, the environment that he was in. But yeah, my dad ended up being one of the two types of triads. Very intelligent. He was a certified genius. I mean, he had a lot of, he had complete reason to, you know, have such a high self-esteem, such a high uh, opinion of himself. But he's, uh, and he certainly could have done worse, <laughs> but yeah, he was, you know, he was the, the, uh, epitome of like a gray man in almost every sense. So, uh, basically the mix of that hyper empathetic mother <laughs> and the, the dark triad father, uh, gave birth to me <laughs> and the, the environment that I lived in and no, uh, and found firm foundation and moving constantly and all that stuff. 
uh, if I didn't have the philosophy of Christ from the beginning, if I didn't have, uh, if I wasn't born into the Mormon church, basically, uh, then I would have probably turned out to be, uh, like a crimson triad, like my dad, I would have turned out probably to be like <clears throat> him only on steroids, which would have been very bad. So, uh, I have, I don't, when people try to frame Christianity as like a weakness, oh, it's the, the philosophy of weakness and no, it's literally the only way I've ever gotten anything good in my life that anything good has happened to me, uh, or, or that I've been able to accomplish anything because I, I didn't, I was so, uh, I was so withdrawn from the world. Uh, I was, I didn't feel like I could trust anything and that nothing was worth investing my interest or time into because everything felt like a lie. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You're going to tell me something good. Right. And then I'll find out five minutes later, it's a lie. And you were just doing it to manipulate me. That was my life. <laughs> and the only thing I could trust ever was the gospel. And every time I tried to like, you know, and, and the world didn't reflect the gospel. So I didn't have any interest in it. <laughs> you know, when I was at church, I was interested in what I was hearing. And then I got home and I was like, okay, so that's a fucking, you know, you know, my, my, at least my dad doesn't follow that when he goes to church and then he comes home and he completely doesn't follow it. He's literally just doing it as a, you know, he needs a wife to advance, you know, he needs a, to be a part of, a, you know, look to look a certain way to advance in his career, to advance in society, you know, to cover himself, you know, and stuff like that. That's the only way it, it worked. And it was, it was, uh, it was a, what do I say? What's a good way to describe it? Not a false dichotomy. It was a, you know, <laughs> it led to uh, sort of a duality of like, okay, but it also is an important contrast, you know, like these are the true things and these are the false things. This is how to recognize what is false, what is trying to cloak itself in righteousness and what is actually righteous, what is actually true, what is actually, because he would constantly lie and manipulate just to get his way uh, with everyone. Uh, he was literally the epitome of like a dark triad uh, personality. So yeah, uh, going forward, uh, just sort of think of some of those things. I or by other people, that's where the shame comes from. But they'll feel a little bad. Like if they cheat on their wife, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Psychopaths are a different animal. They're all of those things, except no guilt. I would lean towards uh, my, my dad being a sociopath rather than a psychopath, because I think he does feel shame, at least, you know, guilt, shame. It's not feigned sometimes. So yeah, I would say he's a crimson triad. No shame. Wow. They don't feel remorse when they do something bad. Wow. So they're, they're great um, serial killers, oh. hired assassins, um, people who are going to go in and literally sort of... They also make really great writers <laughs> because, you know, they can, they can be withdrawn from the world and just be building their own worlds in their heads. And some people build lies in their heads to get them to affect the world in bad ways, like Kanye. He's building up this or allowing others to build up this fantasy in his mind and then having him act on it. That's the way that the FBI can build up people or, you know, people in certain alphabet soup agency programs can build them up and bait them into doing things that they want them to do so they can react in a way that they want to react. Oh, conspiracy theory. Okay, well, it's fact. <laughs> it's fact. It's fact. Go look it up. You know, oh, well, let's kidnap the governor. Oh, wait, the plot was actually from the FBI. <laughs> oh, okay. Just do, oh, oh. and, uh, you know, you, you try to inspire so many terrorists and stuff like that. And so many, just so you can swoop in. Sometimes not, so that you can justify other actions. Just manipulate people at any cost. At any cost. If you can just figure out how to get someone to do what you want them to do, as long as it's something you want them to do, sure, do it. You're justified, right? No. <laughs> But that's how they work. That's how they work. And the, these dark triads, you think that they float to... The, one of the things that she won't tell you is that most, most people in her profession are dark triad personalities. <laughs> they are narcissists. Not all three most, but they're narcissists. They're manipulator. They're Machiavellian. They're, uh, a lot of them are actually psychopaths and sociopaths. And, all, and some of them are, are the, the trinity of that, the dark trinity, the dark triad, or the, the crimson triad. But some of them are, are genuinely great, uh, you know, psychologists as well.
So some of them are genuinely trying to help. You just have to discern. Uh, are they telling me the truth? Are they trying to manipulate me in bad ways? Because yeah, you can try to you can try to entice someone to to good. That's that's a form of light side manipulation. I would say that's like that's like Obi Wan, you know, do, using the mind trick. These are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> because if you doom these droids, you're dooming millions of people, and therefore you're dooming your own souls. So yeah, these are not the droids you're looking for. These are not the the, the Jews hiding from the Nazis that you're looking for. Sorry, I have to lie to protect you, you stupid fuck got a business these are your guys they're like i don't care. i don't care who gets hurt that they'd say that and they'd mean it okay where a narcissist is like i hope no one gets hurt okay and the thing she doesn't fit into this is the stoic personality because the stoic personality can seem like these things even if you're hyper empathetic like i have such <laughs> i have a huge amount of empathy that i inherited from my mother uh she was like a hyper empath my dad was dark triad but yeah i have to sort of balance that it you know as my extreme emotions and uh leash that and muzzle it with stoicism with that and the only way that i gain any sort of stoicism is through the philosophy of christ by reminding myself no matter what hardship i go through that all of these other better people had it so much worse than i did my ancestors my uh spiritual fathers my ment uh my you know <laughs> Uh, mental fathers, you know, people who helped shape my mind across my life, and mothers as well, you know, just as important. You can't have a child without a mother and a father. So, you know, like Ayn Rand, she's one of my mommies, my intellectual mommies. The difference between the psychopath and the sociopath is the one where... But yeah, she doesn't talk about the how stoicism can seem like these things or anything like that. It's like, no, just just go to a therapist and cry and cry in society. And it, it's like, it sort of gets someone who is not fully informed about these things like, oh, well, I must act. I must overtly emote in order to, to make sure that everyone knows I'm not a psychopath or that everyone knows I'm not a sociopath or something like that or not a dark triad. No, you're, you, there, she's giving you only the amount of truth that she's giving you only to filter people right to her, her profession. You know, you can get therapy from for free, from, you know, not for $100 an hour. You can get therapy for free from, you know, your chaplain, your uh, your pastor, your your bishop, whatever the case may be, you know, your mother, your father, your friend. It doesn't have to be at $100 per hour. You can get it from the Bible. You can get it from the Holy Spirit. But these secularists have just completely cut all that out and say, no, if you don't come to me and pay me $100 an hour, you might be a psychopath. Most people get confused because a sociopath is a lot like the psychopath. They do bad things and they don't care. Okay? Here's the key difference. A psychopath is born and a sociopath is made. Mm. Okay, that's the key. So a psychopath, in fact, we know in the research on psychopathy, which has also been called antisocial personality disorder in our diagnostic manual, these are people who are actually believed to have slightly different... And it's funny because in my story, the psychopath is not the most evil character. It's the sociopath. <laughs> It's the uh, it's the crimson triad sociopath who is the mo who is the more evil character than the uh, the dark triad psychopath. And autonomic nervous systems. Our autonomic nervous system is actually that part that holds our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight and flight system. So when our autonomic nervous system for a normal person gets charged up, which it would if we broke a rule, if we did something embarrassing or rude, if we ran through a red light, our heart starts racing. Mm -hmm. We sweat, our, our pupils get wide, we look around because we're afraid of the consequence. A psychopath doesn't have that same kind of arousal. That's why they're able to lie on lie detector tests. That's how they get away with it. And do you see, do you see the eyes she's giving her like bugged out? Like, look, look, I'm not lying to you. Look, that's actually a sign of narcissism right there. <laughs> that's a sign of Machiavellian manipulation. It's like she's trying to use her body language to manipulate you in a certain way. I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, she, what she's saying is actually, t it's technically true, but it's, she's not giving you the whole truth. She's giving you a part of it to frame things how she wants to frame them. We look around because we're afraid of the consequence. A psychopath doesn't have that same kind of arousal. That's why they're able to lie on lie detector tests. 
that's how they get away with it. They don't have that same kind of arousal. So where you or I may go on a roller coaster, feel that sense of ex even his reactions are completely. Uh, uh, his actions also are out uh, because we're afraid planned. of the. Con you know, he's trying to present himself a certain way. Consequence. A psychopath doesn't have that same kind of arousal. That's why they're able to lie on lie detector tests. That's how they get away with it. They don't have that same kind of arousal. So where you or I may go on a roller coaster, feel that sense of excitement. See, she could just be talking to the camera right now, but this guy's supposed to be you. <laughs> this is supposed to be, a, you know, representing you listening to this. So it's in a way, his reactions are meant to manipulate your reaction to what she's saying that same kind of arousal and it's not necessarily that, that you'll react the same way he is but the way that he is reacting might cause a reaction in you <laughs> that you otherwise wouldn't have if she's just talking to you and giving you information so where this entire thing is framed to, to like manipulate <laughs> you or i may go on a roller coaster feel that sense of excitement we need to get that arousal in a good way we don't like feeling it when we do something wrong they don't feel it so they do get they get stressed? No, not in the same way. So if they're driving, because mm -hmm. if I'm driving mm -hmm. and I see police sirens coming behind me, I mean, it is a full on, oh, oh yeah. my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to get pulled over. But a psychopath would see that and go, oh, I'm going to get pulled over. Well, this could be, they could have a dead body in the trunk and they wouldn't. My point in pointing those things out is... Well, several things. First of all, that everyone has these tendencies. Every single per, you know, it's monkey see, monkey do sort of thing. And fitting into a society, it's that, you know, you, you learn to fit in in order to survive in, in culture, in society, for everybody. But it's more pronounced in the extremes, the bell ends of the cases. So, like, she exhibits some of the, the things, he exhibits some of the things. But the way that people use this information, it, this could be this could be shared in a much better way. But it's shared in a way where these people, from a fundamental point uh, viewpoint, feel like most people are stupid. I'm so smart. Most people are stupid. Therefore, I have to frame it and talk to my audience like they're stupid children, and I have to manipulate them into understanding me and following me. And it works. I mean, look at how many they got. One point three five million subscribers. <laughs> 14 million views on this video. It works. If you want to do that, then fine. There are good ways to entice people. And then there's, uh, there's ways to frame things. They wouldn't change. And so the they pull over, they get the ticket and they don't care. No, they don't care. And they pay the ticket. If, and maybe not, they'll even probably get an attorney to get them off or say, yeah, you know, my understanding of your state laws is you can't really be doing this and they'll be cool as can be. And this is, this is a, a difference in their, they're actually their how makeup. the nervous systems are wired and their brains are. There's actually been interesting research done with PET scans where you can see brain function. And what not just shown, to clarification, not PET like dogs and cats, PET, PET yeah, scans. Yes. Positron emission tomography scans yes. of the brain, which show brain functioning, if you will. And what they see is that the the section of the brain that serves empathy, that doesn't naturally light up in them. And you can actually teach them to be empathic for a minute, but it doesn't last. A lot of psychopaths who commit violent crimes end up in jail. And the ones who commit more like white collar crimes, I guess they end up as multi-billionaires <laughs> because they're willing to do really, really rough stuff in their business and get through a, like a cartel leader or something like that. Call for the killings of other people. Now, you know, is what she doesn't say. She doesn't say they end up a lot of the times in government, in law enforcement, in my profession, which would be in her profession, which would be psychology. She might even be a psychiatrist. I don't know if she deals in drugs too. Probably. I don't know. I don't know anything about her besides what she's presenting here. My point is my, my viewpoint of most, not all, I think there is good, good therapy, good uh, psychologists. And some good uh, drugs that have valid uses in the field. But a lot of it, most of it is not good. It's not good. It really isn't. It's, it's false. It's false leaders. It's false. Uh, it, or, they're not going to, they're not going to help you. <laughs> ultimately, it's Christ who's going to help you ultimately. And I'll tell you that because I've been through, I've been to the best. I've been to the best. They didn't help at all. <laughs> I couldn't trust them at all. 
Couldn't trust him a fucking lick. But once I actually, cra once I learned how to read and then I read the entire gospel myself, and not only once, I read it over and over and over again and I, at different stages of my life and I applied those lessons and I believed in them because they were true and they helped me when nothing else and no one else would. And it's true because <laughs> I would be dead by now. I would be gone. I would not have accomplished anything I've accomplished at all. I wouldn't have forgiven. I would have become one of those dark triad or crimson triad personalities like them if Christ hadn't saved me. And it's not false righteousness like Kanye puts on. The, I don't get any power from this. I don't get any public approval or people leave my stream. People don't, you know, f five minutes of this is how always how it's been with me. Like five minutes of me talking, 10 minutes of me talking, the, the brick, they can't. They can't ride the unicorn to the destination. <laughs> they can't get there. Some few stick around, you know, they used to at least. But that was more when I dressed things up more and then I could just slip in. <laughs> Maybe, okay, well, yeah, this is some stuff that I'm working on with my, my books and stuff. Maybe I'll, you know, talk about the moral of the story in case I fucking die tomorrow and I can't finish my work. Which nobody's going to be able to see for at least another two years. <laughs> I have to finish moving, and then I have to finish the, and then they're only going to be able to see the first book. They're not even going to be able to see the whole thing, the whole thing. It's the eight books of the seven main, and then the prequel. I got the whole thing planned out. I got it all right. I just got to finish it. But yeah, I, so, sometimes I just want to talk about things in case I fucking die tomorrow. You know, in case anyone, anyway, because we could all just, you know, drop dead. I feel like it's better to, and I know this for my own, from my own experience, that it's better to live your life that way, to not have any regrets. If you feel like you need, you want to tell someone something, just tell them. <laughs> fucking tell them. If you want to say something, don't be chilled. If you want to make something, don't be chilled. Don't be like, oh, how are they going to respond? Or maybe I'll fail. Fine, fucking do it. Fail gloriously. Who cares what they say? If the Holy Spirit put it inside of you to do it, then do it. If you've determined that it was Satan trying to tempt you to do something, then don't do that. It's fucking simple. But you'll get so many rewards by judging by that square and compass and using the, the scriptures that people belittle and be like, oh, he's talking about the Bible again. The Bible thumper's talking about the Bible again. <laughs> I've lost so many, almost all my friends I've lost just because I'm one of those true believers. I lost, I lose my audience because of it. I lose everything because of it, but it's true. And if anyone would just listen and apply it to their own lives, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter if it's poverty. It doesn't matter if it's, you don't feel like you're, you're appreciated or rewarded or whatever. Because guess what? The Lord wasn't either. And he still did everything he did for you. And not just the Lord, but every righteous man who has ever existed, your ancestors, your forefathers, they did it for you. All the good men, they don't do it for themselves. They do it for you. They do it for us, not themselves. That's why heroes, the best heroes in storytelling, they don't do it for themselves. They do it for everyone else. They're saviors. They're Christ. Ah, Christ. Yes, they're Christ. They're saviors. They're following the philosophy of Christ. That's what makes them the superheroes. Not the, oh, I'm going to self-actualize. I'm going to self-actualize and sub myself up in life. Okay, enjoy your temporary things. <laughs> enjoy your temporary things. I'll enjoy my eternal things. Their interesting um, counterpart are the sociopaths. Psychopaths born. They tend to, their belief is that they may very well have, this might be genetic. In fact, psychopaths often have fathers who have lots of antisocial tendencies. Now, how much of it is learned, how much of it is genetic, it's a little bit harder to suss out. But we do see that there is that difference in your true psychopath. They also tend to be, have really glib, shallow charm. They tend to be really intelligent. That's why they get away with stuff. If they were So they've, really they've learned mess. behavior to yeah. assimilate into society. Oh yeah. But there is, it's all a facade. It's all a facade, they're so charming. So if they're born this way, would a three-year-old then not get stressed out if it got no. scared? So 
That's incredible. So what we see when we diagnose antisocial personality disorder, which is sort of our diagnostic equivalent of being a psychopath, in order to get that diagnosis, you have to have shown a pattern prior to the age of 15 of things like truancy, violence towards other kids, stealing, skipping school. And not felt bad animals, about it. Setting fires. They just do it. They don't care. And that before the age of 15, so it's a long-standing pattern. That's what makes us call them a psychopath or having antisocial personality. Now, this is different than sociopathy. Yes, okay. Sociopathy, they look a lot like the psychopaths. The difference is they were made. So this, some examples here. The kid who grows up in a really, 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 really rough neighborhood and learns criminality to get by or learns to be a bully or like, you know, gets involved with sort of like the wrong kids and uses a lot of muscle. So yeah, that's what my dad would have turned me into if I had not been raised in the church. Because that's survivalism, but they, they, it's not necessarily always comfortable for them. I literally would have murdered him in his sleep just to protect myself without Christ. He doesn't even understand that. There were so many nights that I planned how to end him just to protect my, my mom, myself, and my sister. I planned it all out. I could get away with it. I, I was so sure I could do it. And then I read something in the scriptures, almost when, like almost the night I was going to do it. And it was like, you have to forgive everyone. You have to. And then you have to try to save them. Uh, okay. All right. Well, guess what, Dad? Christ saved your life literally. They just learn it. It's the person who grows up with a father who teaches them the business and teaches them how to break the rules. Um, they he may But not, they, like, they don't they would would they feel would they start sweating and have their heart race if they, might, they got pulled over they might they may, may not feel so good about it. they'll be a little bit more uncomfortable with it but in time they learn it and that that what it's almost like they they get trained in not being as aroused by it listen if you broke enough rules if you lived under certain conditions of lawlessness long enough you'd adjust to that new world order mm -hmm. if you will mm -hmm. that's what the sociopath does mm -hmm. and so they're the person who someone who said he was actually a great kid until he got to high school and then it seems like he got in with the wrong kids that feels more like the there was one after that I, I, I there was one time after that we'd moved to uh, the dc area for for him to take another alphabet soup job and we were in a town home and right next door was literally the girl next door that i fell in love with oh i fell in love with her and uh i don't even want to talk about that but there was this one time i don't remember what it was i think it was something about I don't remember. It was just, he would get so mad. It's such a small thing. You know, he had a very stressful job. And then if everything wasn't perfect when he came home, then uh, he would flip out. He did what, he wasn't a stoic and he wasn't a true follower or disciple of Christ. He just went to church sometimes to cloak himself in righteousness. And that's why he didn't advance as high as he wanted to uh, in anything. <laughs> Because he didn't understand, he didn't build himself on a firm enough philosophy. So, yeah, there was this one time, I don't remember what set him off that time, it was something. And my sister happened to be there, or, yeah, I think it was my sister and my mom happened to be there. Uh, and I was like, alright, fine, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care anymore what, what the Lord says. That's it. That's it. I'm fighting back this time. <laughs> I'm fighting back because he always, you know, he's every time my sister did something to me, he was like, don't you dare fight back. And I didn't until, you know, one time then he, he really, uh, he, because re my mom would constantly say, fight back, fight back. She was older. She was bigger. She, I was, a, I was a really small kid and she was constantly tormenting me because she was following my dad's example. So the, uh, that time i was like i don't care i'm fighting back i'm gonna i'm actually i'm gonna kill him this time all those times he was like all right let's go let's fight to the death you know i was like fine i'll, I'll do it we'll fight to the death this time and this time I'm, I'm actually gonna fight back no other time no other time because the lord said do not dishonor your your father and your mother do not raise a hand if you raise a hand against your parents you are literally courting a death sentence from god so <laughs> I was like, fine, that's it. 
uh, and they held me back. Uh, and he ran, he basically, he got out of there. He was like, fine. Oh, fuck. I was like 17. I was, I was, I was his size pretty much by that time. And, uh, I had already started learning martial arts and stuff like that, but yeah, I was going to kill him. I wasn't going to fight him. I was going to kill him as soon as I, as fast as I possibly could, because I was, I was so, I was, I thought I was going to save our lives by doing that, but I would have just gone down a dark path like him, like, like Luke Skywalker understood, like Luke Skywalker teaches in his story, you know, to save your father, you can't kill him, you can't kill, you can't save your dad by killing him, <laughs> you have to, you have to just suffer for him if you have to, just like your father suffered for you, your parents suffered to bring you into this world, to, to make sure that you got that far, it's true, and they could have been worse than they were, you know, they just didn't understand that that was not the best version of themselves or anywhere close to it because the world convinced them that they didn't have a greater potential and that they were doomed to repeat patterns that were far below what they could have, that, that, that they should have established, that were already established, they should have just followed and believed in, not just mouth, oh, I believe, blah, 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 so I can personally benefit. Not, well, you'll personally benefit by truly believing and acting on that living faith. I'm trying to testify that because that's why I'm here. It's the only reason that God has preserved me this far. And I will tell the best stories to exemplify these things again, to inspire new generations to fight against all the other bullshit that only tells you half-truths to lead you in directions that they want you to go. The sociopath. Wow. Okay, that's almost... To, which is namely, depending on the world rather than God, believing in government rather than yourself, believing in some star rather than you. Almost like a training that might happen from at the, in, within the family, within their community, within even the job they get, some cases even within some form of military training. Have you had sociopaths and psychopaths as clients? Mm, not really, no. no. They don't come to, tend to come in for therapy. They, they don't see any benefit to it. The only time you would tend to see psychopaths or sociopaths come into therapy with any consistency is if they were court ordered. And that's a lie. Because again, many in her profession are so psychopaths and sociopaths. That's a fucking lie. <laughs> They, they go to each other for therapy to cover themselves. They're fucking... Okay, anyway. Again, they try to frame it in a certain way. So, oh, because, gonna... because she'll get $500 per hour if you go to her. I say um, couples therapy. No, God, no. No, no. They, it's because they're court ordered. So the judge will make that a condition of release kind of thing. Or they're within prisons and jails and getting some treatment in there. Th this is so incredibly fascinating to me. If a psychopath goes to jail he isn't upset about going to jail um it's in some ways it becomes a cost of doing business you know but it's also they know they're not happy about it there was psychopaths and to some degree sociopaths don't think about consequences you know who also isn't doesn't mind going to prison to minister disciples of christ just saying that's why they pull really penny ante silly crimes like holding up a liquor store. Basically, I need 150 bucks. Here's a liquor store. It's open. Let's go get the money kind of thing. So it's like they act first and think later. So they often don't plan in terms of consequences. That's why they have a tendency to lie. Thankfully, I've never been to prison because I would probably die there. <laughs> if I ever went to prison, I don't break the law. I was raised. My dad was like, you know, he basically gave me the Dexter code. <laughs> My sister was convinced for a long time that I would turn out to be like Dexter, but uh, Christ saved me. Dexter didn't believe in Christ. <laughs> That's the difference. Anyway, uh, and he would, certainly didn't try to be Christ-like, uh, you know, follow the example of his father. Uh, but I don't even remember what the fuck I was saying. Uh, she steal and they tend to have very inconsistent work histories because they um they're not able to hold a job they're yeah like aliases course. um it's definitely like it's more of a griftery kind of a space so we've talked in previous videos about how to cope and again while dating that's not a narcissist that's, that's so not true it's that's a subset because again there's so many psychopaths and sociopaths in government law enforcement psychology, uh, education, 
basically any position where they can take uh, uh, advantage of power and cloak themselves in false righteousness and virtue signaling, again, like church uh, leadership, stuff like that, they are like, you don't understand this upside down world. <laughs> She's not telling you the whole truth. If you find yourself dating a sociopath or a psychopath, is there any coping or you just got to get out? You're in trouble. You're in that, trouble. That could be, actually be a very dangerous It relationship. sounds like it. Yeah. In fact, you know, we, and, and to, even with the narcissistic piece, um, I do, uh, I've done research and work in the area of domestic oh, yeah. violence or what's also I, called I, The reason partner. I would die in prison is because I don't kneel. Like if someone was like, hey, pretty boy, you know, kneel. <laughs> I would probably have to fight them to death and then get a life sentence and then, you know, that's, or die, you know, in, in, in the attempt. And then it, it would just be a, a terrible, because I don't kneel. I don't fucking kneel. You know, you, you don't, you're not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'm not a child anymore. You're not going to reduce me to being a child. I am a, a warrior of Christ violence most people who perpetrate domestic violence are either narcissistic or psychopathic and so so there's a danger there in other words they will dispose of you if you get in their way i want to share a story with mm -hmm. you to get your feedback mm -hmm. this was told to me by a friend mm -hmm. and she said in college she dated a guy for a year mm -hmm. but the guy started to get um just a little weird and mm -hmm. they broke up uh for the next year he courted her mm -hmm. and did everything she wished he had done the first year. Mm -hmm. Showed up on time, brought her gifts, blah, blah, blah. They started dating again. He was perfect for a year. Mm -hmm. He, they went to Thanksgiving at her family's house. He was perfect to her parents. Just became the perfect mm -hmm. man for her because right. he knew what she wanted. And after a year, on the one year anniversary, he broke up with her and said, I've been playing you this whole time because I wanted to crush your heart. Yep. I, I, I am not actually mm -hmm. behaving this way mm -hmm. or this isn't real. Yep. I've been faking it for a year just so I can crush you. Yep. Would that be a That's psych more psychopathic? Psychopath. That's more psychopathic. Sociopathic. Anyway, the, or no, that's more sociopathic. The problem is what she's, what she's saying is, you know what? Guess what? It's not it's not following the philosophy of Christ of that that man should have forgiven the woman if he felt slighted, and if he had just followed the philosophy of Christ, then he wouldn't have done that. Neither of them would have been in that situation. They probably wouldn't have even gone even close to being you know in that sort of danger zone if they just followed the philosophy of Christ. But no, she won't say that to him. She'll say, "Well, what he should have done is come to me to therapy for." hundred dollar per hour therapy sooner no guess what christ can fix you <laughs> these fucking hacks tried to fix you know to fix so many you know and to help them <laughs> and they can't because they can't even help themselves you don't understand how disordered and how fucked up they are and that's why they got into this profession in the first place because of how much fucked up shit ha happened to them and around them in their lives that they got fascinated by it and some of them for good reasons and to, to genuinely try to help people and they're great at their jobs but the vast majority they'll they'll tell you those people the best of their profession will tell you the vast majority of them are bad actors who are cloaking themselves and learning about this profession specifically to manipulate others specifically because they're dark triad personalities or crimson triad personalities to try to manipulate people to to hide themselves so yeah you know, or sociopathic is more. And like I'm not saying that about her. She could be like one of the best of, of her profession ever. I'm just saying the way she's sharing information is is to frame things a certain way to drive more clients to her, to influence public opinion in a certain way, to help her profession, all that stuff. Instead of oh, guess what? What would really help you is l just literally just getting safe and truly being awake through and alive through Jesus Christ. That's the truth. Likely, you know, uh, but if they have no empathy, then why would they want to hurt somebody? Um, because because empathy 
empathy is not, empathy is a positive emotion, okay? Wanting to hurt someone is a very antagonistic emotion. Wanting to hurt someone at some level might even give them a little pleasure. Power, for sure. It's it's interesting to me that someone cannot be empathetic but then want to hurt somebody because to me, you would mm -hmm. have to have the empathy in order to even know what no. it's like to hurt somebody. There's a difference between empathy and understanding. Mm. You can understand what, because if you're, oh. it's, it's like, that's why psychopaths that make sense. great salesmen because they understand a person. They can read a person and immediately say, I got his vulnerability. I'm going to make him buy a car. Got it. Psychopaths are great salesmen. Got it. Salesmen for cars, timeshares, all, all that stuff where they're upselling and almost taking advantage of something. Yeah, because sales, sales is all about manipulation. If you're a better manipulator of other people, then you will be a great salesman. I am a great salesman, objectively. <laughs> Uh, not for my content, because I don't want to manipulate people into, I, ent I entice people into seeing it. And if I had money, I would totally invest that money into, uh, you know, reinvest it back into my content to promote it and so on. And so I literally studied marketing for that purpose. Uh, and also when I get my book series done to be able to market it properly, but I don't have the the resources. Again, it's part of the... the the things that you have to overcome you might you might know all the answers and everything that you could do if you just had the resources to do it and you could make so much you could do so and but then you still have to suck it up keep going and uh you know just keep going because what lays what lays ahead with you developing the strength and the resilience uh is better if you just keep going just keep going. Finish the series. Finish whatever it is you're doing. Finish your masterpiece uh, and branch out. Help other people do theirs as well. Once you gain resources from finishing your masterpiece, invest it into other people so that they can develop their talents too. That's how it should be. That's why, literally what the Lord said. Don't just hide your talents. Don't just, because he'll be very mad if you do that. You're supposed to develop, you're supposed to literally invest by, by, by you know, Picking something that you think you should invest in and investing in it for profit. Someone sometimes making them take on more money and cost of something than they really should. But no, 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 it's that he was able to be superficially charming. Psychopaths and sociopaths and narcissists make great chameleons. They're definitely able to change the situation to get what they want. And psychopaths in particular and sociopaths. That's why they make great actors as well. Are they, and a lot most actors are, of course, narcissists. They view the world as an instrument to fulfill their desires. Mm. That's really what they're about, which is what it's awful because they're going to often discard a partner when they don't have much use for them or expect them to be, have a very specific role. So they may have married her and she may have had their kids. Now she's going to have to put up with their affairs because they want something else. And too bad if you don't like it, this is the new world order and I will destroy you in court. It's that kind of thing. That is insane. Yeah, it's chilling. It's I chilling. want to leave it right there. I have learned more about sociopaths and psychopaths than I ever. Th so yeah, uh, thanks for that uh, mad circle. And next, this is with more context, and it's also said in a much briefer period of time. So because it's not trying to frame your perception of things, it's just trying to give you more information. But this also is not full context or as full as it could be. This one's a little more full. We'll, we'll, we'll do it in order, though. Uh, this one, because they both have white screens, I wasn't sure. In psychology, the dark triad represents three personality traits, narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. If we were to ask the three, who has the darkest personality, the narcissist would say, me. The psychopath would say, I don't care. And the Machiavellian would say, it's whoever I want it to be. People scoring high on the three traits are more likely to commit crimes and create severe social problems in society, families, and organizations. This is why the research on the dark triad is used widely in law enforcement, psychology, and business. Here is an overview of what we know. The narcissist is- It's funny because he's looking through a crimson triad <laughs> to, uh, with a magnifying glass at other people. That's hilarious. An overview of what we know. Through the frame of a crimson triad, he tries to examine other people. <laughs> The narcissist displays grandiosity, entitlement, and superiority, and wants nothing more. But again, so does every other, every person who has ever accomplished anything great, 
has in some way uh, exemplified or shown grandiosity, either through their works or through their personality. More than admiration. Once he gets what he wants, the narcissist is rarely interested in other people. When he does care, it's to enhance his status, which is why he likes to mingle with successful others. They seem as though they're completely in love with themselves, but at the root of their inflated egos Insecurity. are often deeply held feelings of inferiority. To protect their constructed self, they can never admit to being wrong, which is why... See, if you're completely built on Jesus and he's the one where you get your security and your peace from the Holy Spirit, you don't have to do all that shit. Why they lie or blame others. Machiavellians are unprincipled, cold, and have a cynical view of other human beings. They like money, power, and winning, and they use manipulation to get what they want or exploit others. If manipulation doesn't work, they steal or betray. Those high on the spectrum believe it's better to be feared than being liked and defend others as a strategy to control them. And most politicians score very high in Machiavellianism. When you are a psychopath, you come across as... It's usually uh, narcissism with uh, linked with Mar Machiavellianism. Not all of them will be psychopathic or sociopathic, but they're two closely interrelated traits of narcissism and, uh, uh, you know, the thing. Cool. <laughs> Biden's actually a great example. Old. Machiavellian and a fucking idiot and uh, <laughs> it's just terrible in every way. Others think you are scary. You also show little to no fear, act impulsively, and you enjoy mental thrills. Those high on the spectrum don't form any emotional bonds. The result is a complete lack of compassion. That means they have no problem being mean. If something terrible happens, they later often don't feel any remorse or guilt. And society's breeding people with these traits. It's breeding an entire generation of narcissists in Generation Z. It's breeding psychopaths uh, who don't liter who literally do not understand right and wrong. It's breeding sociopaths who are trained to not do the right, to hate the right, uh, and uh, to do evil and love evil. That's what's going on. It's psychological warfare. You, you, it stems ultimately from the spiritual realm, but also it has temp it has worldly, uh, it has worldly, clearly uh, areas that it's coming from. The research tells us that men score significantly higher on all three compared to women. And while these three personalities are empirically distinct, they do overlap. Clinically, both narcissism and psychopathy are regarded as mental disorders, while Machiavellianism isn't. Whether nature or nurture is responsible for these traits has been somewhat answered by twin studies that show that narcissism and psychopathy have substantial genetic components. Machiavellianism seems to be less prevalent in pairs of twins. However, the environment also matters. A psychopath may not only pass down his genes, but... Like, you can see very clearly that rap, most rap music, like thug music, is producing a narcissistic Machiavellian, uh, pretty much psychopathic. It's, it's like a thought virus. It's a thought virus replicating itself in culture. That's why you need good, good uh, aspects of good memes to, to, to fight the bad memes. You know, it's mimetic, it's mimetic uh, propagation. <laughs> it's, you, you really need good stuff, like your belly. You need a good, you, you can't let the candida take over. You need good rap to, to fight the bad rap. You need the nefix to fight the, uh, you know, <laughs> dear Lord, take your goddamn pick. <laughs> influence a child by being a role model. A Machiavellian father shares with his son not only genetic material, but might also show him all his tricks. Yeah, and not just genetically, but also epigenetically. The son of a narcissist not only gets his dad's chromosomes, but may also experience his perfectionism. 
With the big five personality traits, also known as ocean, the three correlate either positively or negatively. Narcissists and psychopaths are often open to new ideas and extroverted. Psychopaths and Machiavellians have low conscientiousness. All three personality types score low on agreeableness, and psychopaths are hardly neurotic. Whatever happens leaves them cold. An evolutionary explanation for these traits could be sexual strategy. Many of us pursue a slow life, invest in long-term relationships, have a few children, and spend time on parenting. Dark triad traits may have survived because they look to optimize a fast life. Their ancestors lived in an unpredictable and dangerous world. Because of a shorter life, they sought many sexual partners, spent no time on parenting. This is also known as R-type personality. And did not invest in human relationships. This may also explain why they strive in competitive environments, such as corporations. Here, a Machiavellian may use charm and insults to manipulate others, the narcissist his physical appearance, and a psychopath physical threats. And since they all lack compassion, they often elbow their way to the top, which is maybe why all three dark traits are well represented in upper... This is the natural man. <laughs> they're, they're, like, when you look at it, society is creating narcissistic, sociopathic, Machiavellian... Fucktards, <laughs> meat puppets. This is what society is creating. Uh, it's not like, and everyone has these tendencies, uh, and they're being magnified. This is the natural man. This is what this is what becoming a righteous, holy man through the philosophy of Christ, truly becoming a disciple of Christ. That's what that means. Is defeating. It's defeating the natural man, becoming a German shepherd rather than a wolf. A level. At least a bad wolf, because there are good wolves too. Management. But there are also downsides. If your mind was programmed to be impulsive, aggressive, and selfish, you are also more likely to abuse drugs, feel excluded. Yeah, to abuse drugs, to enrich the pharmaceutical companies, fear, fear this thing, fear this thing that you have 99% chance of surviving so that you can enrich us, you know? The psychopaths who are the dark triad psychopaths who are r running the pharmaceutical companies, the 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 mockingbird media, the politics, <laughs> the ticks, the bloodsuckers, the uh, the twits, the fucking twits. Did suffer from depression or end up in jail? And they think they're smart. This is why Dexter was smarter. <clears throat> This is why Dexter and even Hannibal Lecter, who is a sociopath rather than a psychopath, uh, Hannibal Lecter was made through the experiences that he went through in life. He wasn't born that way. But he, the reason that Dexter and Hannibal Lecter defeat the psychopaths that they come up against and most of the other sociopaths is because they live by a, a better philosophy. They live by a better code. My code is even better than Dexter's. It's even better than uh, Hannibal Lecter's. I would defeat them if I came up against them <laughs> because I live by the philosophy of Christ. So even if they murdered me, <laughs> I would still win. This is why we may not only find ways to protect ourselves from these darker minds, but also have empathy for them. After all, maybe they didn't choose to be that way. What about you? Did you inherit some dark triad traits? And Hell, I might even be able to save them. Because <laughs> they're smart enough to actually be able to sit down and listen to me and have the attention span. Unlike most of this generation. If that's the case, and if you are aware of them, did you develop strategies to cope with them? Share your thoughts in the comments below and read the description to dig deeper and find relevant links, sources, and information. So yeah, that one gave more context than the first one. This one gives even more. So let's see how this does. This was good. This was by Sprouts, 1.32 million well-deserved subscribers. <clears throat> 333,000 views on this one, though, when there was like 14 million views on that one. 
So this it's only a year old, but you know, <clears throat> it's just flattering, you know, framing things a certain way, knowing how to manipulate your audience and the SEO and all that stuff. Yeah, you can get really popular and spread a lot of lies. <laughs> all right. And then you'll attract a lot of people to you who uh, maybe weren't meant to find you in the first place. <laughs> Hey, Psych2Goers, welcome back to another- Oh yeah, speaking of, this is Psych2Go, 10.2 million subscribers, 483,000 views from two years ago. So this one's, I would say, has very good uh, context as well, but taking the, the former one with this one gives much more context than the first video did. This is why continual study is important, which is one of the things that you should learn from this. <clears throat> You can't just go through something once and think in the hubris that society's built up in people that, oh, I understand everything now. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe gestate on that a little more. Maybe chew on that a little more. And then see what milk you can produce by doing so. There's like to go video. Or what honey you can produce by actually gathering diligently. And then <laughs> fermenting that what you gathered diligently. Have you ever heard of storing what you gathered diligently? Of the dark triad of personalities. Well, what is the dark triad and how was it discovered? So, the dark triad is three overlapping yet distinct personalities subclinical narcissism, subclinical psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. By subclinical, we mean that someone might show the traits of a narcissist or a psychopath but they're not severe enough to be diagnosed as a disorder. In 2002, Delroy L. Paulus and Kevin M. Williams at the University of British Columbia did a study on whether these three personalities were identical by comparing the three personality traits of the dark triad with three other psychological aspects. They found that the correlation patterns were very different and concluded that psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism were indeed distinct. So, what's the difference? Narcissists tend to have a large sense of self as they feel entitled and superior to those around them. Machiavellianism, on the other hand, tends to be more manipulative and selfish. And psycho- Yeah, the difference is that Christ-like people are actually superior to others. <laughs> They're superior to the natural man. Being righteous, truly righteous, not just clothing it on, being truly holy does make you superior to the natural man. That is justified pride. That is godly pride. Paths are more insensitive as they lack empathy for others and act without thinking. They are all associated with varying degrees of deception, questionable morals, and self-interest. But what they do have in common is disagreeableness. It's also thought that there is a relatively high genetic component to all three personality traits. Well, maybe pride wouldn't be the best word. Pleasure in accomplishment, I would say. <laughs> That's the source of, you know, them feeling like, yeah, I, I am better than someone who is not living the philosophy that I'm living. Just like that young man <clears throat> who decided to act in revenge, like they're acting, they're, like the Kanye and his little cabal is trying to act in revenge against everyone they hate. Trump, Alex Jones, whatever. You're not living the philosophy of Christ. And you are being played like a meat puppet to your own destruction, to your own detriment. And it will be proven over and over and over and over and over again until, until you know, this planet's done having babies. Interestingly, psychopathy and Machiavellianism are more closely related to each other than narcissism. Possibly because narcissism is the only one that can grow from a feeling of insecurity. What about sociopaths? It's easy to confuse psychopaths and sociopaths. So you might be wondering, why aren't sociopaths included in this list? Both are listed as antisocial personality disorders in severe forms, and both share a lack of moral judgment and lack of empathy. There are, however, a few things that distinguish the two. Psychopaths are likely to be pathological liars, and they rarely feel guilt since they do whatever they have to to benefit themselves. I met a lot They're of people like that fearless. in my life, and I grew to despise them and be repulsed by them. <laughs> I was magnetized to good things, to repulse bad things. And often good at mimicking behaviors to hide their psychopathic traits. Sociopaths, on the other hand, tend to have a conscience, even if it's weak. 
Although they are self-centered, they do care for others more than psychopaths. They're also less skilled at hiding their behavior and act in ways that make self-indulgence and lack of empathy more obvious. Although it's unclear as to why sociopaths are not included in the list, it could be due to how environmental factors are more influential to the cause of sociopathy than genetics. How does someone with one or more of these traits act? According to a 10-year review study, members of the dark triad have similar behaviors in a variety of social settings. In the workplace, for example, they're likely to fit the trope of an entitled boss or leader who is able to charm their way to the top, but not make genuine connections with the people around them. In education, cheating and plagiarism are predictable. This is more associated with psychopathy and Machiavellianism. Other than their displays of social entitlement, their behaviors differ more when it comes to interacting with others. Psychopaths tend to give negative first impressions as they want to appear to be intimidating. They also have an uncanny ability to mimic the behavior of those around them to blend in. People with Machiavellianism, along with psychopaths, tend to come off quite... But again, that's, <clears throat> that is a emphasized, uh, exponentially emphasized trait that all people have because, you know, monkey see, monkey do. That's how we learn from, you know, from a young child, you learn by observing others and copying, imitating them. But it's very, very pronounced. It's overly pronounced. It's hyper pronounced in, uh, in these aberrations, these psychic, you know, which just means of the mind, these, uh, these psyches, these aberrational psyches. It's cynical and morally suspicious. Narcissists, interestingly, have a skewed sense of self and tend to view themselves as far better leaders and far more empathetic than they actually come off as. Where do we go from here? As you've seen, recent research has made it possible to distinguish between the dark triad of personality. But what does it mean moving forward? Researchers have started to look into the function of the dark triad in the business world, how these personality traits relate government? to the ability to maximize profits. How about the alphabet soup agencies? How about education? How about entertainment? Hmm. How about, let's start with rap music. Start with Hollywood. Fuck. Look what they did to Kanye. Psychiatrists have also looked at how the dark triad are more vulnerable to addiction disorders. There are Which they encourage in their Hollywood people that they control. And then they have handlers for them. And then if they get too out of line, they put them in mental institutions or they have them killed. <laughs> because if you don't toe the line, because if you don't help us mass hypnotize and lie to people and get them to do what we want them to do, guess what? If you're not built on a firm foundation, if you sold your soul to us, we own you. You can still be saved, Kanye. <laughs> you could still come over. You know, you thought you were set. You can't set yourself up. You can't do that. You have to let Christ save you. you can't save yourself in that sense. Not, not, not your soul. You can't save your own soul. You want, you want the Holy Spirit back. You want to create the stuff, the great stuff that you used to create, and the stuff that you you can still create if you use the Holy Spirit rather than the evil, <laughs> the evil spirit, or surround yourself with evil to be led by evil. Surround yourself with genuine good, just like Officer Tatum said. Find a, a true leader, a true righteous leader, religious leader, to follow instead, who's not following himself, who's following Jesus, who's following the Lord. And understand, discern good from evil. What's the difference? How can I tell whether someone's like really following the Lord or just trying to set themselves up and look like a, you know, a fucking, you know, a, a virtue signal to look like they're, they're righteous and awesome and all that stuff? Are they actually righteous? Are they actually bold in the proclamation of truth? No matter what it costs them, no matter who turns away from it, if it's the right thing to do? Hmm. Who's doing it for their own power? Who's saying, you should lead yourself. <laughs> you should be free. You should make great things yourself. Not to be my slave and then I'll take a cut and you'll do what I say and blah, 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 all that stuff. Who's doing it for your benefit rather than their own benefit? Hmm. Who actually cares about you? Who's proven it? 
Who's, who's getting you addicted to drugs and going being your mule? Saying, I'll get you all the coke or whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> so that you're so hyped up and you get manic depressive. And when you're manic, you think you're on top of the world. And then you're, you're down off the coke or whatever the fuck you're on. You know, I don't know if Kanye is on something, but this is just Hollywood in general. Or, you know, a lot of people in the business world or government, you know, they get you addicted to something. They get you addicted to something. <laughs> then they use it against you. They use it to control you. So when someone comes along and says, don't be addicted to anything, don't be addicted to anyone, don't be dependent on anyone, don't let anyone say, I will rule your destiny and kneel to me. And you say, that's hard because it'll cost me if I follow that philosophy. It won't though. It won't. It will enrich you in the ways that matter so that no matter what they do to you, you're still built on the firmest foundation. And they aren't. That's why they... You know, they fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, and now they are the meat puppets of whoever it is. You know, follow the chain, but all the way up, it's Satan at the very top. You know, it's going to be a handler after a handler after another meat puppet who's got his arm shoved all the way up the other guy's or girl's ass, you know, and they're just meat puppets. Don't be a meat puppet. Don't be the natural man. <laughs> Be the righteous or woman, you know, don't, don't be the, the, the natural human, be the righteous, holy human following the philosophy of Christ. There are even studies that look into the relationship between the dark triad and affective disorders such as depression. We hope we were able to help you understand and distinguish the different personalities of the dark triad. If you're interested in learning. Yeah, that was good. So yeah, that's uh, that's important stuff for me to keep in mind as I'm writing characters in my book and, uh, you know, just for life in general, for, for detecting these people and understanding oh, even a lot of these, again, like to hide in religious circles as well, because anywhere that you can abuse power and man manipulate people, you will find dark triad and crimson triad personalities. But you don't have to be like them, and they don't have to be like them either. They just need the philosophy of Christ. That's the only one where, you know, no matter what th life throws at you, you will remain honorable, you will remain good as long as you stay on that path. As long as you diligently study the scriptures and actually apply the lessons to your own life. And rather than just saying, oh, that's hard, and I don't know if I'll benefit from that if I actually do it. Well, maybe give it a shot. <laughs> you, you understand what you could gain? Do you understand the, the do you under, do you understand what the world is promising you? And then do you understand what God is promising you? Well, I, again, we used to be good business people in, in this land. <laughs> when people take personality tests, the results are typically usually positive or at best. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, this is practical psychology 2.313 million subscribers the dark triad test explained and i think he made his own quiz on it i've been tested all out the ass so i'm not a i'm not a dark triad or a crimson triad or a psychopath or a sociopath i'm a christ path neutral there's nothing particularly disappointing about your myers-briggs score thinkers and perceivers for example are relatively neutral terms they just describe how you behave but not all traits are positive some traits are seen as negative and generally attributed to people who do negative things the dark triad looks at these negative traits psychologists have developed tests to determine whether or not these traits exist and potentially can help you spot dangerous people so what is the dark triad the dark triad is a relatively new concept in the world of psychology. The term was created in 2012 by a pair of psychologists named Paulus and Williams. In their research, these psychologists identified three personality traits that were most prominent in dangerous people who are more likely to commit crimes. Like most personality traits, the dark triad exists in all people to certain degrees. Everyone has some dark triad qualities. In fact, researchers show that some degrees of dark triad indicate a potentially good business leader or a bright person. But the people who are more dark than others are more likely to act in ways that hurt others. So what are these scary dark triad traits? They are narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. So let's talk about each one of those in depth. The first one is narcissism. Narcissism is an inflated sense of self. Narcissists usually believe that they are a superior person to others and they require people constantly to recognize them for their superiority. They don't just crave attention or work to earn praise. They expect this attention or praise, even if they don't actually accomplish much. As a result of these beliefs, narcissists will insist on having... This is why you're supposed to pray in your closet and stuff like that. Until your nation is 
pretty much on the brink of destruction and you're literally called as a watchman to say, don't do that. <laughs> Reverse course, <laughs> you know, uh, correct course and then stay the correct cor course. Yeah, that sort of thing. Th that's the part they don't tell you things that meet their standard. They may use dishonest means to actually get what they want, and narcissists will use their poor behavior because they believe they deserve the things that they want. The second one is psychopathy. Now, psychopathy is one of the most difficult traits to spot, but also one of the most dangerous traits to have. Psychopaths have little empathy or a conscience. They can commit heinous crimes against others without feeling any sense of remorse, feeling bad about anything that they've done. People have a really hard time pointing out a psychopath because generally they will also be excessively charming. For example, Ted Bundy is a classic psychopath. While people believe that he was really charming and kind on the outside, he never seemed to show remorse for brutally killing over 30 women in the 1970s. Researchers have been studying psychopaths for long- Just like the dude who was recently convicted for uh, driving his vehicle through, what was it, a Christmas parade, I think? Wakusha? Wakasha? I'm sorry. I'm not good with names. But he showed also no remorse for that. Uh, he was a true example of a psychopath. <clears throat> psychopath. Longer than they have been studying the Dark Triad. In fact, in the 1970s, Robert Hare developed the Hare Psychopathy Checklist to try to diagnose psychopathy. The checklist looks at a person's tendencies to be or not to be impulsive, empathetic, or delinquent. A score of 30 on the Hare Psychopathy you know Checklist one of his, denotes... You know what one of his uh, excuses was? is just self-justifications for his evil, which is what the world helped to, to reinforce in him. <laughs> it was God. Uh, God controls everything. So if I drove through the crowd of people, then it was ultimately in God's hands, and we shouldn't fret about that. You know, basically that sort of logic. When God already commanded you not to murder, do not murder. Do not steal. Do not steal people's lives. Do not steal people's virginities. Do not steal. Do not murder. And he said, if you break my law, I will punish you. I will kill you. He'll kill you spiritually. You will feel terror. You will be imprisoned. You will be killed physically. Eventually, you will die. He could let you live forever like Enoch or Elijah or... The three Nephites were John the, uh, the Beloved. But you will die now because you did not keep his law. <laughs> you will die in every single way possible and you will go to hell. You will not only be in prison for the rest of your life with like 600 years sentence, whatever the, the, the total, I think it's over a thousand years total that he got. But now he's going to be also in hell. <laughs> Which is you nowhere, no, not even the angels of punishment want to be in hell. And now he's going to be stuck there as one of the punished ones for at least a thousand years. At least. If, if Jesus came back tomorrow and then Armageddon only took like a very short amount of time, yeah, it would be like, <laughs> it would at least be a thousand years in hell. So, yeah, you enjoy that. That was a great bargain you made, dumbass a psychopath. Just to let you know, Ted Bundy scored a 39. And lastly is Machiavellianism. It's a pretty long word, but it comes from someone's name. Machiavelli was an Italian diplomat and author from the 1500s. He is most known for writing a book called The Prince. Now that's a book that offers advice on how- And then you blaming God for it after he explicitly told you not to do it and said what the punishment was and said, this life is a test. It'll be like a dream. Literally, it'll be like a dream to you. <laughs> and you'll wake up and say, holy f did, did I really do that? Oh my god, no, please forgive me. Remember, I voted with you. I We didn't unanimously vote to, to make Satan God instead of you. Come on, come on, come on, daddy, please. No, I never knew you. You never knew me. Bye. You can be expelled. You're expelled. Bye. Now, politicians should rise to the top by any means necessary. In the book, he says, a prince never lacks good reasons to break his promise. That gives you kind of an idea of what this trait is about. Even if a leader is not generally dishonest or a manipulative person, he says that they should use these tactics in order to get to power and a position that they desire. So people who score high on Machiavellianism scale haven't just taken that advice. They live by that advice every day. Now, if you know someone like this, it will be painful for you. These types of people are master manipulators. 
others and they know what to say and what to do to get their way. Now just like psychopaths, these people can be very charming on the outside, but only as a means to take advantage of others. Now also like narcissists, they think that they deserve the things that they want and they use that to justify their terrible actions. In Paulus and Williams' original article about the dark triad, they argue that when it comes to these traits, their only common big five correlate was disagreeableness. Later studies have also shown connections between the big five and the dark triad. For example, there is a significant positive correlation between Machiavellianism and eroticism, and also a significant negative correlation between Machiavellianism and conscientiousness. This means most people who are willing to lie, cheat, and steal to get their way are also not very OCD. This makes sense because most people with OCD like to follow rules. They like to stay orderly. They don't like to- And that's also how you enter flow state. If you can't follow the rules, then you cannot enter flow state. You'll cheat. You'll, you can use drugs. You can use nootropics. You can use whatever you want. You can try to get a, an adrenaline rush and a high by doing dangerous things or evil things, but it's never going to match the Holy Spirit's flow state. If the Holy Spirit is flowing through you to accomplish something that, that he has determined that you need to accomplish for the greater good, that's flow state. That's tr if, even if it's just training you to be in flow states so that you can be in it longer, accomplish things almost no matter what you set your mind to. As long as you're interested in it, as long as you study it, as long as you diligently practice it, you can enter flow state. Again, you can you can enter flow state with sex, you can enter flow state with playing any game you want, with your work. If it's mundane work, if you have to just mop a floor all day, they used, this is why they would teach during martial arts you to do mundane tasks. It wasn't only just like the physical movement in like some of the, the forms like, you know, karate, but it was also that it would help you learn to enter flow state by doing a repetitive task that needed to be done, but, but that also humbled you, you know, that taught you that, yeah, even the master will get down on his hands and knees and clean the floor of the dojo because it's sacred and it's important, the, the, place that, the places that we train and the training that we do. <laughs> yeah, so stray away from the normal path, which is what criminals do. Now, there is also a significant positive correlation between narcissism and extroversion. The more you care about yourself, the more you seem to want to talk to other people, which is actually a little interesting to me. There's also a significant negative correlation between psychopathy and conscientiousness. If you're thoughtful and orderly, you probably care about others too. Now, the same research conducted in 2011 at the University of Western Ontario suggests that the presence of these dark triad traits is largely genetic. This means that nature rather than nurture, is more likely to cause these traits. And notice that the good people they describe are just like good Christians and the bad people they're describing are Satanists, basically. You know, that that's just all, that's all, what it boils down to. So trauma or environmental factors can cause people to commit crimes and do bad things, but the tendency to commit crimes without remorse and to try to manipulate people is largely inherent. And if you have those traits, you can say that you probably got them from your parents. Now, if dark triad traits were truly genetic, this means further research can help us actually- And yeah, certainly thank God for my mom. <laughs> Uh, she was why I was uh, saved. To identify potentially dark and dangerous people before they actually start to act out and cause harm to others. Maybe we can even change them for the better. So it only takes a couple minutes to take the short dark triad test. And like most personality tests, this test comes with a few statements that you may agree or disagree with. And don't worry about how you score whenever you take the test, just try to stay honest. Now, if you want to take this test, I have actually developed a three-in-one personality test that will tell you all kinds of things about yourself. If you want to take that quiz, the link is in the description. I also recommend giving this test to your friends and sharing answers. Now, if any of your friends... So yeah, you can... Well, I'll let them finish. ...score over 60 on the results of the dark triad test, consider this a warning sign. The scores can indicate that your friends are manipulative, dishonest, or maybe don't have a high interest in your own well-being. In other words, they might not make such a great friend, and you might want to keep them at a longer distance. I also recommend not living with anyone above the 40 percentile, and do not marry anyone over 20, or your life will be painful. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and feel- Some people learned that, the Johnny Depp learned that the hard way, like... Sure, Johnny Depp might be, uh, like most actors, a narcissist to a certain degree, but oh boy, <laughs> if only he had had her take this test before they got married. But yeah, you can take this test if you want. Uh, again, I've taken like a million of these things. I'm not any of those. 
I am a, I'm literally like a Christ path. And that's what you become when you just follow, you just become a disciple of Christ, you know? And if you don't believe in it uh, religiously, then fine, but understand the philosophy and the wisdom in it and the strength in it, how it leads to the greatest works that I've ever, that I've ever, like, don't look at my work. My works haven't come yet <laughs> that, that, are, that, are, that are mostly in the public eye. Don't look at that. Look at all the other people who have followed and who have followed the the philosophy of Christ, even if they didn't believe in God. Uh, and also the how that how that's translated today in like the philosophy of Stoicism or even back then, because, you know, it, you know, it's a very ancient uh, philosophy, but it's popular. It's being popularized right now, apparently. As Angelos uh, told me, I thought it was I thought it was no one else talking about it. So, <laughs> you know, except for like a very few people, I didn't know it was like being pushed in the algorithm, supposedly. But anywho, that's news to me, uh, and I think that's a good thing. One of the the few, you know, just like everything can can have good effects. So I'm thankful. Good job, algorithm. You actually did something good. If people would actually understand and learn. But yeah, the, follow the philosophy of Christ. Follow, uh, you know, control. Learn to master your emotions so you can master your mind and your body. Master your spirit. Let your spirit master your mind and your body. That way, you can accomplish the greatest things for yourself, for society, for your loved ones, for your family, <laughs> for your future. Not destroying it. Not being led to self destruction. And that's just the truth. That's the plain, unadorned truth. Feel free to watch some of the other videos in this personality series. I've worked very hard on it. And if you want to learn more about your own personality... But yeah, you can you can take his test if you want. Uh, I'll link it. And, uh... What's next? We got one more. Well, well yeah, we, we, we got some more. <laughs> we got just a few more. So we're going to watch this thing. Very, very good interview that uh, the Critical Drinker did of... Matthew uh, Marsden, <laughs> Matt Marsden. Uh, I was thinking because there's there's a few different Marsdens in Hollywood. I didn't know if I was getting the wrong one, but yeah, let's uh, let's watch this real quick and then uh, move on. On the one hand, if you just tell an original story and it turns out to be kind of shit, it's like, well, fine, okay. I don't. And this this was posted <clears throat> this morning, but I really resonated with what they said because again. We're all marching to the same uh, tune of the Holy Spirit. Like uh, Matt Marsden and I clearly judge by a very similar square and compass, which is, uh, I would say he's a very, he has a very righteous judgment and good taste. And so does the drinker, which is why I like him. Don't care that much. You just did your thing and it wasn't very good, whatever. But like, if you're just, if you're given, say, access to like some beloved legacy character or an entire universe like with the, the say the lord of the rings it's like this is your playground now um and you're being turned loose in it and you completely fuck it up or uh, even worse if you're someone like ryan johnson who intentionally goes out to like you know ruin legacy characters like he was given luke skywalker to work with and turned him into a, an asshole and just yes. like a, a hermit who just wants to die um that's when people like myself are going to have a real problem because it's like you have taken other people's work that, that, that they created with like real passion and real, um, you know, artistic integrity and absolutely screwed it over. I can't imagine the effect that this had on George. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, it's bad enough uh, for us as fans. And like, you know, the young people looking for real heroes, real good inspiration to to help them through life, you know, but think of what it would think of how this probably hurt George so bad. He gave them the story treatments to continue the story and finish. They could have literally just said, fine, we're, we're a company that intends to exist forever and we have 100 year plans to go into the future. And we'll lie to you and say that, sure, we'll respect your story treatments. And then only use like the name Ray and like the the stupid shit and completely turn it into like, and then by Bob Iger who lured him into it, who manipulated him into that deal, is back in charge again. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Kennedy, who betrayed him, who stabbed him in the back over and over again, over and over and over again. She's still in charge of Star Wars. And think of how it must feel for him. Think of how it must, and the people are still going to see it. And he's like, did it, did what I did mean nothing? Did you learn nothing? And you think this is good? 
in comparison? <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe I was good. Maybe okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we didn't deserve the final, the real final trilogy. That would it would have turned out, you know, I, I don't think it would have been exactly as George wrote it down because, you know, he had a lot of guide rails that God put around him saying, okay, that was, that was pretty good, but let's do it this way instead. You know, it was a good, <laughs> and then he got a little more free, free reign for the prequels. Maybe he needed a little bit more guide rails, you know, give, may, may, have him come out with, with the story, the overarching story, like Tom Clancy used to do. He'd be like, this is generally the story, and then he would have a writing team and all that stuff, and then they would just, like, write the dialogue in the, you know, the actual book itself after he gave them the outline. George could do that perfectly, because no one had better outlines than George. No one had, like, I've got this great idea, and people are like, that sounds crazy. <laughs> that sounds crazy. Yeah, that's why you didn't come up with it, because you were chilled. Your mind was chilled from receiving that inspiration. You were like, oh, I shouldn't go there in my mind. Or my mind's, the goldfish of my imagination ain't big enough because I didn't give it a big enough tank. <laughs> George had a big enough tank. He had a big enough goldfish. You could have, you, <laughs> what did Disney do? They hooked that goldfish to use it as bait for the audience. And now it's dying. There's very, there's very little of that bait left. Some people still fall for it though. Hook, line, and sinker. It's for your well, it's own funny. Ego. You know, it's funny that I was... That's why others are coming out with much better entertainment, like Drinker himself. He's coming out with his better... He's coming out with his own stuff. That's what we need to do. Uh, you know, Ethan Van Skyver coming out with his own stuff. All the people in Common Skate coming out with their own stuff. Writers, like uh, uh, Shad, coming out with his own book. Like me, working on my own series, which is going to take some time. <laughs> to because i need to get this right so it's not just something i'm doing to profit myself or to make myself popular or to make myself to because i would love to have a conversation and once my series is done maybe i'll be on some of these shows to have some conversations with these fellas you know talk to shad about how yes i love matriculations too but also nunchucks are not meant to be a main weapon <laughs> they're meant to be a training tool <laughs> this is why uh but no, I have no voice except for the very few who listen or stick with it. But yeah, it takes patience to do great things is my point. You got to stick with it because you'll accomplish great things if you believe in yourself and keep doing everything that you should be doing a certain way every day. Just stick with it no matter what the world tries to bait you with. Like, oh, you should be doing this instead to do it because you know all these things you could be doing and you would be so great and successful and you'd be like one of those fucking dark tribes. Stop it. Stop it. Kanye, <laughs> fucking t use the dark path, the straight and narrow dark path, or uh, instead of the dark path, take the straight and narrow path. Just look at, you know, when you have tattoos, when people have even when it seems dark, if you know you're on the straight and narrow, your light will shine the greatest in that darkness. Tattoos done. Other tattoo artists will not go over and work on that other person's tattoo. Right, they won't do well, it. Unless they're not doing that. Fix it or because that's someone else's work. Or cover it. Now they'll they'll continue on on the rest of the arm, but they won't go over that work. And I, I and I, I like the idea of that because, you know, look, if you're doing Tolkien, of course, you know, Peter Jackson took liberties with that, but it was all within the vein of, you know, nobody complained about it. He, he did a lot of research. He he asked the right people the right questions. And I think that it's not too... Yeah, he had literal scholars. He had Tolkien scholars uh, helping him as his guide rails. Like Lucas, Adam, his wife, was one of his guide rails to help him get Star Wars done properly the way that God intended it to be. And then Lucas, over time, when he didn't have those guardrails anymore, he was like, oh, well, maybe I should do this and that. And there's a little... No, just leave it how it was. <laughs> it was... It was already published the way it was meant to be published. That's why everyone loved it. That's why they loved it, George. You didn't have to fix it anymore. You could have moved on to the next thing. And then you would have included all the, the stuff that you wanted to shove in there. You could have you could have done other projects. You could have done other stories. You could have done another Han Solo project if you wanted to tell the story of Jabba and all that stuff. Instead of shoving Jabba in the way you did, you would have made more money that way. But no, you sold out. You gave up. You sold out. That's and then that was the story that that Star Wars started teaching is that you could give up and still win. You could still walk away with the profit, the billions. Just walk away. No, don't don't kneel. Don't give up. 
just keep going. Just keep going and believing in whatever it is, your music, your, uh, your movies, your dreams, whatever it is, just do it. Just believe in it. And if you fail, fail gloriously, but do it anyway. So much to ask. Don't let anyone stop you. To just stay in that, in that world, right? And respect the fans. For example, during Black Hawk Down, one of the things that I get all the time from the military, and you kind of said it as well, was when people say, uh, the attention to detail matters. Like, you know, having your, your um, I say costume, because that's what it is. Isn't it? Part of the thing we need to understand is Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote the Gulag Archipelago in a gulag. <laughs> In a gulag, there's no excuse for anyone to not be able to create something great, like a masterpiece in almost like if you're in prison, you really can. If you just have mental discipline, you could create a whole world inside your head. You know, you if you grow up in an abusive environment, you can create an entire world inside your head. And maybe that's a story that, that God says to you, to your heart. The world needs to hear that story. You know, or music, you know, you get lost in music and you, you write music in your head, you write lyrics. Maybe God's saying the world needs to hear that. It needs to inspire them, but it needs to edify them. It doesn't need to inspire them to evil. It should inspire them to good. Ultimately, that's the moral. We used to have this thing called morals to our stories, morals to our music, morals. We used to have a moral society. Now it's like, oh, morals. Uh, yeah, objective morals. No, it's all cultural. No, some cultures were fucking evil and sacrificed their babies and threw them off cliffs if they weren't perfect enough. There is a, such a thing as objective good and objective evil. It's just self-flattering to say, oh, there's not. It's just based on your point of view. No, that's you being a meat puppet, a weak, useful idiot actor but you know having your your uniform correct you know holding the rifle in the right way moving in the correct way all those things are little things that will piss off you know people because you're playing a real person in that in that world right but those characters for tolkien or you know the marvel characters or or in, in star wars we grew up with them like we're so familiar with them that when they start doing something other than what you know them to be it's very jarring and it's you start like going back and dismantling the other films as well in your mind and mm -hmm. that's a really that's a really sad thing um and I, like i said i don't think that it is a um it's a negative thing so look like i said i i love the fact that you can write strong female roles we all love those i, I love silence of the lambs that you know i think great great character it's not saying that you can't write these these roles but like in the last so minutes, for example i'm like this sarah connor like sucks you they, know yeah I mean? they and, went off the rails yeah he's talking about the old the new sarah connor the way that they changed her for the woke generation that. <laughs> that was but, but you, know, you know what i'm saying and you sit there yeah. and all you do is it's it's almost like ruined that memory of it as opposed to um, you know, Rocky, who even through the Creed, still Rocky, still the character, like it doesn't really, I mean, maybe the last one was different, but, but he still maintained that character. So it wasn't like a big jump. He became someone else. I mean, the, the last one was, was, you know, slightly different, but, um, but, you know, just, and there's also this kind of, um, pride that you know at that moment when the screenwriter came and he was like i know that this was an established character i know that people love these but fuck them all i'm god yeah I'm write something new because i'm so smart exactly and you know it you know he's it, got yeah. yeah he's got it pinned down right there this guy again <laughs> similar square and compass he has it pegged that's what they're thinking they're like oh, oh yeah i don't care I don't care about this. I'm going to change. Oh, I think we lost you there for a second. <laughs> he's in, he's literally in Hollywood right now. They're, oh, he's talking too much truth. <laughs> uh, I don't know if Matt's internet connections timed out for a moment. Um, 
I'll see if he comes back. <laughs> Just uh, while I'm waiting for, for Matt's connection to come back in. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry, I lost you there for a moment. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Um, right. What was I saying there? Ranting about something. Someone said, um, like, the overlords have struck him down. <laughs> like, you were, <laughs> you were spitting too much truth. Yeah, no, I mean, but look, at all of this comes from, number one, loving the arts, right? Like, loving the medium, loving what we do. Um, and, and secondly, you know, you want movies to be a success because you want more of them. Right, you want it to go on because ultimately, if the movies aren't a success, I mean, which might be a good thing in the long run, as you said, what happens is the companies fail, and then when the companies fail, then they can't make movies anymore, um, which might be a good thing in some instances. Mm. At this point, anyway, or at least like make them like change their um, their trajectory, but it it all comes from of loving it you know and, and wanting to do good work like i said i love strong female characters i've, I've played opposite you know certainly one of them uh one very i know, I know you're not a fan of those films but uh i but, wanted uh, to ask you about this a little bit actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i you know i mean like i said i just wanted to be written very well and and you know so i'm not like oh my gosh like why are you trying to say this like it's okay to be vulnerable, but it's okay to be strong as well. It's okay to say that that person can be like, like Mulan is a classic example, right? I know you, you talked about Mulan in one of your videos, but that, that is a, you know, a classic example of why become like this super overpowered person instead of over. Yes. And this is, this is what I was saying with about spiritual battles, always being more interesting than purely physical ones, because Rocky wasn't just, it wasn't just about the, it was about the spiritual battle. Okay. Let's take Blade Runner for instance. Okay. This is an era where they could do space travel and have world ending events and all that stuff. But what is the story really about? It's about the soul of, it's about the human soul. It's about, does artificial intelligence have a soul? It's about, are we cyborgs just serving the government? It's about a very deeply personal story that's only about a very few people. It's about their souls. And it's a very, it's one of the greatest stories that Western culture has ever produced. Uh, and cinematically, it's one of the greatest stories that cinema has ever produced. But it doesn't need universe ending stakes. It's about the soul of the matter involved. It's about the souls of the people involved becoming something like i'd much rather see someone that can over is rocky going to be defeated by the world and give up like jake skywalker and obi-wan can blow me no he's going to say fuck you no matter what no matter if you're a jacked up steroided out of your fucking mind russian i'm still going to compete and i'm still going to do my very best to win and if i fail i'm going to fail gloriously but honorably that's the lesson that Rocky taught and why he resonated with so many and so many love him because he was he was a hero you know well in in the sense he was you know not really doing doing much other than for himself <laughs> he wasn't really doing that much for other people but yeah he was a good example of just not giving up he was an inspiring example in an edifying way so I consider it good entertainment not flattering thing and just come in like uh, you know, like a, a, a some kind of a elite warrior from the very beginning, because there's nowhere to go, and that's yeah. that's really sad. I mean, it's crap filmmaking. Oh, like Ray, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> making as well, actually. Yeah, it, it's just it's it's lazy, and it it kind of like gives you a really crap message to your audience as well. You know, it's like um, well, the Mulan was a good example of. You know, instead of teaching them like, look, you can you can overcome adversity through hard work, determination, perseverance. Like, life's going to throw you a lot of curveballs and like hit you with some really hard knocks. But it's your ability to get up and, and keep yourself going that uh, that really makes the difference. Uh, to the new one where it's just like teaching people, you're just amazing the way you are, and the rest of the world just needs to learn to deal with that. And I think, yeah. God, what a terrible lesson to teach young people. One of the first lines, and this is this is when the culture shift really happened that I noticed is the Legend of Korra, and it happened with started with the children's 
entertainment. Uh, Legend of Korra, one of the first lines she says is, I'm the Avatar, you gotta deal with it. <laughs> and it was cute, and it was one of the, the first season was great, but then it started getting worse. Every single season, it just became more about indoctrination. You can give up and still win. You can be all powerful from the beginning. You could just be super awesome. And you, you'll, you know, the guy who's perfect for you, you'll walk away from him. You'll give up and still win. All the, it was just the worst, the worst. It was psychological warfare. I'm telling you, it was cultural warfare that infiltrated Nickelodeon. It was nothing like the Avatar. It was using the shell of Avatar the Last Bear, Airbender to sell shit to your soul, to poison your to poison the souls of the audience. You know, if they internalized the stuff and didn't learn the good lessons from, you know, like not how to do, <laughs> like, yeah, that's not how you do good entertainment. You know, first season was pretty good, you know, and then it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Like a lot of, a lot of shows do. It's like, oh, we'll hook you with something decent. And then it's not as good as maybe what it's, you know, leaning on the crutch that it's using to get through the door in the first place. But we'll just, you know. We'll just make it worse every season just so we can slip our own ideas in there and you can say I love it because it's this because it's this IP that I loved growing up therefore I'll still love it because I'm loyal even if it doesn't deserve your loyalty even if it hates you even if it's mind fucking you into being weak and less than you could be in every way every way in intellectually spiritually every single way oh. Like they're gonna take that, go out into the world, and just get their asses kicked. You know. It, well, the it, problem it, is, the problem is, is the people that wrote it were told that. And guess yeah. what? They got they got a job at the company without really having to work their ass off or anything like that. I'm not I'm not saying in particular that that person, but and Sly is one of the best in the business because he he was he was a true like American businessman. He was like, I want to succeed in this business, therefore I'm going to control my own destiny in this business. I'm going to set up my own production company. I'm going to control my own movies. I'm going to write my own movies. I'm going to do my own plots. I'm going to do my own... I'm going to do it my way. I love Sly for that. I love Sylvester Stallone for that. Like, whatever his political opinions... I don't even know what his political opinions are. I don't care. You know, for, with, with my actors, I don't care what the fuck their political opinions are. That's like Mockingbird Media type of stuff. So... That's the, uh, that's the thing. if he, you know, <laughs> if I resonate with him there too, I would love him more object. That's just how it is. And if he was like super leftist totalitarian, I'm going to control every aspect of your life. I would, uh, I would treat him like King George, you know, but, uh, that's that. Someone making those decisions, you know, it might even be the executive that says, I want it like this. And the writer goes off and does it. But at the end of the day, it's because those are the people that are out there and they know inside that they didn't work for it. So in other words, it's not about a cult of personality, <laughs> you know, it's not just because and or uh, cult of personality applies to IPs as well. It's nostalgia. It's fan loyalty. It's no matter what, I'm going to be loyal to either this person or this thing. That's a philosophy of evil. You have to judge it by its works. Or is it worthy of being so loyal to the Democrat Party? Not really. How about the Clintons? No, not really. The Bidens? No, not really. <laughs> what evidence have they given you to be loyal to them? They're f mind fucking you. They're bribing you. They're flattering you. They're lying to you. They're deceiving you through entertainment, through politics, through their promises that they won't keep. <laughs> it's just a trap. That's bait. Don't take it. And that's that's part of my theory on why actors sometimes are so extreme with their politics is because really they're like I didn't really I'm not, I don't really deserve to be here. I'm making shit tons of money and I'm flying all over the world and I feel really bad about it. Yeah. So I'll just say a lot of stuff, you know. Oh, by the way, it's I'm virtue just signaling to, Bora, to assuage their own guilt and shame. But you know what? Climate change. Yeah. yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> Worked for that's when they're not actually given the lines like you must you must champion this thing you know or the message or you'll be canceled you know or put in a position would you take migrants into your own home oh sure i would okay <laughs> well when have you ever done it oh okay you're just virtue signaling oh, okay every fucking thing that i've earned every yeah. single thing I, 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 every single thing i work for I've earned every dime. I come from nothing, single parent, you know, working class council estate. I have no shame. 
See, God bless so this true man. People, I'm like, listen, I bought a truck. I bought a truck because I wanted a truck, you know, and you're not going to shame me into not driving my fucking truck, right? Because I love my truck and I always wanted one. Yeah, because you know it's not because it, it's not like this size and it's not powered by like electricity. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. I've also lived in California and I've also been there when they've said, "Please don't keep your air conditioning on." This is why they're so one of the reasons they're so popular. <clears throat> not because there's not just because they're so talented, but there's some of the, the few true men left, like Sly. You know, the reason that the action hero or the action movie phase was so big was because of the masculine, righteous hero examples that He-Man, the Masters of the Universe, Dolph Lundgren, you know, and, uh, you know, the fucking pick your Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, pick your Sylvester Stallone movie. You know, these were great, you know, pick your Bruce Willis movie. <laughs> these were great heroic masculine examples of you got to be a good man no matter what no matter how, how hard it is you don't give up no matter what's against you you don't give up you do the right thing you save the maiden you save your family you save your values you save your nation get the fuck off my plane you do whatever you need to do you don't kneel that was great storytelling we need that back. We need our heroes back. Not not the Marvel area uh, era where it's like we'll give you fake superheroes that teach terrible values that you internalize and think, oh well, you know, this is heroic because uh, someone who calls themselves or that Disney says is a hero is doing it, so I, I should mirror it. Monkey see, monkey do. You gotta actually understand what's good, what's bad. Not not what's popular. <laughs> Oh, now it looks good. Now it sounds good. Oh, it has a Mars. You got really got to use the right square and compass. Um, because the power grid can't take it. Or you'll be steered into the rocks or into the, you know, even if you're the fucking Titanic, you'll be steered into the, uh, the iceberg and get fuck your, all of your vessel. <laughs> so I'm like, you can go and have your trucks if you want, but you, you know, your electric vehicles if you want, but you're not going to be able to power them. Parent, it's dude, dude, it's all hypocrisy. I hate hypocrites. And that's one of the reasons why I started to open my gob on Twitter because I'm like, I know what you guys are like on set. Don't give me this bullshit. Like, yeah. just just don't do it. It's 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 patronizing. Everyone sees it, and I don't want to be associated with that. That was a great movie, by the way. Uh the one behind him, Black Hawk Down. My dad was involved in that operation. <laughs> because that's not what I am. That's not who I am. I didn't I didn't, on you know, the intelligence I, the side. things that I believe in, I'm very proud of. Uh, and I came to a conclusion on them through going through a process in my life of learning and failing. I mean, it was a fucking disaster. So, uh, <laughs> uh speaks for itself. And trying to figure out shit, right? That's, that's life. And I, I might be wrong with some of those things. And if I am, I'll go, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. But, you know, I, I, I certainly, I'm, my main thing is, dude, is not pontificating about things that I don't know anything about, right? Like, I'll, I'll fairly say, hey, listen, I can talk about film industry. I know it. I can talk about freedom because I like having it. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, it's yes. like, and, and other things um, because that affected my life. And, and if it affects my life, I have a right to speak about it. And, I've, you know, I've, you have a right to speak no matter what. This is another thing you need to understand. It's not just if it affects your life. You have a right to speak in this nation, no matter where you come from, Sir Matt Marsden. You have a right to speak no matter what. No matter what. No matter if it's not popular, fine. Fine, speak it anyway. People fight and die to preserve your right to speak whatever the fuck you want. Use it. I feel like you know, I, I watch some things like Ruffalo. I'm like, shut your mouth. Oh, man, that will man. You? Like, shut, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Like, everything he comes out. See, just like you're using it right now. And I applaud you for that. I honor you for that. With these just, and, and by the way, listen. I only believe it was my, like, I. He, like, this man is risking his entire career in Hollywood to speak the truth. That is glorious and honorable. Even if his entire career comes crashing and burning down, this man is worthy of, of glory and honor and being caught by his fans, you know, because if, if he does get canceled, that's exactly what he'll need. I am a meat puppet. I say other people's words for a living and I pretend, right? 
I don't think that I'm some kind of great political sage that should be listened to. I don't. Exactly. Um, but when you get to a point where everybody else is saying shit, it's like and there's no other side, it should be. there's no one else coming back and going, hang on a second, don't, you know, because I'm in this industry, I'm sick to death of people going, oh, oh, Hollywood. I'm like, hang on a minute, hang on. We're not all the same. We're not this like, you know, big generic yeah. block. Yeah, and that goes back to me saying there's good and bad in everything. There's good and bad in Hollywood. <laughs> there's good and bad in the government. There's good and bad in the alphabet soup agencies. There's good and bad everywhere. There's good and bad everywhere. But the people who are evil will say there's bad. The whole thing is bad. And what I'm saying is the people, all the people who work, like the Federal Reserve, it itself is bad. It itself is evil. Is everyone who works at the Federal Reserve or who supports it or falls for its lies, uh, are they all evil? No, there are good people there too. There are good people in the FBI. There are good people in the CIA. There are good people in the DIA. There are good people in the NRO. There are good people in the, all the alphabet soup agencies. There's good people in the federal marshals and the, the sheriffs and the police and all of them. There were good Nazis who were stuck like, if I don't become a Nazi, I literally can't do anything in society. That's why Patton let people who used to be affiliated with the Nazis continue on like, you know, okay, you're a power plant operator or whatever. Okay, well, and you couldn't have been like a scientist or anything like that if you didn't say you were part of the Nazi party. That's why he was like, all right, fine, uh, I will interview you. And if I think that you're evil, <laughs> then uh, I'll discern whether or not I'll keep you in charge. So he did. He did that. And he walked people through the concentration camps that the Jews were in and said, now look what you did, like a dog. Now look what you did, natural man. Now look what you did, you stupid little fucking meat puppet. Look what you did. And he rubbed their noses in it. And some of them went home and killed themselves. And that's how it should be. Fuck of people. So that's why I started opening my mouth. I, I really didn't want to. You know, I'd rather have just shut up and got on with my job. You yeah, know, amen, brother. It, for, look, for the most part, I think it ruins... I would rather just be with my head down writing my book. I would go so much faster in completing my book if I wasn't trying to do this at the same time. But no, <laughs> the, I've, the world needs more people, even if it's just someone screaming to the darkness to themselves... The world needs more people actually speaking up and planting stakes for truth. No matter how spicy and no matter how much they have to pound it. And no matter how much shit they have to pound it through. Ruins people's enjoyment of watching With storms overhead, like, getting struck oh by lightning. Oh, no. Rob Reiner, shut up. Mm. Right? Like, you know, you just keep, you, you say. There's value in that, though. There's value in Rob Reiner and all those others identifying themselves. That's, that's part of the reason God says we're here. It's sorting the wheat from the chaff. Who are the wheat? Who are the chaff? Ruffalo? <laughs> Reiner? His work was good back when he used to not do all this shit. Like he was a full, fully manipulated meat puppet for evil. Back when he would use, you know, make the princess bride and you know follow the the actual plot of good, you know, that was a good story. You know what? You know why it was a good movie from Rob Reiner? <laughs> when a lot of his stuff is shit, frankly, the reason Princess Bride was so good is because he was following a good script. He was following something almost as good as like something Tolkien or 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 like something from Narnia almost. It was really good. It was good because the morals were good because it inspired, it edified the audience. Things about people. I've had this, I've been in the room and, and by the way, look, the majority of actors, when you start coming up, you're, you're on the left, at least like a little bit on the left from, from center, you know, and then, you know, you start having to pay tax and you start moving towards the right, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you start, you know, reading about the world and you have kids and, and things change you, you know? Yeah, you also start understanding, <clears throat> even if you fall for the whole social security, welfare, all that stuff, you come to understand how much it cripples people if they're living in welfare. You know, like I, I am a disabled veteran. I get money from the government because I actually did sign a contract with them. They actually are paying for ruining my health. <laughs> 
you know, I'm through hazing, through vicious hazing, because I would say stuff like this. Because if I saw something wrong, I would say it and I wouldn't kneel. <laughs> I would not kneel no matter what. And they would haze me viciously because I would not conform to any form of evil that I saw until I started. Well, fine. All right, fine. I'll just get blackout drunk with you. I'll go to Nashville. I'll get blackout drunk with you and I'll be un completely unhappy, but at least you will stop torturing me. <clears throat> don't conform to the world don't do it it's not going to make you happy it's going to hurt you it's going to destroy you it's going to make you more easily easy to manipulate did it sound go away oh really indoctrinate or change you you know and and that's just a natural process in life or you or you or you don't and you just become kind of really indoctrinated but i'm you know i never saw myself as someone that would come out and speak about these things and but i think that certainly again talking about the the message in movies it's because it's just ruining it for i i, I wouldn't want any other i just want to experience I want to go to a film and I want to be entertained and I don't want something shoehorned in there. If something isn't like you said about Top Gun, like having a diverse cast absolutely worked in that situation. There was no, there's not one moment where I was like, yeah, exactly. Hang on a second. Just Loved can't be forced. Characters. It can't be um, cynical corporate, it was a, it was, you know, people doing corporate uh, filmmaking, you know, making cynical, oh, we'll do this because it'll, it'll look good with the audiences. No, it's, does it, is it best for the story? <laughs> is it best for the story to have a black elf in uh, Tolkien works? Hmm. Or is it you pandering? That's the word I've was looking for the other day is it you pandering cynically to the audience like a corrupt soulless fuck that you are when if you wanted black people in the story again you could have just shown the actual black people that tolkien wrote he wrote an entire continent full of them you stupid fucks you could have had a story based in that continent and explored that entire fucking continent but they're creatively bankrupt they're getting their inspiration like a little tiny trickle because <laughs> they're not that high. They're, they're mostly just useful idiots, but they're not getting their inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Therefore, their work is shit. Great. But when you start coming in and fucking with the system, like, you know, the, j just uh, storytelling because, oh, I've got to get this in here. And you know what? It sticks out to, a, I mean, you know, it especially because you're a screenwriter. You're mm -hmm. like, how the hell would I get that in? to my screenplay without messing it up completely, right? Like, it, 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 you can't do that. You have to compromise something unless it's about that particular topic. You know what I mean? If, you, yeah. if you're writing something like Milk, then okay, it's going to be about that. That's fine. Just go. Well, do yeah, it. like that's that's the point of the movie. But it's like, uh, yeah, if you're watching something like Star Wars, it's escapism. You know, it's like, I don't yeah. want like current day political events, like really awkwardly shoehorned into this movie. And I don't want to be told like I'm a horrible person just because of like how I was born or where I was born or something like that. It's, it's such yes. shit things to tell your audience, you know, um, yeah, but it's, it keeps it's just, like, Well, it's horrible things to tell other human beings and, and we don't want that for anybody. And, it and they wonder how maybe society might be producing psychopathic, sociopathic, easily manipulated by whoever they are, you know, bad actors in general, evil. Uh, I wonder how their society is producing so many of these when they're uh, glorifying the, the worst examples of evil uh, and uh, belittling good and tearing it down and replacing it with that evil. I wonder what happens more and more in society. More and e more evil happens. It's more, it's more, you know, people, more people just let it happen without saying anything <laughs> because it's culturally acceptable. You've made it acceptable in 90% of their entertainment, 90% of their mockingbird media, 90%. This is just so much. It's like, it, it is, it's conditioning. But you got to break out of that conditioning. Instead of being woke, you really do have to be awake. And then you can produce the best stuff because then you'll, you'll gravitate to the best stuff. You'll use the square and compass to understand 
okay, that's good. I'll measure it, what I'm consuming against the square and compass of, is it truly good? Is it actually true? And then, <laughs> based on that, your subconscious and your link to the Holy Spirit inspiring you to give you the best tools for creation that have ever existed, that produce everything else around you, the planet you fucking live on. Look, these are the tools of creation. Would you like to create something? Do you want Satan's knockoffs? Do you, would you like Satan's knockoffs of the tools that I made? Or would you like the actual tools? Choose. <laughs> And it might take a lot longer to make the masterpiece that I have planned for you than what the world would try to inspire you with. But which one would you rather have? Choose. Wheat from chaff. You defend it from your side, then you're called all kinds of names, right? Yeah. But, but that's not what it's about. Like, like I said, you can have those movies. I think it was, uh, um, I can't remember what the guy's name is now, uh, uh, Tyler Fisher, I think his name is, this whole thing about like why this latest, you know, message movie failed. And he said, oh, because all these other movies have failed before, when actually they haven't, they've, he was doing it as a joke, right? Like they've always, they've been a massive successes in the past because it was a more organic thing. And now people are coming to this going, I'm just sick of you shoveling this at me. Like, if you do a movie here, like, you can't come out and say, if you don't come watch this movie, you're racist. Or if you exactly. don't like, you know, Wakanda forever. And they're just using it to manip manipulate you. They know it's not good enough to stand on its own, to stand against everything else. Especially in the environment that they themselves encouraged, which is stay at home, stay at home, be fearful, stay at home, just, just conform, just bow down, just kneel. Instead of be bold, go out, explore. <laughs> the you reap what you sow. And th they can't stand on their own anymore. They're not inspired with good enough stories. So now they have to browbeat people into consuming their content. And then while they consume their content, it's a struggle session in disguise to manipulate you. Then it's because it's got black people in it. That's absurd. I mean, that's just... You can tell the big difference between something like, like Andor that's trying to teach you good principles and something like, <laughs> take your fucking pick of almost everything else that Disney produces. Take a look at Can Blow Me. Take a look at Booby Feet. It's a ridiculous thing to say. A broken clock is still right twice a day. Say. Well, this, this is the... Well, depending on what kind of clock. Sometimes it's only once a day. Disney! the market in tactic now because when they they had the woman king that came out like a month or two ago viola davis literally was getting interviewed saying like well if you don't see this then you're you're just um prejudiced against black leading ladies and it's like what a terrible thing to say to your audience like you literally have to come and see my film because i've told you so because i'm gonna brand you like a, a racist or whatever if you don't um that, that's not how you get people to see a film. You should be like, yeah, come and see it because it's really good and we're really proud of what we've done here. Um, and, you know, I think it stands on its own merits. Like, you can't berate people into watching your movie. That's awful. What? What tools do they have? Oh, I have subversion. I have... Uh, it's not... Oh, I'm going to subvert. Oh, the, the audience thinks that the character is going to die or do something evil. And then they, they triumph either physically or spiritually by choosing not to do evil or by avoiding death. By defeating the, the, what seems to be undefeatable, what they should kneel to, what they should, by all accounts, give up to. And they don't. <laughs> that was good. That was edifying. But the, but the weak, the weak people got elected to take over, <laughs> to be stewards of this great and important work. <laughs> that the soul of the nation depended on. What did they do? They devoured their own sheep. Kanye, wake up. Please, everyone, all of Hollywood... You have the power. You don't understand. You don't understand how painful it is to know the answers and have no power, no audience. I can't do, if I had the resources, what I could do. And you say, oh, it's narcissism. 
Mm. Well, we'll see. We'll see when I actually have the resources, if it's narcissism. <laughs> and, and no, I've never been diagnosed as narcissistic. Again, I've taken all these tests. I'm hyper empathetic, but I'm also, I've been taught to be a stoic because if I didn't hide my emotions or control them, my father would literally threaten to murder me and beat me and beat me and beat me and beat me and choke me and tear. Like, I, I am this way because I, I, this is just the environment that I was placed in. On the other hand, on the other hand, the solace that I got was from my hyper empathetic mother and her Christian, her true, not feigned Christian faith. And that's the thing. Women I have found are much more capable of faith than today's men. You know, it's not because the amount of faith that they place in the wrong men, the wrong people, the wrong things. But men, <laughs> men are often just manipulated easily and then they manipulate women. But women and children, they use faith, but sometimes in the wrong things. So yeah, uh, when talking about narcissism, it's also important, like I say over and over again, that the gospel teaches over and over again, you are less than a worm. You have to understand this. You're less than a worm. You're nothing. You're nothing. You're nothing, kid. You're nothing. You're nothing compared to Jesus. You're nothing compared to Enoch. You're nothing compared to Elijah, Adam, Noah, Ev Abraham, everyone that you could fucking name <laughs> who came before us, basically. It's like we're producing worse and worse versions over time. We're not getting better. We're not producing better stuff. We're copying. We're copying it worse. We're doing it worse and worse and worse and worse. And God's saying, I've given you all these lessons throughout all this time that did you do the exact same thing. And I warned you specifically what was going to happen in your day. I said, this is going to happen. This, 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 and this. And look, this, 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 and this is happening. <laughs> and you still fucking don't listen to me. Uh, him, you know what I'm saying? You still don't listen. So yeah, it's important to understand that you're less than a worm, but it's also important to understand that you're a king uh, and a priest of Israel if you choose to be, if you answer the call, the election of, of the Lord himself saying, come, follow me, call, follow my example, be a disciple of, to me, and I will make you a king like me. You will sit down with me in my father's throne like I have. You will rule in heaven like I do if you follow me, my path. The one that I laid out from the beginning, from the, from before all was formed, before he knit everyone together in the womb, before he formed the world, he said, this is it. Uh, I'll teach you from beginning to end. I'll teach you every lesson that your spirit needs to know that you can't learn as a spirit because it's too, your, your spirit's too unchangeable. You have to be in a mortal form to be very changeable, to be modal, moldable. It takes a great, great effort to change just the disembodied spirit. It's like pure emotion. It's like unlimited, you know, it's like, you know, imagine what you were like as a baby. Imagine what you were like as a child. You needed time to learn how to control your spirit in the mortal form so that when you die, you can eternally take those lessons and what you were molded into with you to the afterlife, which is eternity, which is not lesser than this life. This life is just a dream compared to real life, real life. This is just the matrix. This is just the temporary matrix that we're in to test us. Will you choose? Agent Smith, <laughs> will you choose them? Will you choose the Matrix? Will you choose, oh, I could eat this steak and it'll be so great. All I had to do is go along and I'll have this steak and they'll put me back in the Matrix and I'll be rich and powerful. Or are you going to be truly awake and you take the red pill? He's been, nothing's new and we're not better. We're worse. No one's, no one. <laughs> If you put all of humanity together right now, they would not equal Adam. They would not equal the greatness of Adam. They would not equal the strength of Adam. If at the height of Adam's holiness, uh, when the Lord taught, if Adam had said, world be destroyed and meant it, it would have been. No one equals Adam. We all came from Adam. <laughs>
because you have all power through God. And he walked with God. He was with, he was the son of God, just like Jesus. We're all sons and daughters of God. We're all princes and princesses, and we need to act like it. You need to stop letting the world convince you that Prince Charming and Princess Charming and all that and true good does not exist and that it's all virtue signaling because it's not. And it's a trap to lure you. <laughs> and this is why it's so important to understand where you came from. Where, you, where do you come from? So instead of narcissism, you, you being built up in your own hubris, it's important to understand where you come from. And again, I strip myself naked and make myself vulnerable to, to try to help people understand things that I wish I understood when I was younger. And I messed up the other day when I said that my, my family name was descended from, from the Apostle Thomas. I, I meant Matthias. Sometimes when I'm in the flow, I mess things up. I get caught on a, on a branch here and there. So yeah, my last name is this, Tice. The is put together. But yeah, it comes from the Apostle Matthias. I don't know if we're, we're physically descended from Matthias, but in either case, we're thought descendants of, of Matthias. We're spiritual descendants of Matthias. And when you, when you get right down to it, we all go back to Adam, you know? We're all brothers and sisters when you really get down to it. So... Uh, hold on, let me take a drink here. This might help with the... <clears throat> I know it's not going to be super easy to see with the, the... The way that the pixels are. So... Anyway, Tice is our family name. This is our coat of arms. Uh, I'd like a bigger version. Well, they want me to buy it, but I'm not going to buy it. <laughs> They're accurate, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to buy my own crest. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is the uh, the ancient arms of the Tice family. I'll start there. So, if you'll notice, we have the Star of David in our crest for a reason and a crown. We also have a sword and a fully armored knight uh, for a reason. <laughs> We also have red and silver and gold for a reason. Uh, so yeah, um, this is where I come from. This is where I, who I've always been. This is what I was trained to be. Um, and that's the truth. I guess we'll go through, I guess, some of the stuff that they have here. This is why family history has been taught in the Mormon church for so long. And it's not about, oh, you're descended from this king and that king and blah, 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 you know, to, to make yourself big headed. It's to study their lives because they probably have lessons. They might have written diaries and then written a whole bunch of lessons in their lives to learn from, you know, that sort of thing. It was to learn from the wisdom of your ancestors and to learn from your family, your friends, your, your, you know, your teachers, your, 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 your helpers, your servants, that sort of thing. Cause they love you. That's what we're supposed to do. Love one another, love one another as I love you. That's being Christ-like. It's being a Christian. So yeah, the name Tice derives from the German personal name Matthias, which in turn derives from the Apostle Matthias, English Matthew. Versions of this name were very popular in the Middle Ages throughout Christian Europe. Early Origins of the Tice Family The surname Tice was first found in Germany, where the name can be found from humble beginnings, but gained a significant reputation for its contribution to the emerging medieval society. And it's very fascinating. <laughs> the, well, I'm not going to get into that, because it's not about... Uh, it, the point is, again, to learn lessons. There are bad things that you should avoid, and there are things that you should uh, embrace. You know, this is where you come from, and these are good values that you should preserve. And you should not belittle your, your great ancestors who came before you by either giving up or bending the knee. You will choose the right no matter what. You will wield the sword of righteousness, which is the word of God. It is the, the, the sword of the spirit, which is the, the thought realm, the ideas that matter, the crown of righteousness, of salvation. Through what? <laughs> Through what? Through what? Through what route? What, th what three stars guide us? What, th what trinity is guiding us? What trinity is guiding us? I wonder. <laughs> Through the trinity of God, the root of which is David, 
the root of Jesus is David, the root of Christianity is, is Judaism. My family has never hated the Jews. My family is descended from the Jews. Not just spiritually, but physically. You can't hate your own roots. Hitler. <laughs> Kanye saying, oh, I'm an Ethiopian Jew. Why are you acting like you hate your own roots then? Just like my friend Peter. I hate the Ashkenazi Jews because all their influence in Hollywood and blah, blah, blah. <sighs> Kanye, come on. Read some books, please. <laughs> Don't just take people's word for it. Don't take how people frame the gospel. Oh, oh, this person, he's, he's just, he's taught, he thinks he's so big and so great. He's trying to teach me something. Uh, is it, uh, the entire world is trying to manipulate you <laughs> for its own benefit. For various reasons. I'm trying to help you. Uh, and good people, Officer Tatum, you know, all these people, critical drinker, they're trying to help you. Are you being manipulated or are you being taught? Are you being enticed to, towards goodness or are you being manipulated towards evil? You got to discern. You got to have a good square and compass. Some people aren't taught this. Some people are taught the complete opposite, that you need to be Machiavellian. You need to get, you need to cheat to succeed. You don't because the greatest works that have ever been accomplished, ever been accomplished, and that no cheats will ever rise to even like a portion of the greatness of, were all accomplished honorably without cheating. And you want to be like that. You don't want to be like the other ones. You don't want to be like the chaff. You want to be like the wheat. And embrace. Think of how many of these great people there are and how many of these great works that there are. But you have to appreciate it in spite of the world trying to get you to ignore and belittle the great things. Which is one of the biggest challenges. I wish I had learned that sooner. <laughs> I really do. I wish I had started, like, you know, reading at the same time that everyone else did and really, like, understood that there are good things out there. There are really good things out there. Really, 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 really good things out there. You just have to stick around, <laughs> stick around long enough to find them and the things that God has in store for you in the future, which He does. He really does. He has a great, he wants, he wants you to have the maximum amount of success and joy possible. Satan does not. Don't make a deal with him. Be a good business person with your future and your present and your past, because this will affect your past too, if you repent. Anyway, so yeah, uh, where was I? early history of the Dice family after a drink. This, I would show you like other family history stuff, but I'm just showing the stuff that's on the web. <clears throat> the surname Dice was, oh, no, I swear that this webpage shows only a small excerpt of our excerpt. Yeah, that's correct. Of our Tice research. A lot of people say theist, Thice, if the proper pronunciation is Tice. Mike Tice, uh, you know, like Mike Tyson, Mike Tice, Michael Tice, Michael Colin Tice. I strip myself naked. Another 126 words, nine lines of text, covering the years 1295, 1596, 1790. And again, I'll probably change my last name at some point to like Levi, because that's the name I was given in the temple. My, That's the last name I was given. I'll probably change my last name at some point to Levi. I actually have a reason <laughs> to uh, to change my last name. Unlike, you know, P. Diddy changing his fucking name a thousand times because he's so lost and confused. I have a guiding star. So, and examples to follow. Um, so yeah, small excerpts, another 126 words, nine lines of text covering the years 1295, 1596, 1790, 1804, and 1869 are included under the topic early Tice history in all our extended history products and printed products, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, different spelling variations, Thiessen, there's a few actors in Hollywood, like uh, Tiffany Amber Thiessen, stuff like that. Uh, 
Tysman, stuff like that. Ranking, not very popular. <laughs> My family's never been that popular. Never, ever, ever been that popular, but uh, we stick around. We still endure. Um, and my my children will certainly get that lesson. <laughs> that will my children will endure, even when others are drinking the blood of their children. My children will do the right thing. So, Tice settlers in the United States. Uh, we got here in 1709, apparently. Uh, according to their records, we first got here in 1709. I thought it was 16 something, but okay, fine. Uh, Johann Tice, uh, Thomas Tice, 1709. So I guess both of them, brothers probably, or father, son, I don't know, arrived at the same time. And then uh, 1710. So yeah, we've been here a while. And settlers, 1842 in Missouri, Texas. We were pioneers in Missouri, Texas, of many places in Texas. And uh, let's see. We got some Tices prominent in New Zealand, not just the U.S., in Germany. Contemporary notables, uh, not many. Louis Fred Tice, 1876-1949. Born Louis Fred Pfeiffer, uh, American private in the United States Marine Corps, who received the Medal of Honor for his actions in the fire aboard the USS Petrel which is kind of an ironic name. Well, not ironic. Uh, it's a funny name. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I, I love, I, I honor my family history. Frank Gordon Tice, United States federal judge. Philip Phil Tice, American semi-retired professional wrestler known by his ring name, Damien Demento. <laughs> Rick Kloss Tice, uh, American poet, author, and political activist. I'm thinking if I actually get my book series done before I die uh, and like write books of poetry and stuff, I have a lot of poetry I don't share. That's probably how I'll be remembered too, is like American poet, author, and political activist. <laughs> That's probably what I'll be too. Uh, Walter Tice, American Republican politician, alternate delegate to your Republican National Convention from Nevada, 1944. Paul A. Tice, American Republican politician, alternate delegate to Republican National Convention from District of Columbia, where I was born, 1988. Henry W. Tice, American Republican politician, mayor of Bergenfield, New Jersey, 1946 through 53. Frank Gordon Tice, <laughs> 1911, good year, uh, to 1998, also a good year. Some good movies came out. Uh, American Democratic Party politician, uh, so I've, we've got people on both sides, uh, delegate to Democratic National Convention from Kansas, 1944, alternate, 1956, 1960, member uh, arrangements committee, 1964. There's, uh, there's more than that, but they're not, they're not, ooh, Colbert. I mean, I'll, I'll look at, I'll research that later. Anyway, the point is, it's important to understand where you come from and it helps you not to get such a big head <laughs> because when you understand like, oh, maybe some of my ancestors were real assholes <laughs> or really fucking stupid, uh, you know, maybe you're less likely to think, I'm a God, I'm a God, or, or let people lure you into thinking that you are because you understand you come from humble roots. But even though you came from humble roots, you still could, your family and you could still do good things. You know, when they didn't choose the dark path, when they didn't choose the dark side. So take up the full armor of God, just like Ephesians, uh, Paul says in Ephesians, take up the full armor of God and you will be crowned with the, with the helm of salvation. Uh, well, the crown of righteousness, you're wearing the helmet of salvation. And look, there's a Pegasus too. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's me. But also in honor of Matthew, 
I'm not just going to be honoring Moondog and others. We're, we're going to be talking about some Quentin Tarantino as well, because we're talking about good storytelling throughout this as well. Society needs hits. Society needs better storytelling, better music, better everything, better comedy, better everything. We need to win the culture. We need to win the spiritual war for our people. We need to win the culture war. We need to win. We gotta win or else everything else fails. Look, we would win politically if we won the culture war and we didn't let them frame everything the way that they want it to be framed. We need to, to actually say, this is the truth and it, you can't deny it. You cannot deny it. This is the truth. And it's so beautiful and it's so artful and it's so awesome that no one will want to deny it. No good person anyway. The ones that it condemns will certainly want to turn away and deny it. But who the fuck cares about them? Let them burn. Fuck them. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is from the Bible Project, uh, 3.39 million subscribers. Uh, this is an overview of my, if not physical, blood ancestor, which doesn't really matter that much because, we're, again, we're all fucking from Adam. <laughs> my thought ancestor, my spiritual ancestor, Matthew, who my family is named after, who my, fo who my family diligently followed diligently obeyed diligently not fake not virtue signalers true honor true virtue the gospel according to matthew it's one of the earliest official accounts about jesus of nazareth his life is even when they martyred matthew death and his resurrection the book itself is anonymous but the earliest reliable tradition links it to matthew the tax collector who was one of the 12 apostles that jesus appointed and he actually appears within the book oh and you best believe they're gonna pay the tax for their sin in hell <laughs> fucking you best believe there's gonna be a levi for them waiting <laughs> self for about 30 to 40 years, the apostles orally taught and passed on their eyewitness accounts about Jesus, along with his teachings that they had all memorized. And Matthew has then collected and arranged all these into this amazing tapestry and designed the book to highlight certain themes about Jesus. In this video, we're just going to cover the first half. So everyone else was just talking about it. Everyone else was just talking about it. But Matthew wrote it down. He was the first one to, to gather it all and write it down half of the book. Specifically, Matthew wants to show how Jesus is the continuation and fulfillment of the whole biblical story about God and Israel. That Jesus is the Messiah from the line of David, that he is a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and not only that, Jesus is God with us, or in Hebrew, Emmanuel. And Matthew's designed this book with an introduction and then a conclusion, and these act like a frame around five clear sections right here in the center, each of which concludes with a long block of Jesus' teaching. Now, this design is very intentional, and it's amazing. Just watch how this works. Chapters 1 through 3, they set the stage by attaching Jesus' story right onto the storyline of the Old Testament scriptures. So Matthew opens with a genealogy about Jesus that highlights how he is from the messianic line of the son of David, and he's a son of Abraham. That means he's going to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. After that, we get the famous story about Jesus' birth and how all of the events fulfilled the Old Testament prophetic promises that the nations would come and honor the Messiah, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but even more than that, Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit, his name Emmanuel, all these work together to show that Jesus is no mere human. He is God with us. God become human. So you can see two of Matthew's key themes right here in the introduction. He's from the line of David. He's Emmanuel. But Matthew also wants to show how Jesus is a new Moses. So like Moses, Jesus came up out of Egypt. He passed through the waters of baptism, and he entered into the wilderness for 40 days. And then Jesus goes up onto a mountain to deliver his new teaching. So through all of this, Matthew is claiming that Jesus is the promised greater than Moses figure who's going to deliver Israel from slavery. He's going to give them new divine teaching. He's going to save them from their sins and bring about a new covenant relationship between God and his people. This Moses and Jesus parallel also explains why Matthew has structured the center of the book the way that he did. These five main parts highlight Jesus as a teacher, and he's created a parallel. Jesus as a teacher parallels the five books of Moses. Jesus is the new authoritative covenant teacher who's going to fulfill the storyline of the Torah. 
Now, in the first section, chapters 4 to 7, Jesus steps onto the scene announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. And this is really key. The kingdom is, in essence, about God's rescue operation for his whole world. And it's taking place through King Jesus. Jesus has come to confront evil, especially spiritual evil, and its whole legacy of demon oppression and disease and death. Jesus has come to restore God's rule and reign over the whole world by creating a new family of people who will follow him, obey his teachings, and live under his rule. Imagine the world actually being ruled by evil spirits who the people are actually believing exist as gods and who are, who are actually possessing people who sell themselves to them uh, and allow them to. And they can do what seem to be miracles. And <laughs> they can have all this knowledge, all this power. So wouldn't you worship that? But then Jesus comes and throws those demons out and defeats all of them. All of them <laughs> in the entire world. He defeats all of them. He was the greatest superhero ever to exist. Cool. So, after Jesus begins healing people and forming a movement, a community, he takes his followers out to a mountain or a hillside, and he delivers his first big block of teaching, traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount. And here Jesus explores what it looks like to follow him and live in God's kingdom. And it's an upside-down kingdom where there are no privileged members. So the poor, the nobodies, the wealthy, the religious, everybody is invited and is called to turn, to repent, and to follow Jesus and join his family. Jesus says that he's not here to set aside the commands of the Torah or the Old Testament. Rather, he's here to fulfill all of that through his life, through his teachings. He's here to transform the hearts of his people so that they can truly love God and love their neighbor, including their enemy. After concluding his great teaching on the kingdom, the next section shows Jesus bringing the kingdom into reality in the day-to-day -day lives of people. So Matthew's arranged here nine stories about Jesus bringing the power of God's kingdom into the lives of hurting, broken people. There are three groups of three stories, and they're all about people who are sick, or have broken bodies, or they're in danger, and Jesus heals or saves them by these acts of grace and power. And then right in between these triads, we find two parallel stories about Jesus' call that people should follow him. Matthew's making a point here. One can only experience the power of Jesus' grace by following him and becoming his disciple. Now, after Matthew has shown the power of the kingdom through Jesus, Jesus then extends his reach by sending out the 12 disciples who are going to go do what he's been doing. And this leads to the second large block of teaching, chapter 10. And here, Jesus teaches his disciples how to announce the kingdom and what to expect once they do. Many among Israel are accepting Jesus and his offer of the kingdom, but Israel's leaders, they aren't. They stand to lose a lot if they repent and become disciples of Jesus. And so Jesus knows they're going to reject him and persecute his followers, which is exactly what happens. In the next section, chapters 11 through 13, Matthew has collected a group of stories about how people are responding to Jesus and his message. And it's a mixed bag. So some stories are positive. People love Jesus and they think he's the Messiah. Others are more neutral, like John the Baptist, or even the members of Jesus' own family. And they make it clear that Jesus is not what they expected. And then you have Israel's leaders. They're entirely negative. You have the Pharisees and the Bible scholars. They all reject Jesus together. They think he's a false teacher. He's leading the people astray. They think he's blasphemous in these exalted claims he's making about himself. But Jesus isn't surprised or thrown by all these diverse responses. In fact, he focuses on it in the third block of teaching, chapter 13. Here, Matthew's collected together a bunch of Jesus' parables about the kingdom, like about a farmer throwing seed on four types of soil, or about a mustard seed, or a pearl, or buried treasure. These parables are like a commentary on the stories that you've just read in chapters 11 and 12. Some people are accepting Jesus with enthusiasm. Others are rejecting him. But God's kingdom is of ultimate value, and it will not stop spreading despite all of these obstacles. So, 
That's the first half of the Gospel according to Matthew. Now here's a few more things to look for as you read through these chapters. Matthew's presenting Jesus, remember, as the continuation and fulfillment of the Old Testament storyline. So look for how he weaves in quotations from the Old Testament scriptures. And what you'll find is that they're placed at strategic points in the story, explaining more about Jesus and his identity. So stop, take time to go look up these references and read them in their Old Testament context. And most often you'll discover really cool, interesting connections. Lastly, Pay attention to the types of people who accept Jesus and follow him. And you'll see that it's most often people who are unimportant, they're nobodies, or they're irreligious. And these are the people who are transformed by their trust or faith in Jesus and follow him. And it's the religious and the prideful who are offended by him. So how is this tension between Jesus and Israel's leaders going to play itself out? That's what the second half of Matthew is all about. And we're going to go through the whole thing <clears throat> because, again, Matthew is at least my spiritual <laughs> forefather. So he's the OG of like really great world sweeping uh, storytelling. You know, I believe wholeheartedly that it was a 100% true story. The Bible, Jesus actually existed. He actually did all the things uh, because I've seen it. You know, I've seen I've seen it, the results in my life, and I uh, you got to learn from the best. You got to learn from where you come from. You got to learn. You got to learn from the best things to produce the best things. The Gospel according to Matthew. In the first video, we saw how Matthew introduced Jesus as the Messiah from the line of David and as a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and also as Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us. After Jesus announced and taught about the arrival of God's kingdom, and after he brought the kingdom into day-to-day -day life among the people of Israel, we saw that Jesus was accepted by many, but rejected by others, especially Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees. And so the big question is, how is this conflict between Jesus and Israel's leaders going to play itself out? The next large section, chapters 14 through 20, explore all the different expectations people have about the Messiah. So Jesus keeps healing sick people, and twice he even miraculously provides food for these huge crowds in the desert. One's made up of Jewish people, and the other is a non-Jewish crowd. And this sign, it's very similar to what Moses did for Israel in the wilderness. And so all these people are excited about Jesus. They think he's the great prophet and the Messiah, but not the religious leaders. Their view of the Messiah is built on passages like Psalm 2 or Daniel chapter 2 about a victorious Messiah who's going to deliver Israel and defeat the pagan oppressor. This is what the Jews rejected him for. They wanted him to be the, oh, my foot's going to touch the Mount of Olives and it's going to crack in two and the world's going to know it's me. <laughs> After they see me coming, the clouds are going to part and then he's going to come down. And then he's going to shave all the hair from his head <laughs> like a warrior. It's not going to be a peaceful, long-haired Jesus. He's going to be, I'm coming for war. I'm coming to establish my kingdom on earth for the next thousand years. And no knowledge will be denied to people. And everything will be good. And all evil and all, all everything will, bad will be thrown to hell. <laughs> That's the truth. And from their point of view, Jesus, he's a false teacher. He's making blasphemous claims about himself. And so there are stories here about them increasing their opposition, hatching a plan to kill him. And so in response, Jesus, he withdraws. And he begins teaching his closest disciples what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah, because it is not what anybody expects. So Jesus asks his disciples, chapter 16, he says, who do you all say that I am? And Peter comes up with the right answer, it seems. He says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. But then it becomes clear that Peter's thinking about a king who's going to reign victoriously through military power. And Jesus challenges Peter, saying that, yes, I am going to become king, but through a different way. And so Jesus starts to teach on themes from the prophet Isaiah, who said that the messianic king would suffer and die for the sins of his own people. And so Jesus, he was positioning himself as a messianic king who reigns by becoming a servant and who would lay down his life for Israel and the nations. Well, Peter and the disciples.
disciples, they mostly just don't get it. And so Jesus enters into the fourth block of teaching, followed by a series of teachings after that. And these are all about the upside-down nature of Jesus' messianic kingdom, which turns upside down all of our value systems. So in the community of the servant king, you gain honor by serving others. And instead of getting revenge, you forgive and do good to your enemies. And in Jesus' kingdom, you gain true wealth by giving your wealth away to the poor. This is the true karmic system through which you can gain blessings and fuel for miracles because you're exercising living faith. To follow the servant Messiah, you must become a servant yourself. In the next section, we watch the two kingdoms clash, Jesus' kingdom and that of Israel's leader. Jesus comes to Jerusalem for Passover riding in on a donkey, and the crowds are hailing him as the Messiah. And Jesus immediately marches into the courtyard. You know, I'm not saying that I'm Jesus or anything like Jesus, but a funny, funny fact of my life is that my uncle owns many horses. <laughs> And I wouldn't, I was never able to ride one ever. I always wanted to so bad. I've never ridden a horse in my entire life, only a donkey, because I got mauled by a Great Dane before I could ride the horses. And I haven't had an opportunity since then. <clears throat> Point is, I would really like to ride a horse one day. <laughs> I want to be a cowboy, not a donkey boy. <laughs> yard of the temple and he creates this huge but yeah jesus looks a lot cooler on a donkey than i do huge disruption that brings the daily sacrifices to a halt his actions speak louder than words here as israel's king jesus was asserting his royal authority over the temple the place where god and israel met together and in Jesus' view, the temple was compromised by the hypocrisy of Israel's leaders. And so here he's challenging their authority, and naturally, they're deeply offended. And so they try to trap Jesus and shame him in public debate, and they fail. So they end up just determining to have him killed. In response, Jesus delivers his final block of teaching. He first offers this passionate critique of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And then he weeps over Jerusalem and its rejection of God and his kingdom. Then Jesus withdraws with the disciples and he starts telling them what's going to happen. He's going to be executed by these leaders, but in doing so, they're going to create their own demise because instead of accepting Jesus' way of the peaceful kingdom, they're going to take the road of revolt against Rome and so Jerusalem and its temple are going to be destroyed. But, Jesus says, that is not the end of the story. He's going to be vindicated after his death by his resurrection. And one day, he'll return and set up his kingdom over all nations. And so in the meanwhile, the disciples... But they got to build the temple first. <laughs> they got to build the temple for that. ...need to stay alert and stay... That's the temple that really matters to be built, Mormons. You can have some temples here and entice others to come to the land of the free, home of the brave. You know, close all the temples you don't need everywhere else. Bring the temples here and entice them to the land of the free, especially places where we need populate, where we, where we need the good people uh, to fight bad people. You, you stupid fucks. Uh, to put it bluntly, that's the truth. Stay committed to just announcing Jesus and his kingdom and spreading the good news. And so with all of that ringing in the disciples' ears, the story comes to its climax. That night, Jesus takes the disciples aside and he celebrates a Passover meal with them. The Passover retells the story of Israel's rescue from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. And then Jesus takes the bread and the wine from this meal as new symbols, showing that his coming death would be a sacrifice that would redeem his people from slavery to sin and evil. After the meal, Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial before the Sanhedrin, a council of Jewish leaders, and they reject his claim to be the Messiah. They charge him with blasphemy against God. Then Jesus is brought before the Roman governor, Pilate, and he thinks Jesus is innocent, but he gives in to the pressure from the Jewish leaders and he sentences Jesus to death by crucifixion. So Jesus is led away by Roman soldiers and crucified. Now, you'll notice right here in this section that just like Matthew did in the opening chapters, he increases the number of references to the Old Testament. He's trying to show that Jesus' death was not a tragedy or a failure. Rather, it was the surprising fulfillment of all of the old prophetic promises. Jesus came as the servant Messiah, spoken of by Isaiah. He was rejected by his own people, but instead of judging them, he is judged on their behalf. 
bearing the consequences of their sin. So the crucifixion scene, it comes to a close, and Jesus' body is placed in a tomb. But the book ends with a surprising twist, the last chapter. The disciples, they discover on Sunday morning that Jesus' tomb is empty. And then all of a sudden people start seeing Jesus alive from the dead. And the book concludes with the risen Jesus giving a final teaching called the Great Commission. Jesus says that he is now the true king of the world. And so he sends his disciples out to all nations with the good news that Jesus is Lord and that anyone can join his kingdom by being baptized and by following his teachings. And echoing all the way back to his name. Yeah, and obviously when I say Satan is the king of the world, it's understood he's the king of the, you know, Babylon, Egypt, basically that's the world, you know, the evil world. God is the king of even the darkness, <laughs> but at this point, uh, Jesus gained ultimate victory over everything. He bought everything with his life, and now he has ultimate uh, judgment. He will be our final judge because he bought everything. Emmanuel, God with us from chapter one, Jesus' last words in the book to his disciples are, I will be with you. It's a promise of Jesus' presence until the day he finally returns. And that's the gospel according to Matthew. So yeah, that's uh, that's great work. <laughs> that is great. That is great. So yeah, let's, uh, speaking of great creators, let's talk about some Quentin Tarantino. He just recently appeared. I have this exact microphone, this exact uh, plosive blocker thing as well. Different shock mount, but I might try that arm because this arm sucks ass. Or maybe it's just because the weight of this, because uh, it does fine on the Shure SM7B. But this one, uh, it's the uh, Rode uh, PS1, I think it is. So, yeah, it can't handle the weight of this setup. So I might try this arm here. But yeah, let's see. Let's try to learn some good stuff about how to create good work, even today, as flawed and as stupid as we are compared to our ancestors. Um, let's see if we can learn some stuff from people who came before us who created great stuff. I have written a TV show. I've written eight episodes, all right, of a limited series. This is breaking news. Yeah, it is breaking news. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> you just put the feel. Your agents are jerking off right now in the other room. <laughs> they were like, he does? Yeah. 100%. <laughs> Well, you guys know he's had a uh, quintuple bypass. He had his... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, YMH Studios, 1.48 million subscribers. <laughs> I think Dr. Drew is on this network as well. I think it's like a production network. I don't know. It's, stu it's a studio. So, yeah, they're interviewing. I guess the regular co-host isn't there, and they're, they have Quentin Tarantino filling in to also be interviewed. At the, like, he would have been there anyway. It just would have been two people interviewing him. But he's trying to do his best on his own, uh, interviewing Quentin, or Quinn, however he likes to be called. His uh, kidney transplant, I know he just got um, his, uh, uh, what are they called? When, when you, you're amputated, you get the prosthetics. They're fit in for him now. Um, so, Bert, um, I hope all that is going well. Sitting in mm -hmm. for Bert today is our good buddy, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you're you. sitting in for Bert, man. Uh, wait, you mean the Hitler guy? The Hitler guy. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm yeah. sitting in his seat. Yeah. Sitting, yeah. <laughs> his yeah. ass print is, is right like there. molding. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, his yeah. ass might be a little bigger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's much bigger than yours. Um, real, I uh, also want to point out you have a new book out. Mm -hmm. Cinema speculation. Right on. I told you I've begun the audiobook. Mm -hmm. I think I might switch. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, your, stock, your stock went way down when you yeah, said that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Probably wasn't the really best way to say sorry. hello. Sorry. <laughs> this one yeah, this, this interview is kind of <clears throat> also a way to learn not to, how to do it, even if you're a comedian. <laughs> This is one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, and the guy didn't even read his book, or lit he even gave him an audiobook version, and the first thing he does is insult the audiobook version b to cover for the fact that he didn't even bother to either go for through the audiobook or the book, and he's fucking interviewing Quentin Tarantino. Can you understand the level of uh, entitlement and, like... Oh, I'm going to make myself feel better by acting like I'm, I'm so much greater. Oh, I wrote my own book. Therefore, why should I read yours? He does that. Like later on in the interview, like, oh, look, I wrote my own book too. 
when he, when Quentin brings up, you didn't read past page three, did you? <laughs> you didn't read past page three. You can't even study the greats that currently are alive, much less the ones that came before. And we wonder why we're just sliding farther and farther downhill and we're producing less and less great intellectual works that are worthy, that have morals, that are edifying rather than misleading. I want to let you know that I was actually consuming the material. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you, you know, you like movies so much, you make me feel like I maybe don't like movies. Uh, <laughs> because, like, I always thought I like movies. Then I hear you talk, and I'm like, what the fuck, man? But you were exposed to, like, such a – I mean, this book is like a dive into mm. your, you know, your – how you – How I grew up. Grew up. Um, yeah, because uh -huh. everybody, I think – Fans of you, of... So, yeah, he's basically just going to spend the entire time talking about movies that he personally likes, not talking about the book, not talking about things that Quentin actually wants to talk about. The things he's answered a million fucking times in a million fucking interviews, but he couldn't be bothered to, you know, to treat it with the respect it deserved. Which says, and look how he's not like a Generation Z guy. This is just bad work ethic. It's bad work. Of movies in general. You can be as funny as you want. You fucked up. You fucked up. Kind of knew the story of Quentin worked at a video store. Yeah, yeah. And he really likes movies. Mm -hmm. And then we and, and I've seen you in interviews, mm -hmm. cite, you know, refer to other movies from the past. Like it was clear yeah. that you were a, yeah, yeah, a yeah. real fan a of cinephile. cinema. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a cinephile. But this gets at you in from like the beginning, like how, how yeah. you, as a kid, you were being taken mm -hmm. by your mother and going to movies all the time. All he's going to do is, is pump uh, Quentin because he's shopping his own TV shows and stuff. And his Machiavellian pursuit is going to be to pump Quentin for how did you succeed in this situation? You know, if you wanted a certain actor for a certain role, how did you get them for that role? He's literally only interviewing one of the greatest filmmakers of all time to personally benefit himself in only the ways that he is personally interested in. Selfish, narcissistic, doesn't value what he's got right in front of him, <laughs> does not value it, doesn't even see what he's got right in front of him. He's just, oh, well, in order to keep my shit together, because I'm, I'm really such a fanboy deep down, I'm going to, I'm just going to treat him like shit. To make myself feel, you know, make other people see, oh, I'm not, I'm not just going to, you know, brown nose, Quint, even if it's Quint, you know. No, you don't have to. Just treat it with the respect it deserves. Honor it. It's, it's honorable. Quentin's work was honorable. When Hollywood was like, no, you can't do that with the, the resounding echoes of the screams of the Hayes Code. You can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. Quentin was like, fuck you. I'm going to do whatever I want. It's funny, or it's it's good. It's a good story. I don't care. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do it my way. And that he was a great example. He is a great example of that. I hope his last movie, uh, if it is his last movie, because a lot of the times people just use it as like a publicity stunt. But if it is his last movie, the next movie that he does, I hope it's fantastic. I hope it is the crowning achievement of his career. And this guy will never even approach Quentin's level because he'd never respected any of it. He was just so entitled. And he cared about how, how he looked to the world more than valuing the things that should be valued and honoring them the way that they should be honored. Well, it was interesting because when I first came up with the idea to write the book, the idea was more or less just... Uh, um, uh, a book of film analysis. Mm -hmm. So I would pick a, a, you know, like idea I thought was like, I pick a few films and then I would write about them. And, uh, that was, you know, that was just kind of more or less, uh, the idea. I wasn't expecting it to be quite as autobiographical as, as it became, but I figured it would be autobiographical to some degree. Yeah. Because if you're writing about movies personally, then you end up telling about yourself in it. I mean, sure. one of my favorite critics is Pauline Kael and they asked her, uh, would she ever write her autobiography? And she goes, no, I, I've written my autobiography in every one of my reviews. It's just kind of spread out. Oh, interesting. So I kind of figured that would be the case, but then I ended up writing the first chapter. And that's kind of how my streams are. <laughs> I think that was my attempt to try to write a, an introduction mm -hmm. to the book, and the, which, you know, uh, details, uh, you know, me and 
69, 70, 71, being taken to a bunch of these new Hollywood films by my parents when, uh, you know, I was seven and eight and nine. And when I finished that chapter, it was like, I was aware enough thing. okay, well, that's a, that's a pretty good chapter. All right. That's not an introduction. That's, that's chapter one. Yeah. And then once I wrote that chapter, I realized, okay, this is the book now. This is the yeah, book. Now I'm going to still, I'm going to still continue on doing, uh, 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 writing about different films, but now all of a sudden it had a structure sure. that it didn't have before. They all had to be movie. You know, since I was writing about having seen uh, uh, seen them at a young age, um, they all had uh, all the movies I wrote about. I had to have seen then. Right. I had okay. to have seen in the set. So over the course of this interview, Quentin is telling people for free <laughs> how to write a book. You know, if you want to want to write a book maybe you're a little bit lost with like an autobiography sort of situation not well he wasn't intending to do that he was just planning to talk about movies my point is is if you want to write something like that or you want to make a great film or tv show it might be nice to learn from what came before the good stuff not the bad stuff Evan, not something you saw later yeah nothing yet. nothing i discovered later yeah down the line, you know, uh, and whether or not I, I you know, uh, whether or not I discuss what it was like seeing it at 12 or 13 or 15, uh, you know, uh, that remains to be seen. All right. But they all had to come from that area and uh, they all had I had I had to see it from there. And uh, and that kind of became the umbilical cord mm -hmm. that carried through the book leading to the last chapter, which is like the first chapter, another autobiographical movie watching thing that kind of takes me up to that point right. in my life. Yeah, I mean, it's like you you are you have like this um, savant-like ability, mm -hmm. I think, when you talk about films. Mm -hmm. Like you can just cite movies. And like, I think, I don't know, you growing up in this time frame uh -huh. was the probably the best thing for the filmmaker that we know today, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, if it was a different era, we, you'd be a different guy. Yeah, no, 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 I'm uh, absolutely. And there also is just this kind of really neat, I'm not going to sit through this whole thing. I'm trying to see if there's anything I want to highlight. I'd say if you want to learn the craft, I, I've already watched the whole thing. So if you want to learn, because this is why I used to watch stuff like Inside the Actor's Studio, because you want to learn from the greats. You do. Don't let the world convince you, oh, you're so much better and your shit is so much better than theirs and you just need to listen up. No, <laughs> you need to fucking ignore them. All of their gender bullshit, gender theory, and we have to have diversity quotas in all of our entertainment. You need to learn from them. Good writing, good casting, good everything. Good morals, when you get down to it, in a lot of his movies. Uh, even if they're really dark uh, sometimes. But again, light shining through the darkness. But yeah, let me link this interview. Uh, how do you spell Tarantino? Taran? Taran? Tarantino. But yeah, so many good uh, lessons to derive from this interview in many areas. But we're not going to watch the whole thing now because I've already been going for like five hours. I did not think it would be. I never think it's going to be. I'm, ba I'm a bad judge of time. <laughs> I'm not good at temporal things. Uh... So yeah, we're gonna. I'm gonna take the halfway break here, and then we'll play some Star Citizen on the other end. BRB.
city car, the silhouette on the ocean after dark. Over the lonely and the holy and the red blood beating hearts. Up from the dirty black water, a shadow void of form raised itself out of the river and it climbed upon. On the black top, there's a gentle rain downtown. The shadow pooling underneath me as it follows on the ground. Kissed you when I saw you, stared deep into your eyes. I meant to say I love you, but instead I said goodbye. To myself, on these streets, I'm someone else. Shadows in the city, like a demon in the dark. Come to tear us apart. Beyond our city. There's a shadow in the dark It comes to me infrequently And breaks your perfect heart I don't know why I do it I apologize, but it's too late A single tear and you leave me here And the shadow slips away Myself. On these streets, I'm someone else. Shadows in the city, like a demon in the dark. Come to tear us apart. Beyond our city.
recognize myself you tore in two now I'm someone else
Välkommen bakom en. I've always believed that my my wife will fall in love with me from my mind. And that's that's why I greatly prefer her. <clears throat> you know, because everything else is temporary. I don't want her to like me just because I sound good. I want her to like me because of my mind, which is the only thing that's the best part of me. And that's the, the part that's going to get better and better and better. You know, it's not supposed to be that you get old and then, you know, you revert back to being like a baby. <laughs> it used to be. You know, that you, if you lived life correctly, you know, as far as like not damaging your brain without excessive alcohol and drugs and pharmaceutical, all that bullshit, you know, you would get wiser and wiser and more intelligent, more intelligent until you died. And then you were super intelligent, you know, the, your test was over and you were, you know, you were shaped into your mind, your soul your spirit, your body it was all shaped into the form that the Lord intended it to be. So yeah, that's what I want my, my wife to fall in love with, is my mind. Not my body, not my voice, my mind. <clears throat> and hopefully once I get my first book done, uh, then I'll have enough to, you know, get married and stuff. You know, actually be able to support a family and not, it, not have it be like an irresponsible thing. Okay, now let's play. It's been a while since I checked in with Star Citizen, but we'll see how it be now. I think they're in patch 3.18 now, so hopefully it's a little bit less buggy than the last time where I could barely go from, because my, my ship had like a, a backpack bug where if I had my backpack on and I didn't board or disembark properly, then the entire ship would blow up and I would die. It was very annoying. <laughs> I spent a week trying to get from a, like a station to somewhere else, uh, a planet. Oh no, I was trying to get to the... Uh, you know, the pirate station in the, the asteroid field belt thing. <clears throat> it's been a while. It's loading. To unlock your friends list, select a primary residence in the Persistent Universe. Yes, can I just be this guy? Can I just be an android from Detroit Become Human? <laughs> That's what I'd be. Uh, they should give the option, you can be a synthetic life form, you can be a cyborg, you can be an alien, not just a human, not just human male, female. Boring. <laughs> Give me fucking Star Trek. I want to be Klingon. I want to be a Romulan. I want to be a, you know, I want to be, a, I want to be something, you know, you could be a human if you want, but give us player choice, player freedom. And why do I have to do this again every single fucking time? Can you, can I please save a preset that will be persistent in the persistent universe? Not even your settings get saved. Like everything every this is why i get worn out it with uh with just all of the checking back in that i have to every single time i gotta redo my settings every single time i gotta redo my character every single time <laughs> in the persistent universe all right it's a little annoying i know i understand it's like pre 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 alpha but you know streamers gotta say something <laughs> while they're you know deciding if they just want to be default, I guess I will. Guess what, you basic bitch? You're never gonna be nothing. I guess I'm starting with Stanton. I thought you could. Oh. No, Babbage. I'll go to Area 18. It's the most Blade Runnery. Set is primary. 
Yes. I think I'll fly my vanguard. If I don't have to wait, like, forever for it, I, it might, I might have to claim it. I shouldn't, since, since it's a reset. I remember the button to turn off the damn it I thought I'd rebound the key why is it recording mm -hmm. turn off you confounded infernal thing all right, well, I guess we're double encoding for no reason for, for the rest of this stream. <clears throat> All right. Uh, yeah, that's not where I want to be. Let's go to... Or what is this? What is this? Let me out of here. I like Garrick. I don't like small, small spaces. I'm too big. Too big for my own good. Not as energy efficient. Hey, oh, that's nice. Just a little choppy. It's low, low, low. Well, I think these are actually the same settings I had. So, bravo for that. But, booty, booty, booty. Hmm. Must be loading in assets <clears throat> that's causing it to lag. I think. I hope. <laughs> it's my persistent or uh, object container streaming and all that stuff is so important. Looking forward to that new UI though. Whatever that gets here. Dear Lord. Choppier than fucking trying to hunt Ahab <laughs> in the middle of a sea storm. Open sesame. And now you will take me to the ground floor. Let's see if I can actually make it to the pyro station today, or the pirate station, and get the armor I wanted. We are pirates. Bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. I'm just gonna... I should already have a helmet on, right? Pretty sure. Pretty sure. I have a million. 1.7 million. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway. Let's go get my ship. Why is it so choppy? Could be the double encoding. I, I can't remember the fucking key bind. Where is it? I will find it. Well, let's just open the menu. Eh, you know what? I'm just gonna get my ship fly around a little bit and then end the stream for today. <laughs> I did not think I was gonna go for five hours talking. Talking and talking, going on and on and on. Quite hypnotic.
Trade Development Division. This is where the Frangie would live. Uh, ship is down here. Wait, do we go here? No, we go here. I'm glad I can run farther without having a heart attack and dying. <laughs> That's nice. So you can actually catch the train without collapsing. And I haven't died of dehydration yet. That's nice too. Well, I don't like those aspects. It's the future, but I still have to, you know, eat every two seconds apparently. No constitution. Weaklings. You can just like hear people my generation can just an older Gen X can just like hear the uh, and the babies boomers, you know the Blade Runner soundtrack. Van Van Al, Van fuck who did the fucking soundtrack? Van something Van Jelen I think Van Jealous yeah Van Jealous I think. That's basically what this world and it was like Coruscant, but with the the theme of Blade Runner <laughs> instead of Star Wars. So this is like the Coruscant, uh, the Blade Runner Coruscant. Get my ship. Or, yeah, until my fucking Bano Merchantman is done, whichever decade that will be. Uh, I'll just get a Vanguard and fly around. Because I want to fly. I'm tired of not being able to fly. Welcome to the ASOP vehicle retrieval system. I will go with the warden. Vehicle selected. The warden of the prison. Your vehicle has been delivered to the following location. Where is Hangar 8? Move, citizen. Suck my Meridian and cack. My cock meridian. Your personal belongings are your personal Where's the feelings. elevator for this thing? At all times. Mm. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> too, uh, I really have to pee, so I'm just gonna end it here for tonight. <laughs> We had a nice little tour of Blade Runner Coruscant. We'll continue with this another time and check in on Star Citizen because I really want to check the prison. Apparently, you can get arrested and then break out. And, you know, I still haven't. There's so much stuff they've added that I haven't checked out yet. So, we're going to do that uh, soon. So, thank you for joining me and farewell. Secure my cack!
Now, uh, my mission in life is to help you and everyone who needs my help, but I can never give you that for which you are not ready. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Let me call your attention to a great power which is under your control, a power which is greater than poverty, greater than the lack of education, greater than all of your fears and superstitions combined. It is the power to take possession of your own mind and direct it to whatever ends you may desire. Poverty, fear, illiteracy, and superstition. The four horsemen which keep most people in bondage all the days of their lives. Faith is not something you get. Faith is something you already have. But you may be using it in reverse gear by believing in the circumstances and things you do not want, the things you fear. poverty and lack of education, you are simply directing your mind power to attract these undesirable circumstances. Because it is true that whatever your mind feeds upon, your mind attracts to you. Now you see why it is important that you recognize that all success begins with definiteness of purpose, with a clear picture in your mind of precisely what you want from life. Everyone comes to the earth plane blessed with the privilege of controlling his mind power and directing it to whatever ends he may choose. Your only limitations are those which you set up in your own mind or permit others to set up for you. Your faith is limited only by your own capacity to believe. Faith is guidance only. It is not a power which will bring you what you want, but a power that can guide you to go after what you want and get it. There is no such thing as something for nothing. Everything, including your personal success, has a price that must be paid. A negative mental attitude can bring you nothing but failure. Remember also, your mental attitude is the one and the only thing over which you have complete control. Success is something which has to be planned, and success is something which has to be earned in advance. True, there is such a thing as luck, but just remember that luck is something you can create for yourself if you know the rules and follow them, and the best definition of success which I know is this. Success is the knowledge with which to get whatever you want from life without violating the rights of others and by helping others to acquire it. Your only real limitation is the one you accept and set up in your own mind. The habit of going the extra mile definitely develops greater self-reliance and gives one more courage to move ahead without the fear of criticism from others. It helps you to master the destructive habit of procrastination, know what you want and believe that you can and will get it. Give expressions of gratitude many times daily for having received that which you want, even before you actually get physical possession of it. Possession starts first in the mind. There can be no application of applied faith without action. When overtaken by defeat, as you may be many times, remember that man's faith is tested many times before he is crowned with final victory. And accept your defeat as nothing more than a challenge to keep on trying.
I can give you a fine example of how nature forces man to go the extra mile in order that he may produce the food with which to exist. The farmer, for example, must follow the habit of clearing the ground, fencing it, plowing it, and planting the seed at the right season of the year, all of which he must do in advance without compensation of any kind. If he does his part of the work properly, he then hands the job over to nature, sits down and waits for her to do her part, and within a brief period, nature yields back to him the seed he planted, plus perhaps an increase of a hundred times that amount to compensate him for having gone the extra mile. Thus we see that the law of increasing returns comes to the aid of the man who goes the extra mile. I say this is your greatest asset with which you may tap and draw upon the supreme power which created you and runs this entire universe. The name of this principle is applied faith and I want you to remember it. It is not something I am bringing to you but it is something you already possess although you may not have made use of it in the past. Applied faith is the mental attitude wherein you may clear your mind of all fears and doubts and direct it to the attainment of whatever you desire in life. Applied faith is a mental attitude we must cultivate and maintain before we can take complete possession of our minds. We are now, this very moment, standing in front of the gateway which can be opened only with the great master key to success, applied faith. Most people make a negative application of their great power of faith by thinking about and believing in poverty, ill health, fear, failure, and defeat, when it would be so easy for them just to change their thinking over to the circumstances and things they desire. How many times the average person must fail before he quits? Fails because of the lack of capacity for belief. How many times can you meet with defeat before you give up and quit? Belief is truly a magic word because it is the beginning of all success. It is the very foundation of civilization. It is the one quality you must develop before you can make use of the great master key to success. To be successful, you must become a person with a great capacity for belief. And the place to start believing is with yourself. You should begin by recognizing that you were born with the privilege of complete control over your own mind. You can take full possession of your mind and make it yield you whatever you demand in life. If your life is not what you want it to be, you can change it. As a matter of fact, you can do anything within reason that you desire to do if you embrace the principle of applied faith and keep it directed to the attainment of the things you want and off the things you do not want.